A.G. Marshall. We secure our friendships not by accepting favors, but by doing them. Or so says an ancient Greek historian. And that should prove, if indeed proof were needed, that there has been no major change in human nature during these past 2,500 years. Nor is there likely to be any in the next 2,500 years either. Harry. Harry. Huh? Huh? Harry. Go away. L- let me sleep. Tell me, Harry. Whose child are you? Huh? Whose child are you, Harry? What? Whose child are you? Who, who, who is this? It's Mama, Harry. Big Mama. Our mystery drama, Big Mama was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Paul Hecht. I shall be back shortly with Act One. Taking a laxative? Yeah, traveling through is my sister. Marvis Hegandibus Quercus, or as the old Romans used to say, tall oaks from small acorns grow. Well... Who knows what can sprout from a tiny seed? And not just the seed of a plant that you place in the ground, but also the seed of an idea that you plant in the mind. I suppose you could say, one thing leads to another. And where does it all lead to in the end? Here it is in the paper. Harry Simmons, dead of pneumonia at 37. 37? Just at the start of the prime of life. Everything to live for. Oh, maybe it had to do with the book. But how? Why? That book brought him fame and fortune. Oh, I don't know. I can only tell you how it was when I was with Harry Simmons. The other times? That's the mystery, I guess. Oh, good evening, Mr. Simmons. Oh, you're still here, Mrs. Crawley? It just got through. Your supper's on the stove. Be still? No, that's that's fine. Uh-huh. Um, uh, Mrs. Crawley. Yes, sir? Um, is, is this all the mail? Yes. It's all the postman brown. Oh, are, are you sure? Ah, uh, would I lie to you, Mr. Simmons? <sighs> all right, Mrs. Crawley. Where is it? Where's what? Where did you hide it? Mrs. Crawley. It's, uh, behind the couch. Thank you very much. I figured it could wait a while. Mrs. Crawley, you mustn't keep doing this. Look, Mr. Simmons, every time I see old Pete, the mailman, bringing that thick, fat envelope up the walk, I know it's going to mean another disappointment. How many times have I told you not... Mr. Simmons, do you know who I am? Of course I know who you are. You're Mrs. Sarah Jean Crawley. I'm also Mrs. John Q. Public. I'm the one that goes into the store and buys the books that America reads. That boggles the mind. Oh, you're such a smart person. I keep asking myself, how come all them publishers keep turning down your book? So I sat down and read your carbon copy. You read my book? I, uh, I tried to read it. The truth is I couldn't get past the first couple of pages. You know why? There's no sex. There's not supposed to be any sex. This book is about a plan for the city of the future. You mean in the city of the future they won't have any sex? Mrs. Crawley, this is a highly scientific treatise. Terrific. Make one of them scientists a woman. A ripe woman of about 40, repressed, frustrated, smoldering. I read these books all the time. I know exactly how you ought to do it. I am concerned with the dynamics, with the with the interplay of social forces in the physical structure of the political entity. <sighs> well, I was only trying to help. Yes, and I appreciate it. Okay. Good night, Mr. Simmons. Good night. <laughs> Yes. Uh, who? Oh, well, I suppose I'll have to see him. 
<clears throat> These people must be the largest clutch of unjailed scoundrels since the formation of the Republic. Well, Mr. Simmons. Mr. Monroe Hastings. Yes, F. Monroe Hastings, guilty as charged. Have a seat, Mr. Hastings, although I'm not sure you'll be staying that long. So, you're the power behind the proposed factory? Uh, <laughs> no, sir, it, it isn't a factory. Okay, the proposed plant. Well, it isn't even a plant. Now, true, there'll be some light assembly operations, but basically... It's a headquarters building. Oh, yes? What's the difference? The difference is one of nuance. Nuance? Yes. What we propose is a beautiful edifice. Uh, the one that we put up just like it on the West Coast won the uh, architectural prize of the year. You're proposing a strain on morning and evening traffic. No, no, no. The, no, the hours will be staggered. You'll never notice it. You'll be destroying valuable, irreplaceable open space. Uh, ISC, International Semiconductors, wants to bring 350 jobs into this town. That's a high six-figure tax role. As town planner, I get propositions like this every day. Now, so far, this town has resisted the temptation. We have held the line. If we approve your offer, the floodgates fly open. We'll be swamped with factories. We will lose the essential residential nature of our city. Uh, no, 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 you won't. Now, when we come in here, we too become citizens of Middleborough Heights. Mr. Simmons, you are well-liked and respected. Your recommendation, your yes or no, is the automatic signal for the planning board. But International wants to come in here. And we will. We would rather come in with your blessing. It can't be done. But if we have to, we'll come in without it. Now, you can make it tough. You can delay us for months, even years... But sooner or later, that building will go up. I really shouldn't waste any more of your time, Mr. Hastings. Uh, Mr. Simmons, let me ask you a question. How much? How much? Well, usually it all comes down to how much. How much do you want? Are you trying to bribe me? <laughs> well, of course. How dare you insult me? I must ask you to leave. Uh, no, no, I was merely doing my job, and therefore it was necessary for me to touch all the bases. A good day, sir. After all, I could hardly leave here without uh, getting an answer to that particular question. There isn't enough money in the world. Good day to you, sir. <laughs> You want a refill? Hmm? Oh, yes, thanks. Oh, it's a quiet night around here, isn't it? You're looking for action, you won't find it. This is conscience night. What's that? It seems Wednesday night, all the married guys in town stay home. Don't ask me why. It's like them animals. What do you call them, lemmings? They all run into the water and drown themselves at the same time? <laughs> I see. <laughs> I moonlight here Wednesdays because it is quiet and Jerry Smith, the regular bartender, can take off. So, uh, tell me, how'd you make out? I beg your pardon? With Harry Simmons, the town planner. What are you saying? Oh, I know who you are. You're F. Monroe Hastings. You're from that outfit, international, uh, well, what you call it? Oh, uh... As a citizen of this town, how would you feel about International locating its headquarters here? Oh, I'm against it. Do most people feel that way? Yeah, I guess so. How do you account for it? Two things. First, Harry knows his stuff. Second, Harry would never take a nickel. I see. I bet you tried it, huh? Well, now, uh... I know how you big corporations operate. Well, I... I did see Mr. Simmons. He practically threw me out of his office. Well, you picked a bad day. You mean that some days are worse than others? And a day like today is the worst of all. Oh? Why is that? Last night he got his manuscript back from a publisher. I could tell by the look on his face he was going to stew about it all night as usual. Which means he doesn't get hardly any sleep. And that gives him a headache and indigestion. Uh, you, uh... You say a publisher returned his manuscript? Twenty publishers returned his manuscript. Oh, he's written a book. Hmm? About what? How to plan a city or, or something. Oh, believe me, he'll never sell it to the movies. And you say no one wants to publish it? Hmm? I wish I could learn how to type. I'd write a book, too. I suppose uh, 
That book means a great deal to him. Yeah, poor guy. He wants such a little bit out of life just to get that book published. But it's never going to happen. Yep, that's the way it goes, right? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, that's the way it goes. Sometimes. Yes. Uh, who? Oh, uh, no, no, tell him I'm in a meeting. No, wait, wait, wait. Don't do that. Why should I lie? Just tell Mr. F. Monroe Hastings that I refuse to see him. What do you think he's going to do? Wave a fistful of dollar bills in my face? Well, well, good morning, Mr. Simmons. I told my secretary... I know, I know. You told her loud enough for me to hear. Shall I ask for a security officer to escort you out? Uh, Not until I correct a mistaken impression... Now, you think I'm here to talk about the headquarters complex for international semiconductors. Aren't you? Well, only peripherally. This morning, I wish to talk to you on behalf of Barnaby and Brother Publishers. Barnaby and Brother? Mm-hmm. What do you know about Barnaby and Brother? What could you have to do with Barnaby and Brother? I mean, they're the oldest, the most prestigious publishing firm in the country. Barnaby and Brother is a subsidiary of international semiconductors. I, s- I don't believe it. What do they know about books? Hmm. Big Mama doesn't know anything about books. Big Mama? Yes, yes, that's how we, her children, <laughs> affectionately refer to international. You own Barnaby and Brother? And I am here on their behalf this morning. Barnaby and Brother is always on the lookout for fresh, new, exciting books. What are you talking about? I, uh, think I'd better shut the door. Now, look, nothing is ever discussed in this office which needs the protection and the cover of a closed door. Well, maybe you don't have any secrets, but I do. Look, I, I, I still don't know what you're talking about. I am talking about City of Tomorrow. City? How do you know about City of Tomorrow? That, that's my book. Uh, correction, please. That's your manuscript. It isn't, and it doesn't become a book until it's published. Which means printed and bound and placed between covers. What are you saying? Why do you pretend you don't know what I'm saying? You're saying you'll, you'll publish my book. Precisely. It's, it's, it's still a bribe, isn't it? Well, now, aren't you glad we closed the door? And I'll have to give you something in return. In this world, sometimes we give in order to get. And look at what you'll be getting. Publication of City of Tomorrow by Harry Simmons under the imprimatur of the oldest, most prestigious and influential house in America. And what are you being asked to give? Some 15 worthless acres of scrub and swamp. Now, where can you get a better bargain? It all depends on how you define bargain. A student named Faust once made a bargain with the devil. Here, the devil seems nowhere in evidence, unless, of course, he has some kinship with Big Mama. Mr. Harry Simmons is proud of the fact that he has never taken a bribe. But that was because he thought bribes were only concerned with money. We have a lot of sorting out to do in Act Two shortly. Your lawn could die of thirst this summer if it has to depend on the weather to get the water it needs. So be sure you've got quality hoses you can depend on from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you True Value Nylon Reinforced Vinyl Hoses are designed to stand up to the heat and remain flexible in cold weather. And right now you can get their 60-foot True Value Hose for $9.99 or the super rugged 75-foot length for $14.99. Both have 5 8 inch inner diameter and are available only from participating True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. Goodness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the Serta Perfect Sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. Be a perfect sleeper. It's a healthy investment in yourself. Lauren Green speaks to you for Medical Alert. 
An accident or sudden illness might seriously affect your ability to speak or communicate. That's why wearing a medic alert emblem is especially important if you have a hidden medical condition such as an allergy to penicillin or diabetes, hypertension, or a heart problem, for example. The emblem contains a special ID number, a 24-hour phone number, and your medical condition engraved on the reverse side. In an emergency, medic alert provides identification and vital information within seconds. A wallet card is sent to you each year to provide current medical information. Wearing a medic alert emblem can help ensure you swift and accurate treatment in a medical emergency. Remember, medic alert speaks for you when you can't. Take good care of yourself. For information, write medic alert, Turlock, California, 95381. This message was brought to you as a public service by this station. What is mankind's basic drive? There are those learned folk who claim it is sex. Others insist it's hunger. And there are some who make a case for concepts like territoriality and turf. If we may venture a timid opinion, we would suggest pride of authorship. Today, almost everyone seems to be driven by the urge to write a book. Has there ever been such a spate, such an overwhelming Johnstown's flood of printed material? This is the story of one of those books. Barnaby and Brother would actually publish City of Tomorrow? <laughs> Mr. Simmons, not only will Barnaby and Brother publish City of Tomorrow, but it shall become the non-fiction leader of the prestigious Fall Catalog. The Barnaby and Brother Fall Catalog? It means first-class reviews. Well, when you're published by Barnaby and Brother, it's uh, first-class all the way. Yeah, but what am I even thinking about? I can't do it. Why not? Be because it's still a bribe. And besides, Barnaby and Brother has already turned the book down. Oh? Well, I'm sure it was a mistake. It is an important book. I'm sure it has a vital message for America. It was, after all, written by a master of the art of city planning. Yes. On the other hand, it could be a bad book. No, no, no. No, that is impossible. Oh, and then why did so many people turn it down? Uh, let me have a copy. Let me make sure it gets to the right people at Barnaby and Brown. No, look, I, I... Wait, wait, wait. What have you got to lose? Ah, oh, Mr. Simmons, uh, come in. Uh, please do come in. Thank you, Miss McDowell. I have finished reading City of Tomorrow. Yes? It is a fantastic book. It is? It touches on so much that is real, that is true in the human experience. You're saying it's a good book? My dear Mr. McDowell, the word good is hardly adequate to describe the excellence of City of Tomorrow. If it's such a uh, great work, why did you turn it down the first time? I didn't turn it down. Oh, but you did. I mean, this is your rejection slip. Uh, uh, dear Mrs. Simmons, I am sorry, but City of Tomorrow does not meet our needs at this time, and it is signed Tricia McDowell. I hadn't read your book. I never wrote that note, and I never signed it. But here it is. Mr. Simmons, that is a form letter and a form signature. You see, when your book arrived, it was handed to a reader whose job it is to turn down all the manuscripts that are as we say in this business, thrown over the transfer. Uh, let me speak very frankly, Miss McDowell. Twenty publishers have already rejected this book. And so, perhaps it is possibly true that it isn't really very good. Uh, you're a sensitive person, Mr. Simmons. I can see that. But twenty publishers did not refuse your book. It was rejected by twenty insignificant readers who were merely following routine instructions. Uh, yes, yes, Miss McDowell. Hey, look, I am town planner for Middleborough Heights. I know that. International Semiconductors, or Big Mama, as she is called, needs my approval to construct a headquarters complex. I have so far refused. The Big Mama owns this publishing house. A Mr. Monroe Hastings suggested that I resubmit the manuscript, and now, how enthusiastically it has been received. I mean, what am I to think? Has Big Mama told one of her children to say yes? Mr. Simmons, 
My maternal great-grandfather was Edward Everett Barnaby, the founder. Today's economics require us to affiliate with a larger entity, but no one tells us, me, what to buy and what to publish. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you, Miss McDowell, but you must admit, it's a legitimate question. Well, I understand. Yes, Big Mama wanted a prestige publishing house, but that prestige can only be maintained if we are permitted to operate in our own way, choosing books on literary merit and social and scientific value. Oh, well, I, I apologize, Miss McDowell. I'm sorry. I, I guess it really is a good book, isn't it? Mr. Simmons, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> How did you make out with Trisha McDowell? Why do you ask, Mr. Hastings? I'm sure you already know. Well, I understand you're scheduled for uh, an early publication date. Mr. Hastings, I can't do it. I just can't. Why not? Look, we can go around and around with it, but I think that the headquarters building is, is wrong for Middleborough Heights, period. Well, I, I respect I respect your... So I must turn down your offer. Which offer is this? The offer of Barnaby and Brother to publish my manuscript. Why? Why? Isn't it obvious? Not to me. I am not going to give you your quid pro quo. Who said you had to? Isn't that the basis for this thing? Is it? Now, I distinctly remember you said I'd have to give to get. You said I'd be getting publication of my book, and what was I giving? Fifteen acres of scrub and swamp. Uh, that's not exactly what I said. I distinctly remember. I said you would be asked to give. Asked. What's the difference? All the difference in the world. I happened to find out that you, a city planner, had written a book. Since my corporation also owns a publishing house, I thought perhaps it uh, might be of interest. I suggested that you submit it. Now, just a minute. You did. And they are delighted with it. Now, they want to publish it. No, oh, that is the end of it. The end of it? The end of it. And what about the headquarters building? What about it? Well, I thought that my approval was a necessary condition for getting my book published. <laughs> there are no conditions. Aren't you going to ask me to approve the building? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm asking for that approval now. But I disapprove. Well, very well. And you'll still publish the book? Well, of course. Oh, no, no, no. Come on now. There's a catch somewhere. <laughs> Mr. Simmons, we are in no hurry to build the headquarters. Any time within the next five years will do. And uh, perhaps we may ask you again. I can give you my answer in advance. It is no. One should not presume to read the future. Who knows what circumstances may arise? I thought you would require my promise. What good is your promise? Neither of us could afford to put it in writing. All we would have is a secret oral agreement. And you couldn't be compelled to keep it. No, no, no. It's better this way. Congratulations. I know City of Tomorrow will be a great success. Mr. Hastings, what sort of game are you playing with me? Game? I'm sure there's a catch to it. I mean, there must be a catch to it. I know there's a catch to it. What? Harry. What, 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 do you, what do you want? I have to ask you something. <laughs> Harry, whose child are you? What, what, what? Whose child, Harry? Whose child? Well, who, who are you? Mama. Big Mama. Mama? Big, big Mama? But... but, but. It's, it's a dream. It, it, it was just a dream. But oh, what, what was it all about? What did I dream? What did I dream? Hey, Mr. Simmons, it's you, huh? 
Good morning, Mrs. Crawley. So what are you doing sitting at the table in your pajamas? How come you didn't leave for work yet? You know what time it is. Listen, I got a bone to pick with you. I couldn't sleep. You know, the last couple of nights you ain't been eating your supper. You know that? Yeah, yeah. I come in here mornings and find it still on the stove. Why can't you sleep? I've been having nightmares. About what? I don't know. I can't remember. But they're so real. They're, they're, they're so frightening. I I just don't want to go back to sleep. Oh, there's no percentage in that. Mama. Well, what about Mama? There seem to be about someone named Mama. Who's Mama? I could it be your Mama? No. Besides, I always called her Mother. Always? Hey, you know, that could be your problem. Who says I have a problem? Why are you having nightmares? Look, the only mama I know is the is the International Semiconductor Corporation. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a nickname among its own people, the big mama. Oh, this is the outfit you turned down. You mean you dream about them? No, no, no. It's, it's just that look, in these nightmares, I'm, a, I'm aware of some... Maybe it's something... Called Big Mama. Where? Like, like how? I don't remember. Now, these nightmares of yours mean something. What? I don't know. If I could tell, I could hang out a sign and make a fortune. <laughs> hey, you better get dressed and head for work. Yeah. You want me to make you a cup of coffee? No, thank you. Oh, listen. Wait a minute. I got another bone to pick with you. How come you didn't tell me? I had to read about it in the papers. Read about what? What? The book. That's what. Oh, come on. I sweated it out more than you did. So I figured I was entitled to be told. I'm sorry, Mrs. Crawley. I've... I've... There it was in the paper. Barnaby and brother. Hey, I understand they're one of them real bigs. Listen, I hope you jazzed it up a little bit like I told you. Anyway, it's all over town, you know, and everybody's saying, hey, we got a winner here. That's our guy, Harry Simmons. Uh, Mr. Simmons? Yes, yes, what is it? I can't figure this. For years now, you've been trying to peddle that book, and in your heart, you must have given up. So now when this thing is finally hit, why ain't you walking on air, dancing on the ceiling? Why are you having nightmares? Or uh, am I talking out of turn? Mrs. Crawley, may... May I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, shoot. Tell me, tell me, what, what do you think? Does, does anyone ever get something for nothing? Y you mean, do you ever get something y you don't have to pay for? That's exactly what I mean. Well, I'll tell you. There are two things you get free of charge. Your birth and your death. Everything in between carries some kind of price tag. <laughs> There are many who say that somehow you even have to pay for those. The fact is, there's no free lunch, as the economists are fond of telling us, and you only get what you pay for. True enough. But sometimes, isn't there ever a situation where you can beat the game and get what you don't pay for? The answer, as usual, comes in Act 3, shortly. Stay on the road with Quaker State. State's new lifetime engine lubrication protection program guarantees in writing any new car engine using only Quaker State against oil-related failure as long as you own it. Quaker State, the quality motor oil we find from Pennsylvania grade crude oil. Coverage and limited warranty details at participating new car dealers. Proof of maintenance required. New car or old. You'll be on the road. Quaker State. Morning seems start out better. You seem to go much better. A taste of feeling like no other coffee. Always good to the last drop. This is Ken Howard. If you're over 18 and already out of school, I have a personal question for you. Can you read as well as you would like to? I don't mean just traffic signs and sports programs. I'm talking about books, magazines, and newspapers, and the labels on medicine and food packages. If you don't read well enough to understand these, you can get help at your library. 
Many libraries offer assistance for people who didn't learn to read very well in school. If they don't have the programs themselves, librarians can often recommend a local tutor, self-help books, or even televised instruction that includes other subjects as well as reading. 25 million Americans have trouble reading, and some of them don't even realize it, or they're too embarrassed to ask for help. If you are one of them, don't waste your mind any longer. The libraries in your area are waiting to help you. You just walk right in and ask for books on any subject that interests you. Whether it's basketball, basket weaving, or the mystery of the Baskervilles, you name it, the library has it. They've got your number. Now you get theirs and give them a call. A public service message of the American Library Association. Despite what we are told by poets and writers of popular songs, the best things in life are not free. But if it's any consolation, the worst things in life are not free either. The fact is, nothing comes our way without a price tag of some kind. No matter how modest our ambition, how simple our wants, somewhere or other, the cashier waits. And sooner or later, we must get online. Well, how do you like it, Mr. Simmons? Well, what can I say? It's, it's fabulous. I mean, I mean, you read about these people. You, you see them on TV. And now you're one of them. Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> believe those reviews. You owe it all to him, to Trevor Morrison. Yeah, his was the best. Trevor Morrison is the greatest of his time. He's the kind of critic that George Bernard Shaw used to be. Yes, and to think he liked my book. Liked? Oh, he called it a most shattering experience. A sudden flash of revelation into the unconscious lives we lead behind the fortress each of us calls a home. I can assure you, all the others took their cue from him. I can't tell you how, how wonderful I feel. Mm. Even the critics who take issue with him have to be careful. He destroys them with his logic and wit. And he's your strongest partisan. Oh, look, there he is, heading this way. You mean, you mean I'm, I'm going to meet him? Mm-hmm. Well, what am I going to say to him? My, my mind's gone blank. I can't, I can't think of a single thing. Well, that's fine. People don't care about your opinions anyhow. <laughs> They're only interested in their own. Just nod sagely, smile pleasantly, and you'll acquire a reputation for intelligence and wit. Ah, oh, well, is this your newest lion, Trisha? Oh, Trevor, may I present Harry Simmons? How do you do, sir? Yes, and now, Trisha, my dear, you have performed your function. You may leave me. Oh, don't let him frighten you, Harry. He needs that forbidding exterior beat to the kindliest heart. Oh, don't slam to me, Trisha. <laughs> I don't have a heart. My blood is pumped by a secret invention of my very own. I'll see you in a little while, Harry. Yes. You are a most remarkable writer, Mr. Simmons. Oh, thank you, sir. You are that rara avis among authors, a thinking writer. Well, I... Your book is the brilliant flowering of the experience you acquired while doing your job, earning your bread. No, I, I was trying to... I will tell you what you were trying to do. You were demonstrating how man is the only animal that changes his environment when he constructs his shelter. Uh, what I was thinking... I will tell you what you were thinking. Man can no longer build his cities as if nature did not exist. I see you made quite a hit with Trevor Morrison. Gosh, he knows everything about my book. I never saw him spend so much time at a cocktail party. He despises them. Why? I'm having the time of my life. I suppose it's chic to say that cocktail parties are boring. But they are boring, darling. They are. Oh, Myra. Myra Maddox. May I present Harry Simmons? Oh, yeah, you have that TV talk show, Myra at Midnight. <laughs> and you're the number one seller nonfiction. Oh, my dear, Mrs. Simmons, you're going to be on that list so long, you might as well start paying rent and taxes. Why did you say these parties are boring, Miss Maddox? Why don't you two argue it out? Oh, Trisha, darling, I thought you'd never leave. <laughs> Oh, why do I think cocktail parties are boring? Well, look about you. Do people seem to be having a good time? Uh, no. <laughs> no, not not really. From why did they come? To take the measure of the newly arrived lion in the jungle. The ju- why, why do you call it a jungle? What is a jungle? Oh, a place where animals compete for life? Yes. And in the jungle, the stuff of life is food. 
hear its publicity. Well, I'm afraid I'm out of place. I don't care for publicity. Then what are you doing here? Well, I came because my publisher asked me. Oh, and that's the only reason? You're not getting a kick out of being the center of attention? I'm not a performer. We're all performers. I'm a town planner. I think our city should be shaped to conform to our needs. I, I wrote a book that expresses my philosophy. And now what? Well, tomorrow morning I shall be in my office, as usual, concerned with the needs of Middleborough Heights. Sleepy Middleborough Heights. Oh, can you ever be happy there again? Oh, well, I don't see why not. Would you like to be my guest tonight? I... Well, I, I, I wouldn't know what to say. Well, you talk about houses, towns. Uh, may, may, I, may I be frank? I, I am. I feel that TV shows like yours are, well, they're rather frivolous. I agree completely. And I, I'm, I'm really a serious person. But you have a message for your fellow countrymen. It's important. Shouldn't it go beyond the eggheads and the intellectuals? Uh, well, remember. I... The millions who watch my show are the people who vote. Harry. What? Harry Seven. What, what, what do you want? You know what I want, Harry. Tell me. Just tell me. Whose child are you? Well, well, but please don't. Whose child are you, t t t Tell me, tell me who, who, who you are. You know who I am. I'm Big Mama. Big Mama. Big Mama. The big, big Mama, I... Uh, Oh, oh, it's the... It's the dream again. I... I'm dreaming. I... I'm just dreaming. Good morning, Mrs. Crawley. Hey, maybe I come too early for you these days, huh? No, no, no. Why, why, why do you say that? I... Well, now that you're a big TV star oh. and all, maybe you want to sleep late, you know. I'm not really a TV star. Oh, <laughs> you're kidding. I watch you on TV every night you're on. Oh. You talk and suddenly people sit still. They listen. You got something to say and you want to know? You just love to say it. Uh, Mrs. Crawley... Do you remember I, I once asked you a, a question? Can you ever get anything without paying for it? Yeah, and I remember telling you the answer is no. Yeah. At one time, I I would have agreed with you. Now, well, I'm not so sure. Oh, you're going to have to pay. I don't see how. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. Have him come in. I don't know why he insists on wasting my time. And his. Oh, um, good morning, Mr. Hastings. Uh, good morning, Mr. Simmons. If you're here to ask the usual question, I'm here to give you the usual answer. I am completely opposed to the headquarters building for international semiconductors. <laughs> I'm surprised that you're here at all, uh, considering your spectacular successes. First and foremost, I am a city planner. This is my basic job. My other activities are merely peripheral. <laughs> On my desk right now, engaging the lion's share of my concentration are requests for zoning variances. Yes, yes, I see. And among them, uh, Big Mama. You already have your answer, Mr. Hastings. You mean you won't do what your Big Mama asks? She's not my Big Mama. Oh, isn't she? Now, look, my book has been published. I am established. I have a following. I'm known. Uh, but how quickly you can become unknown. Yes, well, that isn't likely. Uh, Tricia McDowell is raving over the first draft of my new book, a sequel to City of Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's even better, and so, therefore, Trevor Morrison will praise it even more highly. Uh, Big Mama can ask Tricia... Not to publish. Uh, I can go to any publisher in the country. Big Mama may ask Trevor Morrison to reevaluate his original reaction to City of Morrow. <laughs> Word can then get out that he plans to destroy it. Now, 
Who will want to publish you in that case? Why would Trevor even listen? Trevor has the most sought-after position in the world. Critic for the Times Journal. Hmm? Big Mama owns that paper. Owns the... Mm-hmm. I, I don't believe it. <laughs> these are these are honorable people. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to Patricia McDowell. <laughs> oh, she may not be in. Yes, well... Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Tricia McDowell, please. Uh, it's Harry Simmons. I see. Uh, yes, well, um... Uh, tell her I, I called. She, uh... She's in a, in a meeting. Uh, no one can buy Trevor Morrison. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, hello. Uh, uh, Mr. Morrison, please. It's, uh... uh Harry Simmons. Oh, uh... When when will he be free? Uh, uh, I see. Thank you. Now, why don't you sleep on it, hmm? I'm sure it'll all look different in the morning. Come, Harry. What? Come with Big Mama. Where? Where? Come, Harry. Uh, Let's join the other children. See? Here's Trisha and Trevor and Myra. My idea. Children, here is Harry, your new little brother. No, I... Say hello to Harry, children. Uh, hello, Harry. Hello, Harry. Hello, Harry. Say hello to the children, no, I, Harry. I, I, I... Harry, if you don't, they won't play with you anymore. I... I well, Harry... I, 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 hello, children. And whose child are you, Harry? I... I'm, I'm your child. Say it again, Harry. I'm your child. Call me Mama, Big Mama. Say, I am your little child, Big Mama. I'm your little child, Big Mama. Well, Harry, how are you this morning? I thought they were all honorable people. Oh, they are. Just as you're an honorable person. I'm caving in under pressure. I'm going against my own convictions. But convictions must be examined in the light of new realities, new situations. Hello? Hello, Harry. That's Trisha McDowell, isn't it? Darling, I'm returning your call. Listen, Myra wants to give a party to celebrate your first anniversary on her show. And of course, we can announce the new book. Trevor has been given an advanced copy. Oh, he's ecstatic about it. Isn't everything wonderful? Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I'd like to tell all of you to go to the devil. What's the use? I'd have to go there with you. <laughs> that bell. Hey, it's two in the morning. All right. All right, give it a rest. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh. Hey, Mr. Simmons. Oh. Oh, what are you doing here in the rain in the middle of the night? Oh, come in, come in. You'll catch your dad. No, no, I, I, I can't stay. I only came by to tell you something. At this hour? In this weather? It's, it's, uh, it's very important. Please, please listen. You, you remember, I I once asked if, if you could ever get anything with, without paying for it. Yeah? And, and you said no, and, and I said, yeah, it was possible. Uh-huh. Well, Miss, Mrs. Crawley, I'm here to tell you I, I was wrong, and you were right. You pay for everything. You never stop paying. Uh, Mr. Simmons, you get in here out of that wet. With the flu's going around. Come Goodbye, on. Mrs. Crawley. Goodbye. 
And remember what I told you. You always pay. You always pay. Like I said, I knew him better than anybody else. It was a fella I had everything to live for, sitting on top of the world. And he goes around crazy late at night in the rain. If I didn't know him better, I'd say he wanted to kill himself. But why? He had everything. <laughs> enough, she knew him better than anyone else. But the fact is, she didn't really know him at all. Oh, she knew his likes, his peed, his taste in food and clothes. She knew every outside aspect of Harry Simmons. But of the fires that burned within him and the forces that drove him, she knew very little. What do any of us know of the next one? Well, as far as I'm concerned, you know I'll be back shortly. Honey, we're having cheeseburgers like we've never had them before. We are? Here's your fork. My fork? Yes, your Where's fork. my bun? I want my bun. Our cheeseburger macaroni is a blend of tangy cheese, hearty macaroni, and savory seasonings that give cheeseburgers a whole new meaning. Well, did you miss the bun? <laughs> what bun? I understand you're trying to quit smoking. Is that... Uh, I see. A little cranky, huh? Yeah, well, just think how much better you're going to feel. And look, maybe if you were to try the American Lung Association's Freedom from Smoking program, that might help, you suppose? Uh, well, in the meantime, uh, have a nice day. If you want to kick the habit but need help, contact your local American Lung Association for information on their Freedom from Smoking program. As always, it's a matter of life and breath. George Orwell wrote a book in which he talked about Big Brother, who would ride roughshod over all our rights and beat us into a state of submission. This may not be the actual scenario. While we may, if we are not careful, be enslaved, it will probably be through the seductive wiles of Big Mama, and her methods shall be so painless and so pleasant that we shall hardly be aware of the fact that we have lost our souls. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Joan Shea, E.V. Jester, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. <laughs> Let me just say, there's nothing new under the sun. If you don't believe me, it's in the Bible. There's a list of standard reasons why men and women kill each other. And yours has to be one of them. I don't think so. Let me hear it. Very well. I want to kill her because I have no choice. If I don't, she's going to kill me. Self-defense, that's the second oldest motive in the world. It happens to be true. Why does she want to kill you? You'll never believe it. <laughs> you any idea all the stories I've heard in this business? You've never heard one like this. She isn't human. She looks uh, human to me. She is physically but she isn't subject to the laws that seem to govern the rest of us. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Have you ever...
ever wondered what are those unknown impulses that influence your life? You find yourself doing things you can't account for. Why? Is your destiny foretold? What has foreshadowed it, or who? Do your ancestors determine its course? Frankly, I believed none of this until I ran across the strange story of Mary and Jack Carter. Tell me, you of the Huron tribe, where did you learn to speak English so fluently? My mother taught me. Well, I, I don't find that so strange. No. Who taught me is not strange. But when I was taught, you might find rather unusual. When? Well, probably 30 years ago. You look about 45 or 50. My mother taught me English 380 years ago. How old are you? I am a thousand years old. Our mystery drama, The Man of Two Centuries, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Len Carew. meet up with Jack Carter, an historian, and his wife, Mary, a painter. Jack teaches at Cape Royal College and has taken a sabbatical to write a book he calls The Conquest of Canada. The Carters have a houseboat tied up off the St. Lawrence River. They also have a cottage nearby, which Mary uses as a studio. We find them finishing a meal on the houseboat, probably the last time their lives would be normal. Every time I come aboard the houseboat, shockwaves go through me, Jack. I realize what a mistake it was to let you be alone here while uh, I live in the cottage. I can't do any writing with you in the next room painting. I can't concentrate. You there, me here. I think it's one heck of a good arrangement. My book is coming along great. But how can you live like this? I mean, look around you. Books everywhere. How much research do you need, Jack? I thought Donna Connor was going to give you all that Huron Indian stuff. He is, he is. Well, look, I refuse to stumble over your books anymore. Either you get rid of most of them or you put them all in one place. Mary, I need every one of them. I don't know why I'm apologizing to you. We got this houseboat specifically so I could do my work without being in your way. That's what I get for marrying a Frenchman. Who's French? So my great-grandparents were born in Paris. I was born in Montreal. Hello! Anybody aboard? Oh, somebody's hailing us. I'll go. You, down there in that rowboat. You looking for someone? I'm looking for Jack Carter. You're looking right at him. Toss up your lanyard. I'll haul you to the houseboat. Here goes. Catch. Got it. Say, that rowboat of yours weighs like a warship. What do you got in there? We carry a lot of equipment. Yeah. Here, I'll make you fast, right here. See those steps? Want a hand? No, no, no problem. <clears throat> Mr. Carter? Yes, and uh, here comes the wife. Who is this nice-looking young man who's just come aboard? Mrs. Carter? That's me. I'm Jones. P.C. Jones. I thought those boots looked a little official. They make us keep them shined. P.C. Jones? Are those uh, your initials? You'll uh, have to excuse the wife. She's an American. She doesn't know what P.C. means. Well, it means police constable, Mrs. Carter. I'm here for information. Is there a problem, constable? There may be. And if you don't mind, I'd like a word with you both. Of course, let's uh, do it in the cabin. I'm just heating up more water for our second cup of coffee. One for you, Constable? No, thanks. Mary, make the Constable some tea. Matter of fact, I won't have anything. I'd like to get to why I'm here as soon as I can. Yes, why are you here? It's been reported to us that you're keeping an Indian on the premises. <laughs> what do you mean, keeping? Uh, let me just check my notes. Uh, uh, one report says that he's an unpaid helper. 
Another says he's an unpaid domestic. Indian slave. Now, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold everything. We're doing <laughs> no such thing. You mean there's no Indian on the premises? Sure there is. A bona fide Huron Indian. But he's not any of the things you said he was. He just showed up one day. Matter of fact, he's helping me write a book. What is this with the people in town? What have they got against Indians? I know what it is. Don O'Connor goes around dressed like an Indian. Why shouldn't he? He is an Indian. Uh, would you say he's, uh... I mean, is this Indian civilized? Don O'Connor is a pure-blooded Huron Indian. His ancestors go back 500 years, at least probably longer. When he's here, he's our guest. Not a servant or a slave. You got that? I don't know where you people get these crazy notions. Mr. Jones, is there uh, anything else you want from us? Uh, yes, now this report says there are peculiar sounds coming from this houseboat at night. Are you telling me the people of Cape Royal have nothing better to do out here in this wilderness but to complain about sounds? It says strange music was heard in the vicinity of the Carter household. Uh, is that something the Indian does? It's not so strange. Donna Khan is very musical. He plays the flute, and we love it. P.C. Jones, don't you think these accusations are a little wild? Our friend does have some native rites he performs for me, and I make notes on them, record them, study them for the book I'm doing. Now, is there anything else? Mm. Yeah, I have another report that it sounds like a whole crowd of Indians doing some kind of dance, again at night. Midnight. Now, I'm sorry he isn't here right now, so you could see for yourself what a lovely man he is. Quiet, kind, and, and very attractive. He wouldn't hurt a fly. And then here's a complaint from an elderly lady who saw this Indian in a supermarket and fainted. It was probably the prices that made her faint. How is this Indian dressed? Or undressed? He dresses beautifully. He has these feathers, nothing underneath, a, a tunic of feathers, you know? And sometimes he paints his face. Show me one woman who doesn't do that. He's a beautiful-looking person with a very fine physique. Mary, you don't have to overdo it. Constable, of course he's in good shape. He lives outdoors. How do you communicate with him? How do you mean? I mean, do you speak Indian? Uh, Mr. Jones, Donna Connor speaks perfect English and perfect French. And I don't speak either of them half as well. I think you'd better report to whoever you report to that the Indian who visits us is quite educated, is our guest, and once belonged to the great Huron tribe that owned all this territory. Well, that's not the point. If he's a vagrant and has no visible means of support, we want to know. Why? He's not asking for your support. Or the towns, or the Canadian governments, or the American governments. They could... We can't have Indians wandering about, frightening people, disturbing the peace, stealing... Now, hold on there. Hold on. If anyone's done any stealing, it's the French and the Americans. And not so long ago, either. The Hurons owned all this land on both sides of the St. Lawrence. And we cheated them out of it. Our friend has more right to be here than any of us. Well, if you take that attitude, Mr. Carter... There's only one thing I can do. I'm sorry you have to go so soon, Mr. Jones, and can't stay for that cup of tea. I'll be back with a warrant. Warrant for what? Your Indian friend will have to accompany me, and he will have to answer a few questions. I'm sorry, but that's my job. I think that's really mean of you. Well, it's all right. I can cast off and get down to my boat. Goodbye. And I was going to offer to paint his portrait. <laughs> you were to have missed him. Oh, that Cape Royal policeman? Yes, he came to report that there were people in town who didn't like the way you dressed. And uh, a whole lot of other complaints and that I shouldn't be having you as my guest whenever you came by the houseboat. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Changed from what? Right here along La Grande Riviere, what you call the St. Lawrence. When my people lived here and then the white man came from across the seas. 
We thought the way you dressed was very, very strange. <laughs> when you add it up, and that's what my book is going to say, I think we French made life worse for you than you did for us. Well, you fought you for a long time, but whiskey and gunpowder won. Are you making progress with the book, Jack? Do you know the expression stalled? <laughs> Stopped. Halted in its tracks. I can't seem to get the right feeling. I want people who read it to almost believe they were here when Canada was opened up. I'm grateful for the help you're giving me. It's wonderful. Uh, a pleasure. You know, I thought when I first saw you paddling away in that birch bark canoe, all dressed up in feathers and leather, they must be shooting some movie around here. <laughs> I had no idea you were preserving the traditions of your tribe. And did you get that tape recorder we talked about? I did. And it's all set up to have you start reminiscing. Cartier, I have a better idea. What did you call me? I'm Jack Carter, not Cartier. Uh, a slip of the tongue. Dona Kona, you never cease to amaze me. A slip of the tongue, he says. I've been meaning to ask you since we met, how did you become so proficient in our language? In fact... Where did you learn to speak such fluent English? Mm -hmm. If I told you, I think you might find it hard to believe. Try me. You went to a Canadian college. No, I never did. You learned it from someone. At home? Your father, your mother taught you? Yeah, that's right. The crux is not who taught me, but when I was taught. I'm terrible at guessing games, Dona Kona. It doesn't matter to me anyway when you learned English. After all, what are you, 40 years old, 45? So you were taught, say, uh, 30 years ago. By your calendar, I am centuries old. What does that cryptic remark mean? Well, it wasn't until 1499 that I started to learn English. Oh, absolutely. I mean, no one ever learned the language until 1499. <laughs> I kid you not, Cartier. My mother taught me how to speak your language about 400 years ago. And I am a thousand years old. I told you that this day would probably be the very last in the life of Jack Carter that one could call ordinary or average. Not because the Huron Indian, Donna Kana, is a fraud or a fake or false, but because, as we will discover shortly, he is speaking the truth. in an inlet adjacent to the St. Lawrence River. It is night. We're on deck with historian Jack Carter and a full-blooded Huron Indian by the name of Dona Kona. There is also the threat of trouble from a police constable by the name of Jones. And can you accept that I'm a thousand years old? Well, I can try. The English was a gift from my mother. The French language I learned from Jacques Cartier. You. I... Was Jacques Cartier and you and I spoke French? I met you on your second voyage from France. And when was that? Oh, sometime in the 1500s. Oh, as long ago as that. The only settlement of any size in Canada was then called Hoshilaga. The Montreal of today. Hmm. Across the water there. Right there where your cottage is is where I lived with many Hurons. Can you believe that? I'm still trying. Do you know the explorer, John Cabot? Only by name. Well, I knew him in person. Of course, I was quite young. When John Cabot came here, he met my mother. Oh, he did, did he? Hmm. And she was very, very beautiful. They fell in love, and over the strong objections of the tribal chiefs, they married. But nothing came of it. Nothing more than myself and Cabot teaching my mother English, which she taught me. Is there a record of Cabot going up to St. Lawrence? That would be useful for the book. Well, there's no record I know of, because Cabot thought he'd reached China, and that we Indians lived in India. Of course, in those days, nobody really knew where anything was. That's Mary. I'll get it. Be right back. Yes, darling? Uh, Jack, how about coming over to the 
cottage for a little drink? Well, I, I tell you, Mary, I'm still working. Oh, you're coming over for breakfast in the morning? Oh, sure, you promised me flapjacks. And you'll get them. Good night, dear. Say, don't work too late. Sleep well. Good night, Mary. Sorry, domestic bliss. Two beds separated by a body of water. Uh, I would prefer, in fact, I insist, you tell Mrs. Carter nothing about this conversation. If I told Mary you were 350 uh, years a old... A thousand. She'd have me committed. You too. Now, about your mother, Donna Connor, you were saying? Well, Cabot went back to England. And then you arrived. I did? Jacques Cartier... Sailing up the St. Lawrence in 1537. Ah, <laughs> yes, Jacques. Jacques. I like the pronunciation. Uh, Jacques Cartier is the way it's pronounced. But Jack Carter is pronounced differently. Monsieur Cartier, I hadn't meant to speak about this, but our conversation went in that direction. You don't have to draw me any diagrams. You're saying I'm the reincarnation of the French explorer Cartier. No. You are him. I... I am him? I see. Uh, uh, could you prove that to me? Do you really wish that? Think. But how could you prove it without putting me in time where he was? Uh, you've answered your own question. It's the dream of all historians. If only we ourselves could live the yesterdays, what an insight we'd have to the past if we could actually turn back the clock. Well, the clock follows time. It doesn't make it a figure of speech. Uh, your primitive belief. Now, we believe time is an endless river, that you are carried with it and the shore passes. Those shores are the years you live. That's your Huron mythology. Our Huron truth. If it were possible for you to enter my canoe... Turn it around and travel against the stream of time. You might find yourself back in those ages of the past. You think are dead. The past is dead. Oh, it lives. All the pasts of all the civilizations continue. Oh, I would give anything to be able to believe that. Would you risk death to go back? I would. A truly scientific mind would. I can take you back. To the days of Jacques Cartier, the explorer. But you cannot guarantee my return to this present? I have done it before, alone. I go back to my people often. Back and forth between the centuries? Yes. Whether I can take you with me, uh, well, I'm not sure. Oh, it's very tempting. Is there some kind of ritual? Oh, yes. Oh, if I could be right here, on the St. Lawrence, 350 years ago, to know the truth about your people, about myself, the way it was here, the way it looked. What a book I could write. Oh, it's very tempting. I would do it for you, Jacques. What would happen to me if it didn't work? Would I be <laughs> stuck? Somewhere in some other century? This river contains many bodies of those who could not swim between the centuries. So others have tried. I want it. Yes? Let's start. Do I have any choice of centuries? Well, not this time. Since you're asking me to be your guide, I shall put you in the century where you and I first met. Jacques, step in. I'm holding the canoe steady. Shall I sit here? No, right where you are. No, I'll climb into the prow. I, uh, I uh, didn't know I was in for a boat ride. You knew you were in for a ritual. And this is what's going to be safe passage back a couple of hundred years? This little canoe? Yes, I'm unrolling a deer skin, which will cover the entire canoe. Oh, here. Let me help. No, no, you stay where you are. I want you to close your eyes. Leave them closed. And I'm, I'm now moving the disc in over your head. Now, we're both now inside the canoe. I'm putting my paddle into the water. 
and slowly, I shall move with the curtain. Are your eyes closed? Yes, they are. Now, with your right hand, reach forward. You'll find my reed flute. Do you have it? Yes, I have it. Place it to your lips and breathe into it. I can't play the flute, don't I? Breathe into the flute. It will play its own music. Now, keep your eyes tightly shut. Is this a, a special reed flute made by the Indians? Mr. Cate, you never called us Indians. In the old days, those of you who came across the big waters called us les sauvages. You like savages better than Indians? They thought they had reached India when they called us that. Now stop talking and breathe into that flute. Spirit of tomorrow and yesterday... I am Chief Donacona. I bring with me venison dressed for a journey. My bow. My arrows with their heads of stone. I call upon thee, great spirit, to move this vessel of birth into that time when Jacques Cartier came to Canada. Donacona. What's that noise? It sounds like a giant waterfall. There are no falls around here. It's it's a whirlpool. We're being sucked under. Capitaine Cartier. Oui? We have a visitor heading towards our ship. I see him. Judging from his headdress, he's an important member of the tribe. I thought so too, Captain, but if he is, why is he paddling his canoe alone? If he is the chief, he can do as he likes. I remember my first voyage to the newfound land in 34. You weren't with me then. Those sauvages answered to their chiefs, not the other way around. How can we tell whether the Peau Rouge will tell us the truth? Do we say our king sent us for gold or do we not? Do we ask, is this the river we follow, the route to China? For no matter what their answer, yes or no, how can one be sure? We'll have to show them who is master. Frighten them. When he comes aboard, give this chief an hour with me. Then you come on deck casually with your rifle and... Uh, Take some pot shots at the gulls and bring down a few. That may convince our friend we are not to be lied to. I uh, have the strangest sensation, Chief Donacona, that you are not unknown to me. Monsieur Cartier, I have the same presentment. That I also have been in your company before today. But I tell myself, all white men look alike. Ah, ha, ha. There have been uh, many before me? All looking for the gold of Hoshilaga. Oh, there is gold in Hoshilaga? <laughs> they are misinformed. The Portuguese, the French, even the Irish monks come here convinced there is gold. But there is none. So, there is none. We are more interested in following the Grand Riviere to another land. We are looking for a waterway to China. I never heard of it. China? Who lives there? A fine civilization. They have silk spices. That is our destination. Monsieur Jacques Cartier, you have lost your way. You have come to my Kanata. Kanata? Is that where we are? Those wigwams on shore. That is my Kanata. And I am chief. Chief? This is my boat, La Grande Hermine, and I am Cartier, the chief of this boat. I live in France, across the oceans, the big waters. <laughs> it is good. We meet chief to chief. I go now. I invite you to come to my canata, and we'll have a feast. When the sun is well down, you will see our bonfire. Come then. I will. I'll be there. What do you think, Jones? 
Chief Donacona seems friendly enough. What did he say this place was called? Canada? Canada. Ah. Uh, what about the location of Hoshilaga? I had to pretend we weren't interested in gold. Did he believe you? He told me a tall tale about it being so cold, we'd all freeze to death. And China? Said he never heard of it. I believed him. He speaks uh, surprisingly well for a sauvage. Hmm. You, go on below. I'll see what I can find out tonight. He's coming back. Good night, Captain. Chief, what brings you back? I came to warn you. Warn me? This man, Joe, your first mate. How well do you know him? Uh, this is his first voyage with me? Make the trail with him slowly and carefully. It's winding and it could be treacherous. You are warning me against my own first mate? But you don't know him. We Hurons have deep feelings, a deep knowledge of the spirit. Strong senses which we teach our children. Without them, we couldn't survive against wild animals in the wilderness. And so we know when there is truth and trust and when there is not. Friend, be careful. There's a lot to be said for parallel time. That is, the coexistence of many centuries. But don't only take my word for it. The great American Mark Twain told an audience once that he himself was actually present in Versailles during its royal heyday a century earlier. Because Twain was a known humorist, people thought he was kidding. There are other reports, so this one is not the first, nor will it be the last. I'll return shortly with Act Three. I agree with you, this story is strange, but not incredible. Many of us have flashes of bygone days, and there may be quite a few who are actually transported to other centuries. But no one will admit to it. I know I wouldn't let on if the future or the past were my real century. Besides, how would I know? So there are those who travel time and those who remain behind, like Mary Carter. Puzzled, distressed, and worried. Hello up there! Anybody aboard? Is that you, Constable? Oh, I, I'm glad you're here. I'm getting quite expert in climbing up that ladder. Is Mr. Carter back? No, he isn't, Mr. Jones. And I'm getting frantic. I don't know what to do. It's, it's six whole days. He's never been gone like that without letting me know where he is. I'd like to ascertain the exact time they left. Any ideas? I told you the, the night before, I spoke to Jack on the little phone between the cottage and the boat. And he said he'd be over in the morning for flapjacks. But he never showed up. So it could have been they took off any time that night. Well, I know you said Donna Connor lured Jack off somewhere, but, but why would he? We were very good to him. He ate with us. He worked with Jack on the book. Uh, do you have a picture of Mr. Carter I could have... I'm going to have headquarters send out in all points. Tomorrow it'll be a week. And although I think there's some simple answer to this... You do think that, don't you? And they just took a trip to see something upriver, don't you? Yeah, I do. I don't think there's been any foul play. Uh, you wouldn't happen to have a picture of that Indian also, would you? I, I think I do. I took some snapshots when he first showed up in the spring. They're inside Jack's desk. Oh, the pictures will help. Not that I think your husband won't just turn up any time, because I think he will. Mr. Jones, I just had a sinking feeling. You're telling me everything you know, aren't you? I mean, they haven't discovered two bodies somewhere, and you want these photographs just to identify them. <laughs> Chief, I'm sorry I was so long. I got to the Carter household all right, but after I'd rowed ashore and tied up, my bicycle had a flat tire. 
What have you got there? Snapshots of Jack Carter and that Indian he's been palling around with. You mean Carter hasn't shown up yet? Neither of them have. What are you bothering with pictures for? I thought I made it plain that if Carter was still missing, to bring the wife in for questioning. Well, I checked her out. There's no insurance on her husband's life, and they've got a very small savings account. Everything is sunk into this houseboat and the cottage. He's a history professor. They don't make any money. I repeat, I told you, if her husband didn't show to bring her in. All right. I'll go back and get her. But she couldn't have done it. Killed him, gotten rid of him. What motive, Chief? Chief Cartier, please remain with me and warm your hands at our campfire. Merci. To uh, enjoy your hospitality is not the only reason I am here. I come to ask if you would help us with some guides along La Grande Riviere. There are many tributaries, and it would be easy to lose one's way. We would like, first, to go to Hoshalaga. I thought so, Cartier. But you ask more than I can give in friendship. We will find it anyway. With help, it would have been sooner. If there is gold, we would share it. But to find it, we do not wish to get lost. Do you wish to be killed? If not frozen to death, killed by unfriendly tribes? Donna Connor, you refuse? For your sake, I must. You realize the inference is there is gold, but you don't wish to share it. You can think what you like. Thank you. And if you could have someone take me out to my ship? I warn you, you will not get to Hoshilaga. Donna Connor, I am tired. It is very late. I shall take you in my own canoe, myself. I don't think you uh, understand, Don O'Connor. I am not my own master. I was sent here by my king, Francois Premier of France, to open up a route to China and to bring back gold. Many explorers from many lands have brought back tales of the riches of Hoshalaga. All exaggerated. Believe me, you give the matter some deep thought tonight. I have given it deep thought already. Uh, well, there was someone in the water swimming towards us. Ah. Ooh. Jacob, what are you doing in the water? I... I came to warn you, Captain. They did not see me. I dropped overboard. When they had drunk themselves to sleep. What's happened? There has been a mutiny. What? Thus made Jones broke out the stars, gave everyone a rifle and a pistol. They're waiting for the morning tide to sail back to France. All right, all right. Now, uh, go back to the ship. Don't let anyone see you. I'll take care of this. Yes, sir. You will be shot, Cartier, as you board your ship, you know that. I doubt there's murder in any of them. Bring me alongside, and I think I can talk Jones out of this foolishness. What does he have to gain? Wait, wait. This is far enough. I'll climb up the anchor chain. Now let us still be friends. Come by for me in the morning, and we'll talk some more. We must find a way together. I will be here. I pray to the Great Spirit that you will be also. Cartier, what did you think you had accomplished creeping up on me in the dark? I saw you come up from the canoe. I was ready for you. Jones, untie my hands. Will you take this rope off? I order you. You're not giving any more orders, Cartier. What do you think is going to happen to you? You return to France with your captain tied up on deck. Then what? Do you think they'll reward you for leading a mutiny and taking prisoner the king's captain? You promised us gold. And I heard what the native chief said to you. There is no gold. So we have decided tomorrow morning we sail for France. All of you will be put in irons when you reach San Malo. Can't you understand that, Jones? 
What do you think I'll say? That I tied myself up because it amused me? Cassie, you will say nothing. Because as soon as it is light and we sail, you will be keel hauled. And I shall have to tell our sovereign King Francois that unfortunately Jacques Cartier fell overboard one night and we could not find your body. So naturally, I became the pilot and we all came home. I fell overboard? And every single man will swear to it. Hey, Cartier, come back here. He's going to jump. Stop him. His hands are tied behind his back. No. Don't stop him, anybody. If he believes he can swim to land with his hands tied behind his back, who am I to stop him? Jack. Oh, Jack, you've been gone for days. Where were you? Dona Cona, tell my darling wife. Uh, Mrs. Carter, your husband fell into the river and I fished him out and, um... I, I fell into the water? I don't remember that. But your clothes are very wet, Jack. It's been days. Mary, don't get so het up. Dona Cona and I went for a little canoe ride. There were some relics of the past he wanted to show me. I think, is that right? Funny, uh... Dona Cona, what did we do? I don't think you can remember... Captain. Captain? Say, Mary, wasn't I going over to the cottage this morning for flapjacks? Can you make enough for the two of us? I, I mean, the three of us? Jack, are you kidding me? Or, or did you black out or something? You were not here last night or the night before. Not since Monday. Hello there. B.C. Jones wants to come aboard. Dona Cona. He's been threatening warrants and things to pick you up. Beat it. I'll wait for you in the canoe. I'll paddle around so he won't see. Oh, Jack, you're not planning another trip somewhere, are you? Well, well, well. Look who's here. Mr. Carter himself. What do you want, Jones? The chief told me to bring Mrs. Carter in for questioning. But since you're here, there's nothing to question her about. You see, Mrs. Carter? What did I tell you? I knew your husband was all right. And, by the way, if you see that Indian, you tell him to get lost. We don't want to see him around Cape Royal anymore. I'll tell him no such thing. But I'll tell you, Jones, to get lost and get off my boat. I've had enough of you, and if I see you around, you'll get more than a piece of my mind. Mary, I'm going to have to make another trip for my book, understand? I don't know how long I'll be gone, but if it turns out to be pretty long, just don't worry. I'll be fine. But you're leaving? You just got here. I have to, Mary. I don't have any choice. But when I get all this down on paper, you're going to be very proud. Now, where's that Dona Cona? Dona Cona! Where are you? But Jack, where are you going? Uh, can't you tell me where? <laughs> to leave her like that, not to take Mary into my confidence, but how could I? Dona Cona, back we go. I want to teach that Jones a lesson. He won't expect to see me rise up out of the water. Is that flute under the seat? It should be where you left it. Got it. You fasten down the canoe cover, I'll play the flute, and we'll both pray each to our own gods to move through time and show up right next to my flagship. Cartier, congratulations for having planted our fleur de lis on the shores of... Uh, uh, what did you say it was called? Uh, Your Majesty, I, I never gave it a name. Oh, Jacques, the new land you found, no name. Uh, there are two lands. A, a very large piece which we sailed around. That was the first newfound land. Then the second, which contains, I believe, the river gateway to China, that... 
Well, we could call it the same as the native chief does. He says it's his Kanata. Bien, bien, excellent. Canada is as good as any name. As you say. What's the matter with you, Jacques? Why are you depressed? You act as though are you not pleased to see your king. Oh, uh, of course I am. I didn't expect uh, to be here so soon. Something went wrong in my transportation. Uh, there were matters on the ship uh, I wished to attend to. Ah, we heard all about the mutiny. You did? The way you climbed out of the water and single-handedly overcame the mutineers. That will go down in French history. I did? I did, oui, oui, I did. And then sailing up La Grande Riviere and making friends with the chief of Hochelaga, who gave you all these golden trinkets. See, we have them spread out on the table. You may take as many as you wish, Jacques. And we wish you to rest up now. And we shall organize another expedition to China, but going in the opposite direction. That may be quicker. Uh, Your Majesty, something tells me I should go back to uh, Canada and uh, try that way again. What tells you? We tell you the other direction. Um. Uh, <laughs> I know. A woman. Are we correct? As always, Your Highness. Frankly, when I was on the shore of La Grande Riviere, I lost my heart to a maiden there. A sauvage. Does she speak a language? Fluently. She also paints, landscapes, portraits. Well, we cannot condemn an explorer for wishing to explore <laughs> something new, even if she is not a French damsel. said the ideal mystery is the one you'd enjoy even if the end was missing certainly the man of two centuries could not be the whole story did jacques cartier re-enter our century the century of the present the maiden of his heart mary was she there waiting or was he bound to the 16th century condemned to forever discovering canada entertaining about your mystery theater is that there is no limit to where your imagination can take you. Life can live in space and in time. The impossible can appear possible. Lastly, before you dismiss this strange episode, ask yourself, are you sure you haven't been here before? Who were you the last time around? For you were here, no doubt about that. Our cast included Len Cariou, Diana Kirkwood, Lloyd Batista, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Look, I'm in comm screen. Where have you been? I told you. The usual pep talk to the passengers. Now, what's the problem? I don't want to use the squawk box for this message. Something wrong with the equipment? I guess you could call it that. Captain, get over here on the double with Doc Mayer. Why? Somebody hurt? He doesn't look hurt to me, Captain. He looks dead. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I think we've all heard that history repeats itself. But I know that I, for one... Never had it happen to me until recently. 
A tragedy replayed that still has me stunned. If you remember the 1940s, war raging throughout Europe, Germany the invader, and among many cities and towns invaded was Doremi. Does that name ring a bell? Keep listening, for the bell will soon toll, undeniably loud and sorrowfully clear. Lieutenant, how is the prisoner this morning? She refused to eat. Uh, is she in pain? Not a flicker of an eyelash would betray it. She is as brave as an Aryan. There is a ring of spies here, and that girl is the courier. The American we shot has delivered something to her. What? I have every intention of finding out. Our mystery drama, The Voices, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Norman Rose and Amanda Plummer. I shall return shortly with Act One. Now, about this extraordinary event that happened to me and which bears retelling. Last summer, I was driving along the River Meuse in what the French call the Département of Vosges. And suddenly, I was in Doremi, the town where Joan of Arc was born and baptized. I stopped and spoke with an old curé or parish priest who related this story. Of course, monsieur, you remember the Great War, the last Great War. The Germans invaded France, and in June of 1940, they were in Doremi. I was curé of our village at the time. A Frenchman by the name of Cochon had taken command in the name of the German military government. German? Yeah. Send the next prisoner in. Yeah, all here, Cochon. Hans, who is this next prisoner? What are the charges? It's a girl, Jeanne. Jeanne? That is all, no surname? Well, she gave no last name. We found her in a farmhouse. She wears trousers and a shirt, the clothing of a man. We searched the house and the barn. We found an American parachutist hiding in a haystack, uh, who may have shot. Jeanne. You are Jeanne? Yes, I am. Sit there. What is your surname? I know of none. What? Everyone has a surname. I know only I am Jeanne. Who are you? My surname is Cochon. You will call me Sir. I am authorized by the arm of occupation to interrogate all French citizens who have disobeyed the edict of June 1940. You are French, sir? I am French. And you are in the pay of the Nazis? I will ask the questions and you will answer. A collaborationist! Sit down. Tie that girl to the chair. I pity you, Herr Cochon. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. Cochon, not Cochon. The, the prisoner is tied securely, sir. Uh, what is your father's name, girl? Jacques, sir. Where is he? Also hiding under a haystack? My father joined the French army. Uh, then he is probably deserted or is dead. Your mother's name? Isabelle Romé. Mm. Any brothers, sisters? I have a sister, Catherine. But you won't get her. She has died. I have three brothers, Jacquemin, Pierre, and Jean. They are at the front. You were hiding an enemy soldier in your farmhouse. What other enemies are hidden in other farmhouses around here? You will have to ask the Lord. I act only for him. Oh, you do, do you? Hmm? How old are you, Jean? I am 19 years. Where are you from? Here, Doremi de Greux. We know that Doremi is a nest of those who would aid the enemy. We are conducting a house-to-house search, and anyone who is suspect will be taken out and shot. Now, you could make it much easier for yourself if you tell us who and where. I might even recommend clemency if you help us. I will do as I am instructed by the Lord, Herr Cochon. Do not make me angry. I told you my name is Cochon. I know what you are up to calling me Cochon, so it sounds like a pig. And to you, ma petite folle, I am Monsieur Cochon, not Herr. I am not German, I am French. 
Do you know that I could have you shot in one minute? Yes, I am your prisoner. Uh, to get back to the Lord. He instructs you, you say, hmm? Has this only been since the war? No. Since I was 13, when I received a revelation by a voice that instructed me how to behave. At 13, John, you heard a voice, hmm? I was very afraid then. I was in my father's garden, and the voice came from my right, the direction of our church, Notre Dame de Doremi. How interesting. You are wearing men's clothes. Does the voice tell you to do that? Yes. Why do you suppose it tells you that? Why would you need to disguise yourself as a man? I don't know. To help the enemy? I don't think so. You, Air Conchon, are the enemy. The voices tell me I should not help you. Do the voices tell you that is the quickest way to death? Hans, I do not think Mademoiselle Jean believes I am in earnest when I tell her to confess those who are helping the Americans and the English. Would you be good enough to take one of the young lady's hands and bend it behind her back as far as it will go? Perhaps before it breaks, she will be convinced. May I ask, before I am tortured... That I am permitted to say the act of contrition to my curé? Have him brought here. I should not have thought the intercession of a priest necessary, since you are on speaking terms with the Lord himself. I came to Jeanne and she made her confession, the contents of which, of course, I cannot reveal to you. As I absolved her of sin, I was struck then, as I still am today, by a peculiar sensation. Had this not happened 550 years ago to another Jean, also born in Doremi, and who faced interrogators at this very spot? I have tried force with the prisoner, but she maintains she has nothing to add to her testimony. That she is alone in her act? that no one conspires with her. Lieutenant, how did she appear to you today? Well, she refused to eat anything. Her arm? Bound up. Is she in pain? No, not a flicker of an eyelash would betray it. She is as brave as an Aryan. There is a ring of spies somewhere in Lorraine, and I am convinced Doremi is the center. The American landed here to deliver something to the underground. Well, he had no papers on him whatsoever. Bien entendu, of course not. The girl had already disposed of them. Have her come back here and I'll get on with the inquiry. Monsieur, don't you think she is a bit simple-minded? Now, all this nonsense about voices and lights. Well, I did not hear her say anything about lights. Is that what she told you? No, no, I do not believe she is the idiot she pretends. Her eyes are too clever. Have her in. Jeanne. I shall not have you tied to that chair today. I see that your arm is bound and in splints. You must understand I do not willingly cause you pain. You force it upon me. Yesterday you gave us to understand no one in Doremi or anywhere else conspires with you. And now perhaps today you uh, remember it differently. I have nothing to add. We have sworn evidence that you are a courier for the French underground. Courier? What is that? Do you deny that you have carried messages from Doremi to Paris, the contents of which are to sabotage the German offensive? Whatever I have done has been at the bidding of the holy voices. Ah, sir. Young woman, this is the 20th century. There are no voices other than human. You have withstood some pain by refusing to tell us who is in this plot with you. However... There are voices... I tell you, there are. Oh, uh, let us try another way. Are you not aware it is against the state to harbor an enemy? I know it is against France to kill her friends. Silence. The American parachute is found hiding on your farm. Now, what was he doing there? I don't know. I saw him only when he was taken to the barn to be shot. Where are the others? What others? The other parachutists. I know of none. Do you think the voices have abandoned you now that you have been captured and may die? No. 
Do you believe they will rescue you? I don't know. Lieutenant Stoyer, you apprehended the prisoner. Do you, perhaps, have a question? Son, the night we took you prisoner and led you outside to witness the execution of the American parachutist, you cried out, speak to me, speak to me. I do not see the light. Now, oh, what did you mean? It does not matter. How many other peasant plotters and adventurers are in this with you? Nobody. Nobody. That is not what I meant. What did you mean then? On the two days before the lieutenant came to my father's farm, I saw a light. And then the voices spoke. This light, you see it only when it is dark? Yes. Mm. Then the voices? Yes. And these voices would instruct you what to do, where to go, what route to take, uh, whom to see, what to deliver. Isn't that so? Now, <clears throat> do you see, Cushon, why one must keep on questioning, perseverance and calm? Now, my conclusion, Cushon, is that these lights do exist. They are signals which are then followed by some form of radio transmissions which the girl hears and obeys. Tomorrow, we shall go over every inch of that farm, and I should be greatly surprised if we do not find a short wave receiver. Uh, Herman, take her away. Do not bother to send me food to myself. I shall not eat it. Are you trying to hasten your death? That will happen at the Lord's pleasure. I do not believe one word. I do not believe your inspiration is from heaven. But I do believe that you are pretending to be witless. You know exactly what you are doing, and you will be made to suffer, my girl, a great deal, until you tell us what we wish to know. I pity you, both. Satan has many victories, but only among the godless. It is he, not Germany, who rules you. Take the girl away. Every time I saw this John, I would remember the John of 550 years ago. Both girls were 19, both the same name, both her voices, saw lights. And in each case, the Inquisitor was from Rouen, and his name was Cochon. The following day, more questions and ridicule. Continue, Jean. You also hear the voice of this Michel, n'est-ce pas? Saint-Michel. You may canonize him if you wish, Saint-Michel. And uh, two females, you said, hmm? Yes. St. Catherine and St. Margaret. Oh, Catherine and Margaret. Good. We are making progress. These women are your accomplices. Isn't that so? Only in the sense that they pass along the words of the Lord. Uh, this Lord may be the code name for the head of the operation. Are these words instructions? Sometimes. Ah, will you tell us what are? these instructions. I have already. You told us they were merely a caution for you to attend church more frequently. What other instructions, uh, more recent ones? I cannot answer that. You will answer that. You and Monsieur Michel and Mademoiselle Catherine and Margaret, you will all answer. Lieutenant Stoyer, yeah? take the prisoner away. And if she continues to refuse information, would you be so good as to attend to her other arm? And if that does not persuade Mademoiselle, one might begin to break her legs. As my parish acquaintance, the curé, told me, it was not surprising that while France was occupied by the Germans, that few would believe a farm girl who saw lights and heard voices. To the German invaders, there was only one reasonable explanation. Jean of Don Remy was a partisan, and as such, had to be dealt with quickly and totally. I shall return shortly with Act Two. truer words spoken, one man's meat is another man's poison. Back in the days of Joan of Arc, the English thought she was a witch. The French regarded her 
a saint. Five centuries later, the Germans believed this genre of Doremi, a spy. Jean, if you are wearying of these many interrogations, uh, I assure you we are not. Today I am asking Lieutenant Hans Steuer to read to you the official document that spells out the terms of your death, Lieutenant. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Führer and the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, I hereby order as follows. Any person who hides or shelters enemy soldiers or prisoners of war who have escaped shall be subject to the death penalty. The chief of the military administration in France. Hiding enemy soldiers. Is that... Do you have anything to say? The American flyer you shot. Is it he I am being accused of hiding? Oui, ma petite. Your American sabotage agent. I know nothing about him. Only that you say he was American. When he was taken and shot, I fell to my knees and prayed to the Virgin Mary to receive his soul. Well, that may be. To come back to the point, we've asked you repeatedly about a trip that you made to Paris. I have received certain information here which I hope will recall an incident at Notre Dame to you. We know that you went to Paris to deliver messages for the FFI. What is that? Oh, now, come along. You know, it's the resistance. And the place where the drop was... Where the messages were to be left was Notre Dame. We know that. And we know you were there. I went to Notre Dame to pray. Is that all? The baby. What about the baby? Prayers were being said for a baby which had died three days after it was born. We know that. And that you persuaded the parents to let you hold the deceased infant. Now, we are not accusing you of its death. But we want to know about the papers you placed in the baby's garments. You are all mad. Would you care to tell us your version, Jean? I happened to be there at the time. The mother and father brought the deceased baby to Notre Dame to be baptized. But it was too late. I asked to join in the prayers to Our Lady. There was no life in the child. I held it and prayed. And suddenly... The little one yawned three times. Color returned to its cheeks. And quickly, the priest baptized it, and then its life was gone. We are wasting our time. I believe none of this. Jean, to whom did you pray to revive this infant from death? To the angels? I always pray to those who, whose voices I hear. Cochon, Cochon, can we dismiss this girl? I'd like to talk to you privately. Oh, yes. Herman, guard. Sir, remove the prisoner. Where are you taking me? Not to be shot, ma petite. Not yet. You may go. Ah, oh, Lieutenant, what uh, did you wish to tell me? Well, I suggest the torture is not the means to extract the information. That girl, torture will produce nothing. She is like a, a wild thing. Now, have you noticed? She herself has been neutralized. Now, what harm can she do in our custody? I want her to lead us to this Michelle and the two women, Catherine and Margaret. Yes, of course, but so do I. What better way is there but to imprison the Jeanne in some secure place from which she can see a small piece of the world outside, but she is as helpless as a caged bird? Ah, we oui, I understand. That is Nazi... Psychology. <laughs> yes, exactly. She punishes herself. Now, is there such a place, not an ordinary prison or jail, uh, a place apart? And from which she could never be rescued. I wonder... You have an idea? Yes, I wonder. Have you seen the old castle of Beauvoir? Is that the uh, 13th century fortress in the field? It has a deep moat. The walls are strong. But best of all, for our purposes... It has a tower, 70 feet high. Hmm. Beau revoir it is. There is a room at the top of the tower. Perfect. Fräulein uh, Jen, it is I, Herman. I have brought you your supper. Now, if the soup is not as hot as it should be, it takes a little time to climb 140 steps to the tower. Good evening, soldier. What is the time? Uh, it's uh, seven o'clock, Fräulein. No, I'm sorry you have to eat in the dark, but my orders are no light, 
No lamps and uh, no candle. Will you take the food away? No, no, please, please, Fräulein. It has been days and you don't eat anything. They are trying me. And they have found a way. Here in this stone box, with the tiniest opening to the sky and the ground, I can put only one eye to that slit in the wall. Only one at a time. You, you'll feel better if you eat. It, it's good bread here and the milk and the meat. Something has happened to me. The Germans have won over me. All is lost. All is lost. Lost. I speak to them. On my knees, I speak. I call out. Saints, angels, friends. But there's no answer. My voices, I don't hear them. For three days, I have been praying to Saint Michel, Saint Catherine, Saint Margaret, and our Blessed Virgin to answer me. Give me strength, just with your voices. Guide me. One whisper, say only one word, that you are here. But there is nothing... Only silence. Fräulein, Fräulein, don't give up. Don't despair. Here, eat something. One spoonful of soup and a little. I can't swallow anything. Please, I talk to you as to my own daughter. Why have they put a good man like you here? Is it a trap? No, I, 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 I think it is wrong to spend so much time fighting a war against a 19-year-old girl. But they pull the strings in Berlin and we jump. Uh, can you keep a secret? Yes. Here, here, I turn on my flashlight and uh, look in that corner, Fräulein. You see, that ladder attached to the wall, it leads up to the roof. Now, if you climb up and push away, there, you see that wooden cover, there is a roof and you can walk around and feel more free. Just climb up? Yes, yes, no one can see you. The parapet is too high. No one will know. To walk about and be under the sky? I can kneel and pray. And up there, perhaps the voices will find me. Yes, and you will see the birds and the life below in the fields. At least for a little time. They are going to kill me, aren't they? I have done nothing. <sighs> They don't believe you. Do you believe me? I don't have to believe you. I have to guard. You know, make sure you don't escape from the tower. But some things I don't see. I don't see you go up that ladder and enjoy a little freedom. Thank you, soldier. My name is Herman. Thank you, Herman. You trust me. How strange. You can't sleep here? Uh, I see you can't either. Yes, that girl, that son. Could it be that there is someone so innocent, so pure? Of course not. We will break her hearts. Uh, there was a complaint today from Berlin. All over France, the aerial engine and machine tool works are... They're not doing well enough. Outside Doremi is the largest machine tool factory in France. I will go see the manager in the morning. Oh, here they come. American or British? What is your guess? Well, they never get close enough to tell. I wonder which way they are heading. They're dropping bombs here. It is the shelter. Hurry. It explain to me, Herman, clearly without emotion, superstition, or guesswork. How did it happen? It was it was a coincidence. How, how else could it be? That is not a good enough explanation. What happened from the time you took the prisoner her tray of food until the air attack was over? I, I, Am I asking too much? No, I, I made a mistake. Uh, no conclusions, facts. Well, I, I made a mistake in judgment. I told the prisoner she, she could go to the top of the tower tonight to walk about, you know, stretch her legs. Was there a reason for this? Yes, she was becoming hysterical, crying. 
locked up in the stone tower with only a, a, a small window two inches across the sea out of. It did not occur to you there was a reason why we placed her in that tower? Yes, sir, because it was a safe place from which she could not escape or be rescued. Did you accompany the prisoner to this roof? No, sir, I, I stayed below, but I, she could not get past me. Oh, you stayed below. For how long? Until I smelled fire coming from the fields. Then I climbed the ladder and I saw her. What was she doing? She was praying. How did you know that? Well, she was on her knees and I could hear her. Then she looked straight up into the sky. And when she did this, I could see suddenly one of the haystacks started to burn. And then another and another. How long did you permit the prisoner to signal her accomplices in this manner? Uh, sir, she wasn't signaling. I can swear to that. Just... Every time she lift her face, another haze that caught fire. And then? I could see the bombers coming. I dragged her back down the ladder to the tower room, just in time, too. I was mistaken about her. I was beginning to believe... Herman, the facts are, the enemy sent over a bomber squadron. They spotted the burning haystacks which led them directly to the machine tool factory outside of Doremi. Well, I didn't know there was such a factory. Not anymore. A burned out shell. We did not know. They knew. But I, I don't see how that girl could have had anything to do with this. You have no more answers for me? But, sir, I told you all I know. All right, then let us see what she has to say. You wish me to go to the tower and fetch her? If you do not mind, Herman, I would not want to trouble you. This may be the last service you perform in that uniform. No, no, I, I am going, sir. I'll bring her here directly. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, now I'll catch it. The girl has disappeared from her room. The trap door to the roof open. Oh, stupid of me not to have nailed the shot. She must be out here somewhere. Oh, this is the end of my army career. It's prison for me. I'll never see Dusseldorf again. Who's that? Ah, Jeanne! Yes? Jeanne, your face is all blood. Oh, Jeanne. I jumped. From up there? The roof? Seventy feet? I have sinned. The voices told me not to jump, but I... I... I had to. Why? Why did you do it? I would rather give my soul to the Lord than remain in the hands of the enemy. telling you exactly what the Doremi Parish priest told me. Those of you familiar with events in the life of Joan of Arc will remember. She too jumped from the Tower of Beaurevoir. She too prayed over a dead infant who came to life and was baptized. But how could such things be? Two such Jones, five centuries apart. I shall return shortly with the rest of the curious story and Act Three. question I put to the old curé of Doremi, and I put it to you also, is, could such a guardian angel return to France after 500 years? I, for one, could not believe it. Even so, the parish priest would not let me go until he had finished the account of the 19-year-old who fought against the military occupation the only way she knew how. Pierre... Why do you find it so impossible to believe this girl, Jeanne, is not imbued with the Holy Spirit? That she is not pretending? I am a realist, Hans. She is either demented or faking. Ah, you seek a rational explanation? She has three accomplices we know of. 
Like all French children, she has learned all about Jeanne d'Arc years ago. How she admitted at the trial praying to Saint Michel and Saints Catherine and Margaret. But today there are no saints. Those are code names. Mm. Uh, did you check the town records, her birth certificates? There is none. I do not know where this Jeanne comes from. But 19 years ago, no Jeanne was born here. All entirely fictitious. Well, perhaps uh, they had a fire. Your records get destroyed. Yes, possibly. But she's trying to make us think there is some connection between her and our great saint. How can you be so positive? It is not possible, Hans, by the furthest stretch of the imagination or the longest arm of coincidence for the girl's mother to have the identical name of Jean of Arc's mother, Isabelle Romé, for her father's name to be Jacques, and the children, Jacques Mer, Jean Pierre, and the voices of the same saints, Michel, Catherine, Margaret. It is all a code for partisans, a network of the resistance, and sooner or later we must find them. You don't believe, then, that the haystack started to burn as she prayed? A girl gives a signal. Haystacks burn. Bombers arrive. Factory totally destroyed. Well, I am not so sure. Well, then you explain it, then. You stopped my hand when I said I'd wring it out of her. No, you said. That is not the way. Pierre, we also have facts. We have gone over that farmhouse and the fields around a dozen times. There is nothing hidden, no transmitters, no receivers, nothing to connect that girl with the French underground. Nothing except the American flyer you found. And we have done nothing to stop it happening again. Except to drive her to attempt suicide. Seventy foot drop. Uh, for the present, a blessing. She is out of the way. The miracle is that girl could fall at that distance and survive. Well, I'm glad you said miracle. At least uh, you admit to such a possibility. Lieutenant Steuer, a telegram for you from Berlin. Thank you, Herman. Uh, you may close the door behind you. Pierre, I've been ordered back to Berlin. Ah, when will you be back here? I don't know. Now, one request I make for you. Let the girl go. Who knows? It may take months before she's healed, and by that Aunt, time... I do not understand you. She has been punished enough. I have the impression, Pierre, you personally feel you must pursue this child 19 years to the very end, or you will not be satisfied. You must like being made a fool of. She poses as an ignorant peasant girl, but you know that she is aiding our enemy. I do not know that. And she has not made a fool of us. Now, before I go and pack, you must know something else. Up to now, we have jointly administered this region. Now, you will be alone. However, I have kept one matter from you. I could not break the girl's arms. I simply could not. I bound them up as if I had done what we threatened to. Why, Hans? I cannot explain it. Something prevented me. I could not hurt her like that. Herman. Uh, yes, who's there? It is I, Cochon. Ah, there, Cochon. I, I didn't expect you this evening. Oh, just making the rounds. How is the prisoner tonight? Uh, very ill. Just feverish. The nuns from the Domremy Hospital came to see her today. They gave her some medicine to lower the fever. By whose order? It was the lieutenant's final order before he left for Berlin. The nuns are taking her to the hospital tomorrow to be x-rayed. I forbid it. She is not to be moved. What, sir, I don't see what difference is it to, to you. To me, no difference. None whatsoever. What happens to her, I could not care less. Only the principle of it. An enemy of France is not cared for like a friend. But she is so young. A simple chair. I do not understand you. Are you a German? What are you? This Jean with no last name, who harbors soldiers who would kill you on sight... You like the idea she is placed in our hospital in the same room with heroes? Well, you must be misinformed, Monsieur Cachon. There are no soldiers in the Domremy Hospital. You dropped something? Uh, well, shine your flashlight over here so I can see what it is. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, some shears I had in my pocket. Oh, I'll get them, sir. Here you are, sir. Believe me, the hospital is not used for soldiers. I am not here to explain the conduct of the war to you. Take me across this moat and up to the top where the girl is quartered. Ah, my flashlight's gone dead. 
I have to go find a land. Well, then go and find it and hurry up. I do not intend to talk to a prisoner I cannot see. Uh, I will say, I will say, one has to be in good physical shape to climb up all these steps. Uh, this is the door, Monsieur Crochet. Well, open it. Yes, sir. But would you hold the lantern for me, please? Uh, the key doesn't always fit the lock. Uh, you may open the door. Yes, sir. And wake her. Jean. Jean, wake up. Someone to see you. Who is it? It is I, Cochon. Uh, I shall keep the lantern, Herman. You may wait outside. Uh, do not close the door. I don't fancy myself locked in. Now, Mademoiselle Jean, have you had time to think over your sins? Hmm? Are you ready to confess? I have spoken the truth about everything I know. Oh, have you? Those voices, Jeanne of no name, shall I tell you what I think? I think you lie. I think there are no voices. And as I look about me in this filthy room, I am very concerned with your health. There must be lice here. <laughs> and they must be on you and in your hair. To protect you from disease, I have wrought some shears to trim your locks so that your head will be clean. Hold still now. Excuse me, sir, but may I ask, sir, what you are doing? You may ask, Herman, but if you have eyes, you can see. I am about to cut off the prisoner's dirty, lice-infected hair. Well, I, I, I'm sure that is necessary. A, a, a I, favor. I... This person is most concerned with godliness. I, on the other hand, begin with cleanliness. Now, don't move, Jean. I would not care to miss. You see, these shears are quite sharp. Permit me, the curé, who knows this story personally, to interject a comment. For reasons I have not been able to explain to myself to this day... That French collaborationist Pierre Cochon appeared to take a sadistic delight in tormenting the 19-year-old John. The following midnight, weak as she was, he had her brought to his house. It was the night of another air raid. Your friends, John, are overhead. Are you ready yet to name those with whom you are in league? No more lies, please. I've told you the truth. About yourself as well. Why do you pattern what you say after Jean d'Arc? Her parents, her beliefs, her saints, the voices who told her what to do. I do not understand the reason. You accuse me of fabricating a family with the same names as our beloved saints. And did I steal your name from the history books, Pierre Cochon? What do you mean? Pierre Cochon, the Bishop of Beauvais. Everybody knows it was in his diocese that Jean d'Arc was captured. Everybody knows he was the chief inquisitor who tortured Jean month after month for eight long months. Pierre Cochon plagued and bullied and reviled. Tell me, Monsieur Pierre Cochon, are you an invention of mine also? I will grant you that one coincidence. It is not an uncommon name. Oh, but I think it is most uncommon. Cochon, repent. Declare yourself a sinner and throw yourself upon the mercy of the Lord. What are you talking about? Now you are afraid of me. I see fear in your eyes. Even by this slowly burning lamp, I see fear. Be quiet. But does it feel like not to be true to yourself? Is that why you are false to everyone? You were a Frenchman once, but now you are a man with no country and no soul. The voice of Saint-Michel has made me know why you made an enemy of me. You and I know what a traitor you are. A Judas. Turn your life around before it is too late. On your knees. Beg for forgiveness. Ah. Let me out. The door. Jean, there are flames everywhere. Save me. Yes, you is Joan of Arc. Burn. 
burned alive at the stake. Jean of Doremi was also consumed by fire. History's bishop, Pierre Cochon, lived on for many years, as did this Pierre Cochon, the collaborator. I happen to know that for certain, since I met him. For he was the old curé who told me the story I've just repeated. I shall return shortly. cannot tell us, nor does it know, whether heavenly voices actually did lead Joan of Arc to defeat the enemies of France. Or was it purely her imagination? On the other hand, what is imagination but man's capacity for inspiration? Couldn't you also say imagination is a kind of divine ecstasy, giving us the ability to come closer to the angels? Our cast included Norman Rose, Amanda Plummer, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I'm sitting over here in this shaft of moonlight, a curious thing, the moon. The songwriters have hailed its praises for centuries. By the light of the silvery moon, shine on harvest moon, moonlight and roses, all love songs. And Claude Debussy's most popular piano piece is Claire de Lune, or Moonlight. Yes, the moon has held a fascination for lovers, poets, and musicians. And in our story about to unfold... Moonlight plays a rather important part, but it has nothing to do with love. Quite the opposite, I believe. Yolanda, what in the name of heaven are you doing? I'm going out on the balcony. In your bathing suit? At night? In mid-October? I must. I have this urge to bathe myself in the moonlight. The harvest moon, see? How bright and big it is. Yolanda... Come back in and get dressed. You just cannot... Uh, but I must. I must take a, a moon bath. Our mystery drama, Garden of the Moon, was written especially for Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Kim Hunter. I shall return shortly with Act One. finding self-expression in business. Not just jobs, but careers. Yolanda Westerville began her career with Roberta Dean Cosmetics as a typist. But her natural flair for the cosmetic industry soon propelled her to the executive suite as vice president in charge of merchandising. The competition is fierce, and up to now, Yolanda was a front runner. But lately, it seems, that tension is catching up with her. I don't care if you have to charter a plane. That display has to be in St. Louis Monday. We went over this four times, Charlie, and now you're telling me... I, I, I will not listen. You're all against me. That's what it is. Well, let me tell you, Charlie, you're not getting this office. Oh, no. I know all about you and your filthy little schemes. Roxy! Roxy, get in here with your pad. Mrs. Westerville, you've got to calm down. Don't tell me what to do. Here, take this. What is it? Take it. Oh, all right. It's only a simple sedative. 
God, what's the matter with me, Roxy? I just made a fool of myself on the phone with Charlie Benson. Mm, I heard. It's been happening more frequently lately. Oh, why don't you take a few weeks off, huh? No, not with the campaign on Sunset Reverie ready to break. Well, then take vitamins. Roxy, sometimes Mrs. Westerville, you... you know you're under a lot of stress. Diet, exercise, vitamins build you up. You know, you cope better. <laughs> Is that how you put up with me? I enjoy working for you, Mrs. Westerville. But I'll be honest. Lately, you've become a bit of a shrew. Oh, I know. I've been spouting off at home, too. Bill's unhappy. Oh, I think you're just run down. That's why I'm serious about the diet and the exercise. Uh, Roxy, you're a friend. But I don't think wheat germ and yogurt are going to make much difference. Look, a new health food store opened on Lexington Avenue at 45th Street last week. It's called the Garden of the Moon. <laughs> I haven't been there yet, but why don't you try it? It's a restaurant as well as a store. So why not go there for lunch or at least look around? Well, why not? <laughs> Sick of those martini and steak lunches. Garden of the Moon. Good morning, madame. May I help you? I'll just look around, thanks. If I may, Dr. Lunestra at your service. Our merchandise is not the usual type of food you find in most stores, such as this. Oh? Well, I'm a novice, really. I'm, I'm not into the health food thing, so everything's new to me. Ah, then you must let me guide you. We're quite new, you know, and we haven't caught on yet. I have no other customers, so <laughs> let me explain. All right, go ahead. The name of my shop, I did not choose from mere whim. It is basic to my uh, merchandise, such as uh, this jar of body lotion. Mm. Essence of lunar light. Precisely. And uh, this display of produce, carrots, beets, cabbage, potatoes, they are not ordinary vegetables, although they appear no different than any other. Oh, I I've read of organic gardening. Uh, madam, these are not organically grown foods. They are superior to those. Oh? These are grown in moonlight. And only moonlight. Moonlight? You're serious? Oh, yes, of course. You see, it is a theory of mine that moonlight has enormous benefits. Uh, it usually gives me the creeps. It's so cold and icy. Ah, oh, no, madame. It is magnificent. What we call moonlight is, of course, the reflected light of the sun. And when the sun strikes the surface of the moon, it picks up powerful forces. Magnetic and atomic. Moonlight is imbued with incredible properties. Well, I, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. So, all of this produce is exposed only to moonlight. Therefore, it has nutritional benefits beyond imagining. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm not sure I... Uh... <laughs> I see. Madame doubts. I know, I know. Others will doubt, too, but... When they see the results of eating moon-grown food, they will eat nothing else. Where is the moon food grown? On a farm in uh, New Hampshire. New Hampshire? High on a mountain top to get the best exposure to the moon. <laughs> well, thank you. Look, I, I really must go. Ah, uh, please. Take this free sample of lotion and you will be back, madame. You will see. He's crazy. Growing food in moonlight on top of a mountain in New Hampshire? That's a new one, all right. Who's going to fall for that? <laughs> it's just a bunch of vegetables from some Jersey farm. I got out of there as fast as I could. I'll get it. Mrs. Westerville's office? Hi, Roxy. Is she there? Yes, sir. It's Mr. Westerville. Oh, uh, Hello, Bill. Hi, darling. How goes the day? Don't ask. Look, can we get out of bridge tonight? I've got a crash brief to get ready for court tomorrow. I'll call the Maxwells now. I couldn't face it tonight myself. Oh, great. Uh, meet me at Alfredo's for dinner, and then we'll go straight home, huh? Okay, I'll see you there. I think I'll take a look at this Garden of the Moon. 
It sounds so weird. Uh, don't waste your time. Whoever it is that runs the place is a charlatan. But I think I'll take your advice about diet, Roxy. I'm meeting Bill for dinner tonight, and I think I'll stick to cottage cheese and tomatoes. <laughs> What's with the cottage cheese and tomatoes? Roxy thinks I need a diet. <laughs> she says it'll help my nerves. Yeah, well, they could stand some help. I know, Bill. I've been a bear lately. It's been the strain of the Sunset Reverie introduction. Mm, yeah. Still, a diet wouldn't do you any harm. I'll get Roxy to work out a schedule for me. She's a health nut, you know. Oh, and speaking of that, I went into the strangest shop today. Oh, yeah? A new health food store called Garden of the Moon. You in, in a health food store? Well, Roxy suggested it. Bill, I think there are grounds for prosecution or something there. Oh, why? Well, the man who runs it, Dr. Lunestra, claims all his produce is grown in moonlight. <laughs> it's supposed to have magical powers. <laughs> well, that's a new angle. Dr. Lunestra, eh? he's appropriately named. Aren't there grounds for some legal action? I mean, it's misrepresentation or something. No, no, not unless someone files a complaint. Well, who knows? Maybe he does grow it in moonlight, and there are plenty of suckers who'll believe it. Well, it doesn't seem right, though. Well, he's probably not hurting anyone. If someone does react badly from the stuff and lodges a complaint, well, then that's a different story. Well, I guess you're right. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Westerville. Any calls? Uh, Mrs. Dean called twice. She wants to see you as soon as you come in. Oh, Lord. Uh, Carpenter and Rose called from St. Louis. The displays still haven't arrived. Oh, this sure is going to be my day. Tell Mrs. Dean I'm on my way. And pour me a coffee while I put on my face. Right away. Oh. Well, I'd forgotten this. What? The sample of lotion that character gave me yesterday. Essence of Luna Light. Huh. Why don't you try it? It can't hurt. Hmm. It has an unusual fragrance. Yeah, it seems to glow. <laughs> well, a little under the eyes and some on the neck. Snap it up with that coffee, Roxy. Roberta Dean awaits. Heck already? She's fuming about the St. Louis opening. I'm going to have to fly out there. Look, uh, get me an early afternoon flight. And call my husband and tell him to meet me for lunch at Alfredo's. I'll hold all calls except for Her Highness. I'll be back Thursday if I'm lucky. Westerville here. Hello, Bill. It's me. Hi, darling. How's it going out there? Smashing. I finally traced the displays to St. Joseph, but we got them here in time. The opening was a huge success. Great. When are you coming home? I'll be in Sunday night. Good. I'll meet you. No, no, don't. Roberta and I are going to the office first. I'll see you at home. Okay, I'll be there. Hey, you sound as though things are great. They are. Wait till you hear the compliments I got. See you Sunday. Things must have gone well. I haven't seen you this... Radiant in years. One of the best line introductions we've had. Well, maybe it's the firelighter. <laughs> Not having seen you for five days, but you do look different, Yolanda. Yeah, I I've noticed it, too. Hey, your skin seems so much smoother. I, I mean, well, particularly under your eyes. It's, it's like a younger woman's. What is it, a, a new Roberta Dean transformation? No. In fact, I'm not wearing any makeup. Oh. I've been using a bottle of lotion I got in that strange little store I told you about. It has a marvelous tightening agent. I'm going to try to make an exclusive deal with him for Roberta Dean. You're going to market the stuff? I mean, a week ago you were practically calling him a charlatan. Well, I still don't believe the moon nonsense. But chemically and cosmetically, his lotion works. I'm going to have our labs run an analysis on it. If we can't duplicate it, we'll talk business with him. What does the great Roberta think about it? I haven't told her yet. There's a new moon tonight. It looks so picturesque over the Empire State Building. Where are you going? Just out in the balcony. It is beautiful up there. 
I... I... What is it, darling? Something the matter? Uh, just a tingling in my face. Like a little nerves jumping. Yeah, no wonder after a week in St. Louis. You better take a hot bath and go to bed. Good idea. Tomorrow I'm going to pay another visit to this Garden of the Moon. Ah, good morning, madame. I thought you'd be back. Oh, business certainly has picked up. Oh, yes. In only one short week, I am becoming known. I can hardly provide enough produce to meet the demand. Well, I... I think I'll try some of your vegetables. Certainly. Did madame use the lotion I gave her? Uh, uh, no, no, not yet. Uh, uh, but I've been thinking about your moon-grown food and... Well, all these other people seem to enjoy them. Here, let me give you a small assortment to try. And uh, be sure to steam them. Don't boil. Takes away all the flavor. Yes, yes, of course. Two carrots, one parsnip, a potato, and four onions. I think you'll find them quite different from the vegetables you've been accustomed to. And uh, remember, we serve lunch and dinner, too. Perhaps you'd like to have luncheon with us sometime? Ah, uh, Perhaps. Uh, uh, speaking of the lotion, what's in it? Moonlight, madame? <laughs> I mean the ingredients. Oh, nothing but a little oil of roses, water and gelatin. And moonlight. But water and gelatin can't... I, I mean... Well, uh, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, I'll really have to try it. Here are the vegetables, madame. I guarantee you'll notice a decided difference in how you feel after eating the produce from the Garden of the Moon. Uh, how much do I owe you? For two dollars. That's fair enough, I guess. And be sure to steam them. Here you are. Thank you, madame. Enjoy them in good health. Just browse around, everybody. I'll be back in a moment. If you want help in selecting, I'll be happy to oblige. Back in a moment. Lunestra here. How are things going? We haven't heard from you for more than a week. Splendidly. The merchandise is moving beautifully. People are coming back for more. In fact, I'm running low on supplies. We can take care of that. When will the next... A uh, harvest take place. On October 30th. Good. Word is spreading. I'm getting new customers every day. Excellent. We'll keep in touch and see that you get more supplies. By all means. I don't want to have to turn anyone away just when we're beginning to get a name. Mm -hmm. once wrote a song about moonlight in Vermont. Perhaps that's where the farm should be located instead of New Hampshire. Even so, it seems a long way to ship produce for a New York store. I wonder, though, do you really believe carrots and potatoes will grow in the moonlight or that moonlight has special powers? We'll see what happens after Yolanda eats the moon-grown vegetables when I return shortly with Act Two. different things to different people. Some find it soft and romantic. Others think it cold and eerie, like Yolanda Westerville. But I doubt that moonlight can add nutrition to vegetables. They need sun to flourish. It is curious, though, that the lotion Yolanda used did seem to make a difference in her appearance. Both she and her husband noticed it. And what did Mr. Lunestra say was in it? Oil of roses, water gelatin... And moonlight? You're actually going to eat those carrots? Well, look at them. They're absolutely no different than any other carrots I've seen. And they taste superb. And they were grown in moonlight. Well, I still don't believe that nonsense. They're probably organically grown and cost twice as much as the supermarket variety. It's the lotion I'm interested in. Yeah, well, you do look different. I'll admit that. Softer. <laughs> I sent the rest of the bottle to the labs today. 
positive we can duplicate the formula. You feel like a movie tonight? For once, I don't have homework to do. Let's. But I haven't been to a good... What's the matter? Just... I don't know. A, a, a sudden kind of warm rush through my whole body. Oh, it sounds like the start of a cold. Maybe we'd better just stay home. Uh, I guess so. Better just get to bed early. Yeah, your resistance ran down during that St. Louis campaign. Why don't you get into bed? I'll, I'll fix us both a hot lemonade with a with a spike in it. Huh? Uh, uh, there it is again. Oh, dear, I'd better start nursing myself. I can't afford a bout with the flu this week. When the sun strikes the surface of the moon, it picks up powerful forces, magnetic and atomic. Moonlight, madame, is imbued with incredible properties. Moonlight. 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 Uh, what? what? Uh, Yolanda, uh, what are you doing over there? Just standing here in the moonlight. See how it comes through the window, so soft and clear. Makes a white patch on the carpet. I I'm just standing here in the moonlight. Yolanda, c Come back to bed. You, you've probably got a fever. It's making you... No, I don't think so. My skin is cool. Cool in the cool moonlight. So cool. Yolanda, stop it, please. Look, come on. I'll, I'll, I'll help you back to bed. Oh, all right. I'll say good night to the moonlight. Good night, moonlight. Morning, darling. Oh, thanks for making the coffee. Well, I didn't expect to see you up so early this morning. Oh, I feel marvelous. Good night's rest made the difference. I chased that flu bug right away. <laughs> Good night's rest, indeed. You were out of bed, standing in the moonlight. You, you, you were talking to it. I was. Uh, I was what? You were standing by the window, talking in your sleep. But that's. <laughs> I don't remember it at all. Oh, I'm sorry I disturbed your rest. No, there's nothing to apologize for. I'm just glad you're feeling okay. You got a busy day, Hank? Not really, but an interesting one, perhaps. I should get the lab analysis back on that lotion. Good morning, Roxy. Good morning. Any calls? Not one, believe it or not. Say, you're looking good this morning. Better than I've seen you in ages. Had a good night's sleep. No, no, it's more than that. I don't know, there, there, there's something different about you. Oh, this arrived by messenger this morning. Confidential from the lab. Oh, great. I was hoping that would come in today. Mm. I had the lab run an analysis on that lotion I got at the Garden of the Moon. I hope we can duplicate it. Oh, you think it's good? Oh, look what it's done for me. Ah, oh, that is why you look different. Younger. I used half the bottle. It definitely works. Well, I'll be. What's the matter? The analysis of the lotion. Oil of roses, water, and gelatin, just as he said. Well, that's easy to duplicate. But those ingredients haven't any cosmetic value. There must be something the lab missed. Oh, no, they're pretty thorough. I'm going to call them. I can't believe that combination of elements could be so effective. I'll see if they can duplicate. Laboratory, Harrison. Uh, Eric, it's uh, Yolanda Westerville. Hi, good morning, Yolanda. Did you get the analysis? Uh, yes. I'm I'm wondering if you missed something. Missed something? What, what do you mean? Rose oil, water, and gelatin. Are you sure that's all? Yeah, yeah. Where did you get this fluid, anyway? Oh, I'll tell you that later. Look, I'd appreciate another test. If it turns up the same, we'll forget it. Sure. You'll be hearing from us. Thanks. Bye, Eric. Well? They're rechecking. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to that place on my lunch hour and get myself a bottle. Look, I'll come along. I'll treat you to lunch at the Garden of the Moon. <laughs> It's jammed. It's 
certainly catching on. We'll have to wait for a table. That's the proprietor over there. Oh. Odd-looking guy, isn't he? Oh, he's coming over. Welcome, ladies. You're here for lunch. Uh, yes. I have two in the back. Follow me. Oh, look at those fresh strawberries on that one's plate. They're as big as golf ball. Incredible. Uh, Thank you. And how did Madame enjoy the vegetables? Excellent, really. I, I, I only tried the carrots. Oh, the new ladies are in for another treat. The luncheon menu. Oh, let's see. Mm. I think I'll have the tomato surprise. An excellent choice, madame. Mm. Uh, so will I. Two tomato surprises. My assistants will take your beverage order. Mm. This place is really packed. You know, I've been thinking. You admit the lotion did wonders for you. Maybe the food does have some kind of special something. Well, it's possible. I, I still think the moonlight thing is just a promotion gimmick. Two tomato surprises for the ladies. Oh, will you look at that. What are they stuffed with? <laughs> the chef's secret, madame. But you uh, might happen to find a rose petal or two. <laughs> Exotic. Bon appetit, ladies. Simply marvelous. Oh, I agree, one hundred percent. Oh, it was so light and tasty, and yet so satisfying. Yeah, I'm going to take some more vegetables home. Bill won't touch them, but Roxy, Roxy, what's the matter? Uh, oh, nothing really. Just a, a sudden warm feeling. Not you too. Oh, it's the flu bug going around. I had the same thing last night. No, I, I, I'm okay, really. Look, you take the rest of the day off. Go home and get into bed. Oh, now that I won't turn down. I do feel a little dizzy. Let's pay the check and go. Oh, I, I want to get a bottle of that lotion. Oh, do that. A and give me a few drops for the lab. I'd like another test from a different bottle. Uh, did you enjoy the luncheon? Ah, excellent, yes. I'd like a bottle of Essence of Lunar Light. Yes, of course. Shall I add it to the check? No, no, I'll just... Oh, yes, it. yes, put it on the check. It all goes on the expense account, Roxy. <laughs> Thanks. I guess I'd better get on home, Mrs. Westerville. I, I, I feel kind of funny. <laughs> I'm afraid Roxy's going to be out for a couple of days. Oh? We were having lunch at the Garden of the Moon. She came down with the same thing I had last night. You had lunch at that place? Yes, it's a small restaurant, as well as a store. Y Yolanda, is, so is something the matter? I've got to do something. Well, what, for heaven's sake? Y Yolanda, I... well, are you all right? Yes. Well, yes. what's so important that you'd jump up from dinner like this? Yolanda, are you feeling sick again? Yolanda, what the dickens are you doing? I'm going out on the balcony. In your bathing suit? At night? In, in the middle of October? I must. I have this need to bathe myself in the moonlight. The harvest moon. Oh, see how big and bright it is. Yolanda... Would you come back inside and get dressed? I mean, you just can't... I must. I must take a moon bath. A moon bath? Bathe in the light of the moon. Yolanda, you're not being rational. Is it so wrong to enjoy the moon? Something's happening to you. I mean, last night, now this... Uh... I'm beginning to appreciate the moon. I insist that... No! Don't touch me. I feel wonderful. So cool. Oh, so cool. I can feel the moonlight seeping into my skin. Through my body. It's incredible. Dr. Lunestra is right. Moonlight is magical. The force is flowing. Flowing through my veins. Vitalizing. Purifying. Cleansing me every second. Yolanda, come inside. Yes, 
Yes, it's too chilly out there. But the moonlight felt so good. Do you know what... what you just did? I took a moon bath. I didn't expect to see you in today, Roxy. Oh, I feel great. Whatever it was didn't take hold. But I don't know if I should mention it. It's just too silly. What? Well, during the night, I woke up and I just had to get up and stand in the moonlight. You, you too? I went on the balcony for a moon bath. Oh. Bill thought I was crazy. But I had the most fantastic sensations. Like a, a force through your body. Exactly. Well, I went back to bed. And this morning, I felt better than I have in years. And me a health food nut to begin with. Look, let's have lunch there again. There's something about that food and moonlight that's out of this world. Ah, welcome, ladies. Apparently, the Garden of the Moon agrees with you. I have to admit that it does. Then you and your friend will be interested in this invitation. I'm passing them out to my regular customers. Garden of the Moon Weekend Retreat. Yes. To the farm and resort in New Hampshire, where all our produce is grown. We've scheduled it for the October 30th weekend. There'll be a seminar on the power of the moon, and we'll have lots of time for meditation and study. What does it cost? Oh, no cost at all. We'll go by chartered bus, and uh, naturally, everything on the farm is already provided for. Oh, it sounds fascinating. We'll have to think about it. Do not hesitate too long, madame. I've had many reservations already this morning. And I promise you, it's a weekend you will not want to miss. It sounds inviting, doesn't it? A weekend in New Hampshire would be a welcome relief from the New York City pace, no matter what the circumstances. But this trip sounds especially exciting, since Yolanda will visit the source of this unusual food. I hope she and Roxy decide to go, don't you? I'd hate to miss out on a trip like that. If they can get away, we'll go with them when I return shortly with Act Three. weekend in New England sounds like a great idea. And it seems that Yolanda Westerville has her heart set on it. Of course, it's a perfect opportunity for us all to learn more about how this food is grown, to visit the farm and see firsthand where these unusual vegetables come from. But Yolanda's husband, Bill, has some very understandable misgivings. Are you out of your mind, Yolanda? Go off to a mountaintop in New Hampshire with a, with a bunch of moon nuts? It's only a weekend, and it sounds intriguing. And frankly, your hang-up with moonlight all of a sudden has me worried. I don't see anything to worry about. I'm enjoying it. I forbid you to go to this witch's Sabbath or whatever it is in New Hampshire or any place else where I wouldn't know exactly uh, where you were. Oh, Bill. I mean, There'll be 50 or 60 of us. Don't be naive, Yolanda. You have no idea what or who is on that mountaintop. It'll be fun finding out. I want more details on exactly what and where this place is. Well, I suppose I could find that out. Yeah, I should think you'd want to. I certainly do. All right. I'll get all the details I can. And if we don't come back, you can come looking for us. It's not a joking matter to me. A simple weekend in New England in the fall. There's nothing sinister in that. Ah, yes, madame. I can appreciate your husband's concern. Others have asked for the location... But we really prefer not to divulge it. You see, we would be overrun with curiosity seekers. Um, yes, I guess you would. The trip is open only to Garden of Moon customers, people who believe, as I do, in moonlight. If, however, Madame thinks she cannot make the trip... Oh, no, 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 I really want to go. We will leave from here on Friday, October 30th at 6 p.m. sharp. Well, we'll just have to go along with it. Then I can put you down for a definite reservation. Yes, and for my secretary, too. Splendid. Well, we'll be there. 
Now, I've got to get back to the office. Good day, madame. Brunestra here. We're ready for October 30th. Are you? Almost, yes. I have four more open reservations, but I know I'll have them filled. Good. The harvest is splendid this month. We're looking forward to your arrival. We're all set, Roxy. I made her reservations with, with Dr. Lunestra. Is Mr. Westerville still so set against you? Yes, but I'm going anyway. Mrs. Westerville's office? Yeah, is she there, Roxy? It's Eric Harrison. Oh, she's here. The lab. Hi, Eric. What's the story? Yeah, that second sample tests out just like the first. There's no difference. I see. Well, well I thought I was on to something. Yeah, I'm so sorry. We couldn't come up with what you were expecting, but uh, that's the way it goes. It's okay. Thanks, Eric. Bye. I'm going to have to make a business deal with Dr. Lenestra. His secret ingredient defies analysis. You can talk with him on the weekend retreat. Exactly what I intend to do. Still set on going to New Hampshire, eh? We leave day after tomorrow. Great. I'll come down and see you off. You'll... Well, you've had a change of heart. I don't think there's anything to worry about. I was concerned about that stuff you were eating. I, I thought that that's what was giving you hallucinations. Hallucinations? Yeah, but the carrots from the <laughs> Garden of the Moon are just plain old garden variety carrots. How do you know? No, well, I had one analyzed. You what? Yeah, I took one of those carrots to an old college chum. He's uh, with the Department of Agriculture. And... and what did he tell you? Well, no higher nutrients. Nothing special about it except... One thing, he said it had been grown in very poor soil. So I asked him if it could possibly have been grown on a on a mountaintop in New Hampshire. And? and? Well, he gave me a strange look and said, yes, it could have. Well, I told him the story and <laughs> he just laughed. I, I don't think you're in any danger. Just surprised that you would fall for this guy's lie. But if you enjoy it, go ahead. But, Bill, you've seen the change in me. And I've felt it. Okay. I just wanted to let you know I won't stand in your way. Have a good time. Go off to New Hampshire and enjoy your garden of the moon. This is the first time I've been out of town for a weekend in years. Too bad it wasn't earlier in the month. The foliage up here would have been glorious. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen... May I have your attention? We are turning into the driveway now. We have arrived at our humble resort. Fortunately, we have a bright moon tonight. Your first glimpse of our garden of the moon will be just as it should be, in full moonlight. All your luggage will be taken care of, and uh, after you've settled, we'll gather for an evening snack. Off the bus, everybody, please. Oh, oh, it's freezing. But uh, where are the buildings? All I see is a mountain. Entirely underground. My assistants will soon be opening the gardens to the moonlight. They are up on the summit. We'll visit them later. This is fascinating. Oh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you kindly follow me. Uh, don't be alarmed. Once inside the mountain, you'll find our accommodations quite comfortable. Everything underground. How unusual. Yes, it is necessary for privacy and convenience. During our retreat, we will never see the light of day, you might say. Welcome, everyone, to the Garden of the Moon. How beautiful. It's so modern. This is the lobby, of course. Sleeping quarters are on two upper floors. Dining and recreation are below. We will visit them all. Well, everything's so gleaming. Cleanliness is another secret of our success. 
Ladies and gentlemen, my assistants will show you to your individual quarters. After you've refreshed, we will assemble here. Mm-hmm. Well, you said the place was modest. <laughs> I'd call it elegant. Small, but elegant. We think of it as compact. Come, let me show you to your quarters. If you'll just step inside the elevator. A moving broom closet, I'd call it. <laughs> but compact, eh? You see, our layout here is all up and down. In fact, from top to bottom, our establishment is 700 feet. Really? But for practical purposes, uh, somewhat narrow. The hallway is circular, you see, with the rooms surrounding it. Here we are. These are your quarters. Again, compact. Make yourself comfortable and join us in the lobby in one hour. Just uh, take the elevator. Okay. Uh, See you later. Look, our suitcases are here already. Uh, Oh, what's the matter, Roxy? Uh, I'm nervous. Why? This place is so closed in. You're not claustrophobic, are you? No, no, not that. But it's so strange. I feel like I'm in a submarine. Oh, that's part of the novelty, I suppose. Why don't you take a hot shower? There doesn't seem to be a tub, but the shower will relax you. Then we'll join the others. Yeah, maybe I will. Cheer up. We're here to enjoy ourselves. I do feel better. Just the excitement of the trip, I guess. Ah, just in time, ladies. We're just about to start the evening. Uh, You mentioned a snack. We're famished. Yes, of course, in a little while. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. As you can see, the wall panels are sliding up to reveal a circle of seats. Would you all kindly be seated? We are going to start our weekend with a short explanation of why we are here and what to expect. Now, you may think it strange that each of the seats has a belt. Kindly fasten yours across your lap. It's just part of the experience... We are now lowering a screen on which we will vividly demonstrate tonight's experience. Let me know when all belts are in place. This is weird. I don't get the belt bit. For some weeks now, you have all enjoyed the produce from our humble lunar garden. And this weekend, we'll top off that experience. All belts in place? Good. What's happening? Oh, the whole place is shaking. Is, is it an earthquake? And now for the explanation you all so well deserve. If you will look at the screen, you will see the planet Earth from half a mile up. Oh, my God. You see, my friends, we are in a spacecraft on our way to the planet Lunaris. I am a Lunarian. The planet Lunaris lies undiscovered on the far side of the moon. Oh, I can readily understand the disbelief on your faces. Is this some kind of joke? Some theatrical trick? I'm afraid not, my friends. You are all destined for the planet Lunaris with me. You see, in dining on our moon-grown foods, you have been purifying yourselves... Tenderizing might be a better word. For this is harvest time in the Garden of the Moon. Lunestra here calling Lunaris. Come in, Lunestra. We are on our way. A fine harvest aboard. Landing preparations are completed and waiting. I suppose I'll be going out again shortly. I am afraid so. The director wants to lay in something oriental. You'll bury the ship in Mount Fuji and open the shop in downtown Tokyo. I can say is 
that the Lunarians seem to have the gourmet flair. I wonder where their appetites will lead them after that. A bit of French fare, perhaps, or Polynesian? At any rate, Yolanda and Roxy are certainly going to be late for work come Monday. It's all very well to follow a new fad, but it's mighty dangerous to follow people you don't know to moonlight retreats in New England. I'll have some more thoughts on the moon when I return shortly. sitting in this shaft of moonlight. If you don't mind, I think I'll move over next to you. I felt a sudden chill. The next time I look at the moon, I'm going to wonder about that undiscovered planet that lies behind it and whose people cultivate gardens here on Earth. I wonder if the Lunarians could have something to do with all those unexplained disappearances we hear about every year. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Paul Hecht, E.V. Jester, and Ralph Bell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. As Mr. Hawthorne said, what other dungeon is so dark as one's own heart? What jailer is so inexorable as one's own self? Yes. How many of us will admit to being prisoners of our own fear or vanity? And how many of us realize that the key to our freedom lies in our own soul? You the doctor... Yes, but I don't have office hours this evening. We're coming in. Now, see here. Uh, say, this man is bleeding. All right. He's been shot. Well, you need a surgeon. But we're here, Doc. I I don't perform operations. The sign says you're a doctor. I, I'm not that kind of a doctor. If, if I tried to operate, especially under these conditions, I'd probably kill him. You don't want to do that, Doc. Because then... We'd have to kill you. Our mystery drama, Is the Doctor In?, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Darkness comes quickly in mid-November. Suddenly the world is drab and dull. Dimly remembered is the warmth of summer. Quickly forgotten, the colors of autumn. Still ahead is the excitement and adventure of the holiday season. But now there is only the chill wind and the cold rain to warn of the dread coming of winter. The street is almost deserted. Three men emerge from a restaurant... But to be accurate, one comes out first. He looks quickly up and down the block. And then he nods his head. He goes to an automobile parked nearby, opens the door, gets in, and starts the engine. Two other men, one elderly, one young, now move quickly out of the restaurant. They head for the car. But as they do, another auto comes hurtling around the corner. There is a fusillade of gunfire. Hey, hey, Pop, you okay? Oh. Eddie, Eddie, give me a hand. Pop's been hit. Pop, can you say something? Hey, give me a hand, Eddie. We gotta get him to the car. Oh. Ollie, come on. Come on, Eddie. Get in behind the wheel, quick. Let's get him to a hospital fast. No. No. What'd you say, Pop? 
No hospital. But, Pop, you're hit. Bad. No hospital. If you don't get to a doctor, you're going to die. I, doctor. But no hospital. Understand? Sure. Sure, Pop, you're right. I understand. But we've got to find you a doctor. And, hey, get moving. we got to find Pop a doctor. Just a moment. Just a moment. Yes? Is the doctor in? Uh, Do you have an appointment? No, I don't have no appointment. I thought not, because I know we're all through for the day. I gotta see the doctor. Oh, very well. We'll make an appointment. Listen. I'll have to check the book, but I do know we don't have an opening till late next week. Sister, we're gonna see the doctor right now. Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. It is? (gasps) Oh, what's that? You know what it is. It's a gun. Who rang the bell, Sue Ann? Huh? Oh. Is there anybody else in the joint? Look, sir, uh, if this is a holdup, we have no cash. I said, is there anybody else around? Uh, no, nobody. All right, stand still, buddy. You don't move. Well, what are you going to do? Okay, Eddie. Bring him in. Uh, hey, listen, if this is for drugs, uh... Shut up. I, look, I don't keep any drugs. You see, I write prescriptions for that sort of thing. I don't have anything that would interest you in this office. Oh, who, who, who is that man? You, the nurse. Give my hand. Hey, that man is hurt. That's right, Doc. He's hurt bad. Now, you got an operating table inside someplace, huh? Operating table? You got something you can lay him down on while you work on him? He's bleeding. That's right. And you gotta stop it. Oh, but I uh... You, the nurse. Let's get him inside. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Let's lay him down on top of that table. Look, this man needs a hospital. Shut uh, up. The doctor is right. You shut up, too. Okay, get to it, Doc. Uh, so, Ann, uh, we need some sterile pads yes. uh, to stop the bleeding. What happened? What do you think happened? He got shot. A bullet wound? I think only one bullet hit him. Whoever it was, it was a lousy shot. Although I figure I know who it was. A bullet wound? You know, you've come to the wrong place. He needs a hospital. I'll call an ambulance. He can't go to no hospital. He can't? No. Cops are after him. Well, that's the only way to save his life. Oh, no, it ain't. You'll have to do it. I don't know how. What are you talking about? You're a doctor, aren't you? Look, let me explain something to you. I am a dermatologist. Yeah? Yeah. My specialty is disorders of the skin. All right, quit stalling, Doc. Hey, you the nurse. Shouldn't it be boiling water or something? The doc here's got to operate. I don't have any equipment. Oh, yes, you do. In that big glass case there. What are them? I've seen enough movies. Can't you understand what I'm saying to you? I am not a surgeon. Yeah? What do you think? I'm some bum that can't read? What's it say on the wall there, huh? Harold W. Smiley, M.D. is hereby licensed to practice medicine and surgery in the state of New York. (laughs) But that doesn't mean anything, don't you understand? Look, when I was an intern, we rotated on all the services. See, I spent 60 days on each. All I have is two months of surgical experience. And I didn't do very much. Mostly, I watched. And that was ten years ago. Come on, Doc. We gotta get going. Listen, listen. Just down the street is a friend of mine, Jack Marcus. He's an abdominal surgeon. He's the fellow you need. Doc, you have to do it. But I can't do it myself. You got a nurse here? You need an anesthetist. Ah, quit whining, will you? Anesthesia. I don't have any anesthesia. He's out cold. If he comes to, we'll give him a slug of whiskey. Whiskey? But you'll have to use a local, doctor. There you are. No problem. No problem? Are you mad? Supposing he needs blood. Plasma. Doc, in this world, we all got to do the best we can. Yeah, but we are completely unqualified and unequipped to handle... What did doctors do in the old days? I'll tell you what they did. They killed their patients. You better not kill him, Doc. 
Your life ain't worth two cents if he goes. Oh, can't you understand? I don't have enough help. What's the beef? You got this good-looking nurse here? You got Eddie to give you a hand? That big gorilla. Okay, I'll admit he ain't much to look at. And he don't have much of a brain, and he can't talk, but he's a human being. And he's entitled to consideration. Now, let's go. I... I... You'll have to do it, Doctor. Do you know what you're saying? These two men, they'll shoot us if we don't. Well, this is a dame that catches on. Doctor, what do you want me to put in the sterilizer? I... Uh, all those instruments down there on the bottom shelf, I guess I... Right. Uh, I don't know if we have enough clamps. I, I, I don't know if we have enough of anything. Let's not worry about it now, Doctor. How, how do I know where that bullet is? You know, if I could get an x-ray and, uh... Well, look here, uh, whatever your name is. Jerry. Jerry. Look, I don't have any x-ray equipment. So what did doctors do before they had x-rays? Did everybody die? <laughs> Almost everybody. Well, all I'm telling you is he'd better not. I'll cut away his clothes. Uh, wash and sterilize a field. Uh, I'm trying to remember how it lays in there. <laughs> It's uh, midway above the right lower quadrant. You ready to scrub, Doctor? We've got gloves. Yeah, all right, all right. Uh, lay out the antiseptic, uh, the antibiotic powders, and... Uh, oh, oh, these aren't the best sutures. Are you complaining again? You, whatever your name is. I told you, his name's Eddie. Open that book. You see table of contents? Yeah, 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 good. Look, on top of the first page uh, somewhere, you read the heading? Uh, abdominal cavity, you got that? He's got it, he's got it. What page does it say? It should be a big color illustration, you see it? He sees it. All right, now hold it up so I can see it. Now, now, don't, tu don't touch me, don't touch me. Stand back, just, just a little bit. Let me just study this now. Pick it up. I can't pick it up. I'm not, I, I can't touch anything that isn't sterile. We'll leave her pick it up. She can't touch anything either. Listen, wise guy. If there's no answer, somebody's going to get worried, maybe, and call the cops. Is that what you figure? Well, it ain't going to work. I'm going to pick it up, and you're going to talk. I'll say one phony word, and you and this nurse, you're all true. Just don't touch my hands. Harold? Harold? Hello? Don't just stand there and look stupid. Say Hello? something. Yes? Yes? Hello? Harold, what is the meaning of this? Oh, Wilma. Why aren't you home? Oh. Uh... You deliberate. You just want to embarrass me. Listen, Kevin Wilma. Wilson is my oldest and dearest friend. But I'm tied up here. You know we're expecting... It uh, can't be helped, Wilma. This uh, situation came up all of a sudden. For what you say, Doc? I dare say. And Miss Sue Ann Carter is there, too, I suppose. She, she has to be here, Wilma. She's, she's my nurse. And what else is she? Now, look here, Wilma. I am sick and tired of your insinuations. All right. I won't insinuate. I'll make it a fact. You're having an affair with her. That... Is not true. Hey, don't fight with your wife on your own time, huh? When are you coming home? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I I just can't say anything right now. Well, I can. If you don't come home in time to take me to Jeanette Wilson's dinner party, I don't care if you never come home. Wilma. Wilma. Oh. She hung up on you, Doc. Well, now we don't have to worry about her anymore. Doctor, I, I, I'm sorry. Why? Well, I don't know. I I somehow feel it's all my fault. Why? I feel guilty. But you haven't done anything. We haven't done anything. Hey, what's with you two? Are we going to get this thing going here or not? Uh, the instruments are ready, Doctor. Oh, yes, 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 I see that. Uh, all right, now, uh, hold that book just a little bit closer to me. Yeah, that's it, then. All right, I'm going to have to keep looking at it while I'm, uh... I've made the field as sterile as I could, Doctor. Yes, 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 that's that's uh, really very good, very good. Uh, anesthesia? Jeez, I don't know, Novocaine for an abdominal? The clamps are ready if you're going to make the incision. Oh, yes, 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 I see. 
I see now that I have got to do this. Even if these men would allow us to take him to the hospital, we couldn't move him. Uh, he'd die on the way, wouldn't he? Yes, Doctor. Yeah. And even if I could call Dr. Marcus, uh, there isn't enough time to wait for him to get here, right? That's right. And so, whether I want to or not, ready or not, I have to do it. Right, Sue Ann. That's right, Doctor. Hand me the scalpel, please. You know the old saying, the operation was a success, but the patient died. Here we may have a slight reversal in rules. It might very well be said that the operation was a failure, and the doctor died. Life, death. These will be the exclusive concerns of Act Two, which will come your way in just a few minutes. Good. an old saying, if the mountain will not come to Mohammed, then Mohammed must go to the mountain. The application to our story is quite obvious. In an era when a doctor does not, as a rule, make house calls, he must expect some of the strangest callers to come see him at his house. That's the bullet. I see it. And I can pick it up and take it right out. Ha, there. Hey, Doc, you done it. No, this is just the beginning. What are you saying? I just seen you pull out the bullet. B before I try to close him up... Yeah? I should have somebody here, like Dr. Marcus. What for? To help me ascertain how much more, if any, damage there is inside. Uh, we can't afford to get another guy tied up with this thing. I think it looks clean, Doctor. Well, he's lost a considerable amount of blood. Well, he had a lot to begin with. Look, you don't understand. That's a favorite saying of yours, ain't it? You don't understand. I bet you're one of them guys that sits in a gin mill and says, nobody understands me. You still don't understand. Now, you take Pop here. His favorite saying, I'm a man with a lot of blood. So you see, he got it to spare. He should have a transfusion. At least some plasma. Doc, you're doing fine. You know what I mean? First, you said you couldn't operate. So you operated. See? It's a success. Yeah. Now the problems first begin. I counted the sponges, Doctor. They're all out. Uh, let me have that needle. Uh, not even the right kind of suture. Oh, no, just sew them up as best you can, Doc. We can have somebody else fix it later. What do you think you're dealing with here? A suit of clothes? If only we could give him some blood. That's a real thing with you, isn't it? All right. Take some blood from Eddie. Take blood from Eddie? I can't just take anybody's blood. Now, what's the matter? The blood, it has to be the right type. It has to be cross-matched in a lab. Don't you understand? Okay, okay, forget it. I was only trying to help. But we could use some plasma. So use it. I don't have any. Why not? Something important like that? Because I wouldn't have any use for it in my practice. Somebody has to go out and get some. Okay, I'll send Eddie to the drugstore. Write down what he's supposed to ask. You don't buy plasma in a drugstore. Are you kidding? Today you can get anything in a drugstore. Next thing you know, they'll be selling cars. He would have to go to a hospital. Yeah? Yeah, or some medical supply house. Oh, very cute, Doc. He walks in, he hands him a note, and right away they smell stale fish. Next shot out of the box, we got a million cops here, no dice. I'm only trying... Yeah, you've been trying to get a message out of here ever since we came in. Now, you've been stalling about this and lying about that. You just keep your mind on your work, huh? We'll all be better off. I think you want the small needle, Doctor. <laughs> That's all we can do. Great. You know, Doc, you ain't going to be sorry you've done this. Now, how soon can we get him out of here? Are you kidding? 
I asked you a question. I'm entitled to an answer. Well, in the first place, he's still unconscious, you know. I mean, and then I don't know when you can even think of moving him. Okay. So we'll play it by ear, huh? Ah, you got any coffee in the place? Hey, you the, the nurse. Want to make some? Well, uh, you leave her alone. Uh, she's exhausted. Can't you see that? It's all right, doctor. I could use some coffee, too. Yeah, doc, she does look kind of beat. Show him where it is. Let Eddie make the coffee. No, I'll do it. I'll be right back. Honey, you got any ideas of jumping out the window and running for the cops? Remember, I got this piece aimed at your boyfriend. Now, see here, you don't... Just see... give me your word you're going to behave yourself. I give you my word. A dame like you, I believe. But you're one in a million. Now, go ahead. Uh, just to make sure, keep an eye on her, ready. Ah. You're a lucky guy, you know, Doc? Oh, it's nothing like that. It ain't, huh? <laughs> Who are you kidding? Hmm. Let me just plead with you. Believe me, this man needs a hospital. He's doing okay so far, Randy. I can't even begin to explain to you how fantastically lucky he's been. Oh, well, that don't surprise me. It's what Pop always said. Luck is a fortune. And I got it. Hey, now I recognize him. Pop Waldo. One of the underworld bosses. Oh, no, you got that wrong. He was the big boss. So what happened to him? Why, don't you read the paper? Well, not that part of it. Uh, well, the government says that uh, they got some pretty good stuff on him. So the cops want to pick him up. So why didn't he submit? Are you kidding? I read where fellows like him have expensive lawyers who generally get him off. One... One technicality or another. No, no, no. This is pretty good evidence. So when some guys hear about it, they figure maybe he'll sing to make a better deal for himself. You know what I mean? Yes. So they're out to knock them off first. Well, there's no honor among thieves, is there? <laughs> You're a great one to sing about honor. Here you are, cheating on your wife. That isn't true. I've never... The nurse. You never touched her? No. Never. You know, I had a priest once. Know what he said? The sin has been committed even if it only took place in the mind. Look, if uh, if the police are after him and the underworld is after him, where can he go? Out of the country. Where? I mean, most places have extradition arrangements with the United States. Not this one. It's just a little island in the Caribbean. Hmm. How long could he stay there, and uh, and what would he do? Well, you see, Doc, he got a lot of money stashed away there. And only he knows where it is. You know, what good would the money do him? I mean, on a little island, how, how, how could he spend it? <laughs> Wisely. With money, you can rule the world, right? I suppose that's true. So, with money, you can also change the world. Money and time. See what I mean? With money, you can buy the right politicians, you pay off the right witnesses. The government thinks they got a guy ice cold, but for enough money, a witness can get up on the stand and say, Now I ain't exactly positive it was Pop after all. I see. Mm. That's the way these things always work out. All you need is a little bit of time and a lot of money. Yeah, I bet I know what that is. Go on, answer it. Remember, not a word, huh? Yes? Well, Harold, I hope you're happy. Wilma. At first, I decided to go without you. But I'm out of excuses for why you can't be with me. So I just phoned Jeanette and said I had a headache. Well, I can assure you she saw through that one, too. Well... What have you to say for yourself? Wilma, please. I'm not even sure I care. But maybe I can't stand women like Jeanette. Has that ever occurred to you? Who's your girlfriend, Miss Sue Ann? Oh, now don't start that. I'm going to stop it. I'm coming down there right now. No, oh, Wilma, don't. All right. All right, I won't. I won't break into your little love nest. I won't disturb your little tete-a-tete. -tete. I'll let a lawyer do all that for me. Wilma... 
Uh, Doc, you want my advice? You know how to handle a dame like that. Please. You just knock her around a little bit, you know? I mean, don't break nothing. Just like I remember seeing this picture on the late TV show. James Cagney, he hits his dame in the mouth with a grapefruit. That kind of stuff. Don't they love it, these dames? Mm -hmm. That's all I have to do. That's right, Doc. That's all you would have to do. <laughs> Six to an even, it's her again. Pick it up. Yes? Lest you consider that an idle threat, Harold. Please, well... I have already been in touch with an attorney. Please, not now. He has already been gathering evidence. Look, can we discuss this fully when I get home? Oh, and when shall you deign to honor me with a visit? Just as soon as I possibly can. Remember this, Harold. The legal wheels are poised and ready to be set in motion at any time. Wilma! Oh. Hey, listen. Yeah. Yeah, he's stirring around a little bit. All right, we have to get him off the table. Uh, it's too narrow and uncomfortable. There's a couch in the office. It opens up into a bed. Ah, oh, you're a sly one, aren't you, Doc? Oh, it's just some nights I work late and I, I, I might just as well sleep in the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's her name, the nurse? She work late, too? Oh, now, look, let me assure you that, the, that nothing... What, what, what do you want to assure me for, huh? Sue Ann, I'll need a hand. Yes, doctor. Uh, we'll have to make up the couch and then uh, we'll have to carry him inside. <laughs> This ain't bad coffee. Uh, you, the nurse, anytime you want to dump the doc here and you want a new boyfriend. Doctor, his color isn't bad. Yeah, yeah, we've been incredibly lucky so far. Well, some of it was skill. <sighs> Maybe. <laughs> I think I did it all in a dream. I, I remember as an intern, I, I, I watched an operation something like this. I haven't thought about it in years. I, why should I even want to remember it? I'm not a surgeon. And it all came back to me. I think it was a miracle. I... I think you're wonderful. You look tired, Sawyer. You should be. You work very hard. Yes, I... I am very tired. Why don't you just curl up in the armchair there? Uh, hey, that's an idea. We all better stack out. You know what I mean? Now, I'm going inside and stretch out on that table. Eddie, you sit here by the door and watch. Don't let nobody try nothing funny. In a couple of hours, I'll come back in here and relieve you. Doctor? Doctor? Are you awake? Doctor? Doctor? Hey, it's you. You're awake. Hey, how, how do you feel? Uh, listen. Listen, doctor. Don't try to talk if it's an effort. No, just listen. Don't say a word. All right. You got to get me out of here. What? Quiet. Just listen. You got to get me out of here. And so, the big boss has finally come awake. And with the strangest request, Jerry is absolutely insistent that Pop stays put where he is. And now, Pop himself seems equally determined to leave the premises. Obviously, there are many wheels turning within wheels here. But all of them seem to be going in opposite directions. We'll try to steer a straight course when I return shortly with Act Three. Blood, as they say, is thicker than water. In many ways, this has been a blood-stained story so far, especially for Harold W. Smiley, M.D. Although he is a physician, Harold, like many doctors, gets to see relatively little blood. 
They are like those soldiers who get to see relatively little combat. However, one day the tables turn, especially the operating tables, and life becomes real and life becomes earnest in a hurry. Doctor, you've got to get me out of here. Where? Keep it low. A hospital. Yeah, but Jerry said if you go to a hospital, you'll be arrested by the police and the FBI. Yes, and that's just for starters. You mean you want to be arrested? Yes, that's what I mean. Oh, at least you've got some sense. It's only by a miracle that I was able to operate. I'd need another miracle to keep you alive. Oh, that don't worry me. I don't understand. I didn't understand neither at first... But then I figured it out. It's a miracle. Well, that's what I said. But you're just saying that off the top of your head. I believe it. What? Yeah, I heard everything. I, I couldn't talk, but I could hear. What did you hear? Oh, Jerry, he, he brings me to a doctor like you... I wanted to yell at him, stupid Jerry, not here. Not to some quack that takes care of the skin. Well, now, look, see here, I am a qualified physician. No, 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 you don't sound like one. Can you imagine what I'm thinking, lying there on the table with a bullet in me? And you complaining about how you don't have this, you don't have that, to do that, and and, and how you've never done the other thing. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm Trying to yell at Jerry. Get me out of here before this clown kills me. But it worked out. It was a miracle. Yes. Now that you look at it that way, I believe it. But do you believe it the way I believe it? That this thing, it, it was decided by God. Oh. I... I don't know. I do. Doctor, I've been a bum all my life. In the beginning, I kill guys. Now, I can buy that kind of thing. I think the worst is that I could buy people, turn them crooked. Well, here I am, laying in the gutter with a bullet in my belly. I know I'm dying. Why should God want to save a guy like me? Well, these things are always a mystery. Uh, God must have said to me, you're a rich man. You accumulated lots of wealth while I wasn't looking. God said that to you? He must have. Because it's in my mind. So now, you got to give it back. You gotta make up for everything. You gotta turn straight. I think I see. So, I'm gonna turn myself in. And instead of using all that money to buy myself another shot, I'm going to give it away. You know, to the poor, the churches, the hospitals. Sure, 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 yeah. But right now you have to get some sleep. No, 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 no. We have to talk about this. Later. No, it can't wait. Why not? Oh, you're starting to raise your voice again. It has to be now. While Eddie is sitting there by the door. He can't hear. And he can't see my lips move neither. Make sure your back is to him. But I don't understand. When Jerry finds out I want to turn myself in, he won't like it. But it's a sure way to save your life, after all. Just listen. Jerry's going to knock me off if he thinks I'm going to do it. Oh, no, no, no. I saw how devoted he is to yeah, you. Yeah, he's devoted, all right. Well, then why would he? I'd do the same thing if I was him. But, uh, Doc, he's my boy as long as I'm his boss. But what happens to him if I'm no more in the picture? I, I don't know. But he does. He don't want to go to jail. 
And without him being in an organization anymore, he's sure to get himself knocked off. Can't he join another organization? Yeah, but he has to prove himself to his new boss. And the best way to do that would be to bring them my scalp. You see what I mean? Oh, yes, I think so. Sooner or later, I gotta tell Jerry what I want to do. Oh. He won't like it. So he'll knock me off. And then knock you off for good measure. Hmm. You and what's her name, the nurse. Yeah, but what can we do? In the next room where you worked on me. Yes? You took off my coat, right? What did you do with it? I, um... Oh, I remember. Uh, Sue Ann dropped it on the floor. Uh, probably kicked it into a corner. I'm, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's okay. When Jerry comes out here... You make some excuse to go in there, understand? And in the inside pocket, nobody knows about this, I carry a little twenty-two automatic. A gun? Just pay attention. Very thin, very small. I had it made. You get it. And when I tell Jerry what I want to do, just pull the gun and, and hold him and Eddie off till you can call the cops. But I don't know anything about a, a gun. I, I... What's to know? Can you tell which end the bullet comes out of? Yes, I suppose so. Well, just aim that end at the guy and everything else comes natural. Well, I just grabbed me my 40 winks. How's he doing? Uh, pretty good. Hey, Pop, I see you're up. Hello, Jerry. Uh, don't make him talk. Uh, he must have rest. Yeah, that's a ticket, Pop. Gonna get your beauty sleep. Uh, Eddie, you might just as well sack out on the rug. A table in there is no bargain. Go ahead, Eddie. I'll sit up. Hey, where you going, Doc? Uh, inside. I'm, uh, I'm going inside. What for? I think I want to get some more sulfur powder. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Is it all right with you? Sure, sure. It's all right with me. Now, there's a dame with a one-track mind. Pick it up, huh? Yes. Still working, aren't you? Yes, Wilma. I'm still working. Really? Don't tell me you're performing emergency surgery. Don't tell her. What kind of work could you possibly be doing there? You and Miss Sue Ann, the nurse? I can't talk now, Wilma. Well, maybe you can't, but I can. I told you I had everything in readiness, and now I'm going to unleash the hounds. Wilma! Uh, she's mad, huh? Well, maybe she has a right to be. Ah, uh, they get over it. Oh, I, uh... See, I owe everything to her. Oh, no, you don't. No, we were married in college, uh... She worked so I could go to medical school. She sacrificed a great deal for me. Oh, you think so, huh? Oh, it's a fact. Hmm. Uh, can I tell you something, Jerry? Doc, I'm your pal. Shoot. Two gangsters break into my office early this evening. At the point of a gun, I'm forced to perform an operation on a third one. An operation? Me. Now, I'm a good doctor, a very good doctor. Doc, any time you need a reference. But in my own specialty. Now, listen. I didn't go to medical school to help adolescents get rid of bad skin. I was interested in research. That's all I ever wanted. So, what stopped you? I was sick of being poor. Of scrimping, saving, making do. Of doing without. You and me, Doc... With the same kind of guy. So I figured I'd make some money for a while, you know? In private practice. I was like that, too. But the only way I could get out of being poor was to carry a gun. And I made a great deal of money. But I haven't been happy. Happy? What's happy? And she senses it, Jerry. See, I resent her. I feel I'm doing this because I owe it to her. I have to pay her back. But I can't do it anymore. 
You know why I stay here so late? I'm trying to do research. Now, Doc, you don't want to blow your stack over a dam, do you? I just can't lead this kind of a life anymore. This isn't for me. Yes, it's useful and it's important work. But it isn't my work. I want to go back to the laboratory. Yeah, go, go, Doc. I started to say before that tonight... See, I was forced to perform surgery at the point of a gun. And this is the most exciting thing that's happened to me in ten years. Doc, maybe we can manage to do it again sometime. No, it, 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 was, it was exciting because it was vital. Because it pushed me to the absolute limits of my capability and beyond. I want to go back to doing that in my own specialty, where I have something to contribute. She'll have to take it or leave it. Dunk, you know something? I think she'll take it. Well, she'll have to. Basically, she's a very serious woman, you know. I mean, that's why we got together in the first place. We're both serious people. Doctor! Doctor! Hey, Pump, you're up. Yeah, Doctor, I, I hate to break this up. But what I think is, tell me, did you... Take care of the thing. Uh, yes. I, uh... I found it. Yeah? What'd you find? I found some, uh... Steel. <laughs> A small piece of steel. And I removed it. Well, that's good. Jerry, I think I better go to the hospital. The hospital? Yeah, this doc here, he's, he's okay, but he's gone about as far as he can go. No, Pop, I, I was thinking, we could stay here. How? The, the doc here it can lock his door and say his office is closed. And in a little bit, when you feel better, we could make it to the boat. Yeah, well, I, I want to go to the hospital. But, Pop... It'll be all over then. Yeah. It'll be all over. Are you okay in the head? I am now, Jerry. Well, what happens to me and Eddie? You don't have to be here when the cops come. Well, I, I mean, what, what happens? I, I, I can't see it that way. Doc, right now. I advise both of you not to move at all. Uh, what's that you got in your hand there? A water pistol? Don't let them get to their guns, Doc. Put that away, stupid, before I blow your head off. Open it up. All of us are down. What's that? Hey. 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 Who's here? Harold, what is the meaning of this? What do you guys want to do? Shoot it out? Hey, you're not cops. Oh, I know you. You're a private dick. Yeah, but there's a big reward out for all of you. Harold, what is going on here? You can't get away. There's two of us, so drop them, huh? Hey, Mrs. Smiley. I guess you don't need the photographer. Pete, you can go home. So, Ann, please, call an ambulance for my patient. Oh, Harold... You, you really were working. Oh, can you ever forgive me? Come on, Jerry. Let's go. You and Eddie, move. Uh, don't give in cheap, Doc. Oh, Harold. You see, the lawyer had these private detectives ready for me, and I, I thought we'd catch you and... Well, well, that's how you... Get divorces. No, that's not how you get divorces. You get them because you forget why you got married in the first place. I guess I forgot for a while. I suppose I did, too. Well, I'm glad we both remember. Uh, how you doing, Pop? Oh, well, I, I recognize him from his pictures. He's the most notorious gangster. Yeah, he's my patient. Are you all right, Pop? Uh, yeah, Doc. He, you saved me. Thanks. <laughs> you know something, Pop? I think you saved me, too. There are 
certainly enough thanks to go round. Although the story goes on after the curtain falls, we can only speculate as to its course. Harold and Wilma, it is to be hoped, found a renewal of their marriage. Pop, although in jail, is happy and fulfilled. Sue Ann, I'm sure, has found a new and more viable romance. And uh, Jerry and Eddie? They usually land on their feet. And I shall land here again in just a few minutes. the doctor in? If the nurse says yes, that doesn't really tell us everything, does it? How is the doctor in? And what is his mood, his temper, his ability to function at this particular moment, which is the precise moment we need him? Doctors are just as human as the rest of us, and just as mysterious. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Joyce Gordon, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. I imagine at one time or another, we have all met someone who could do no wrong. There are also those whom fate decides can do no right. Marie Antoinette was such a one. From the time she left her home in Vienna to marry the next king of France, there was nothing she could ever do to stop the French from hating her, reviling her, and finally cutting off her head. Will you see a priest? A priest? No. No. But what will be said when it's known you refuse the help of religion in these final moments? Tell those who speak of it that God's mercy provided for it. Do you think those people in the streets will let me go to the guillotine without tearing me to pieces? drama, End of a Queen, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Tammy Grimes. I shall return shortly with Act One. She was christened Maria Antonia. She was blonde and grew up a slim, nice-looking girl who was often complimented for holding herself as regally as a queen, which she became when she married the future king of France at 15. Royal families arranged those things in those days. Now she is 38, imprisoned, going to the guillotine, and cannot understand why. Madame... I brought you what you asked for. I never thought you would get here. Do you think it is a simple matter to find candles and paper and ink at four in the morning in this place? I suppose not. It was stupid, my anger at you, Lieutenant. I have so little these days, and my wants are so simple. Why should I expect any favors? I do what I can, madame. I am going to write a letter. It is private, and I would appreciate it if you did not watch me, Lieutenant. I shall have to ask, who to? My sister-in-law, Elizabeth, before she escaped from France, you know, she was part of the family. You go ahead and write, madame. I shall sit in the corner and sleep. It would be a long day tomorrow. For you, maybe, but not for me. This is the 16th of October at 4.32... In the morning, I am writing to you, Elizabeth, for the last time. 
I am innocent. I hope to show I can be firm in my last moments on earth. I am calm as one is when one's conscience does not reproach. I have just been condemned. As I write, you dear sister-in-law, a cause of my years as a queen and of my days of the trial still ring in my ears. The accused may be seated. Your name, surname, age, position, place of birth and residence. My name is Marie Antoinette Lorraine d'Autriche, aged 38, widow of the King of France. I was born in Vienna. At the time of my arrest, I was in the session hall of the National Assembly. I have here a packet of possessions belonging to the prisoner, taken from her at the Conciergerie. I ask you to explain them. A little wallet fitted with scissors, needles, silk thread, and so forth. A little mirror, a gold ring, two portraits of women. Who are the people represented by these portraits? They are two ladies with whom I was brought up in Vienna. What are their names? Mesdames de Mecklenburg and de Hess. A packet of hair of various colors. They come from my dead and living children and from my husband. A paper with figures on it. It is a multiplication table for teaching my seven-year-old boy. It has been reported that after the revolution you gave precedence to your son as if he were a king. He is a little boy of seven. Of course, I fed him first, as would any mother with any child. So to you, your son is the future king. He will be whatever France chooses him to be. As your son is now only a private person, do you then declare that you have renounced all the privileges which formerly gave him the empty title of king? I have no finer ambition for him than the happiness of France. You are glad that there is no more king or monarchy? All we desire is that France should be great and happy. You must therefore wish for the people to have no more oppressors, and that all your family who would wield arbitrary power should undergo the fate of your husband, the bloodsucker of France. I can answer for my son and myself. I am not responsible for others. If France is to be happy with a king, I wish it to be my son. If she is to be happy without a king, I shall share the happiness with him. Lieutenant. Yes, madame. The few possessions that were taken from me, may I have them back? What is the prisoner whispering about? Uh, Marie Antoinette requests the return of her few possessions which have just been shown to the citizen jury. Certainly not. They have been impounded and are to be returned to the Republic. You, Marie Antoinette, where did you get the money to build and furnish the Triamon? The Petit Triamon is small in name only. It costs immense sums. That is possible. Perhaps more than I would have wished. We were gradually involved in more and more expense. However, the millions you were given to build this palatial and extravagant toy farm was not enough, was it? It was hardly millions. It could have been several hundred thousand. Oh, I see. Several hundred thousand of what was rightfully the money of the people. Nevertheless, it was not sufficient. And so you signed vouchers to be paid from the treasury. We have witnesses who have seen these vouchers. It is not so. Your denial is useless. We have discovered two vouchers signed by you for the sum of 80,000 livres. And the signature is Marie Antoinette. What was the date of the vouchers? One was dated August 10th, 1792. The other I do not remember. I never signed any vouchers. And in any case, how could I have done so on the 10th of August? The day on which my husband and I went to the National Assembly at 8 in the morning. How you accomplished it is not for this tribunal to determine. Your dissipated squandering of the riches that belong to the French people is common knowledge. Queen or no queen, it is hardly excusable. 
200 new dresses a year. Gowns covered in lace and jewels. Your gambling debts in the hundreds of thousands. A national scandal. Please, I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I cannot. believe the prisoner is ill. What is that? Devine, speak up. I said I believe the prisoner is ill. It is now midnight and she has not eaten all day. She's extremely pale. You are her guard, Lieutenant Dupuis, not her physician. Citizen jurors, you have to judge not a single deed or a single crime, but the accused's whole political life since she came to sit beside the last king of the French. It is now midnight. I believe we have heard enough. I shall expect a verdict before the night is over. <laughs> So, my dear sister-in-law, Elizabeth, in the company of my jailer, who became my only friend, Lieutenant de Bune, in a room adjoining the Grand Chambre, I awaited the verdict. And then, a bell rang. Madame. Yes, Lieutenant. What is that bell? Is it for me? The President of the Council is calling for the citizen jurors to assemble. Does that mean they have made up their minds? Yes. Can you stand up, Madame? With your help? Madame, I don't think the trial has proven your guilt. No? I was a lawyer before I became head of the gendarmes. And from the viewpoint of jurisprudence, you are innocent. Legally? Yes. I have hope. That Francois Tizet, he was obviously coached in his lies about the vultures. I saw two citizen jurors shaking their heads in disbelief. Accusations without any proof of documents, Lieutenant. You do think, you do think there is hope? Not only I. During the trial, I heard people say, you gave your answers like an angel. That they will only deport you. Who said that? Someone influential? May I... May I have some water? My throat is dry. It is from the anxiety, madame. You have been supreme in your answers since the death of the king. You have only a few more moments to endure. Here is your glass. Antoinette, you will please rise for the jury's declaration. I shall read as follows. That the accused be condemned to death in accordance with Articles 1 and 11 of the first section of the first chapter of the second part of the Penal Code. Have you any objection to make to the application of the laws invoked by the public prosecutor? <laughs> Madame. Uh, Monsieur le prosecutor, the defendant is not feeling well. I am all right. Just hold on to me, please. May I beg the court? The widow Capet has suffered a great deal, and I don't think justice... You said to but... me of Marie Antoinette's suffering? This Austrian who intrigued and dealt with the enemies of the Republic, with her brother Joseph, the Emperor of Austria, a woman who has conspired to start a civil war here, who has spent millions of francs of the people's money on entertainment while thousands of French had no shoes and no bread. Those people demand she stand on her feet to hear the judgment she has brought upon herself. Let no more be said about it. I feel faint. No more. Will you be able to... Yes, I can. The tribunal, according to the unanimous declaration of the jury, condemns the said Marie Antoinette, called Lorraine d'Autriche, to the pain of death in accordance with the laws of 10 March last year, and orders that the present judgment shall be executed in the Place de la Révolution. <sighs> the widow has fainted. Then bring her around. 
The law will run its course. Mm. Madame. Mm. Madame. Mm. Can you hear me? Please. Let me help you up. The defendant is excused. Lieutenant de Bune, you may take your charge back to her cell. Is it with you? I can walk. It isn't far to the door of the Grand Chambre. There. All right? Yes. Now, down these stairs to the courtyard. Are you warm enough, madame? I don't feel anything. Do you? Do you see them? The other prisoners? They are watching me walk across the courtyard, aren't they? There isn't one single prisoner who hasn't stayed awake to see you. I must set an example. Take your hand from my arm, Lieutenant. I must show them I can walk alone. Show them how a queen behaves, even to the end. Whether the execution of Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette was justified or not is not our story. Ours is the portrait of a queen under fire. How she maintained outward composure with the knowledge that she was the most hated woman in France. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Again, as I bring you these stories of suspense and mystery, I am struck how much stranger and more horrifying truth can be than the fabricated. So it is with this tale. It is indeed October 16th, 1793. One hour has passed since Marie Antoinette began the last letter she would ever write. The one to her sister-in-law, Elizabeth. just been condemned, dear Elizabeth, not to a shameful death, for it is shameful only for criminals, but to rejoin Louis, your brother. Like him, I am innocent. I am sad beyond belief that my children have been taken from me. There is something I must mention, which pains my heart. I know how much distress my son's words have given you. But remember, in five days, he will just be eight years old. I think back and remember what a glorious time it was. When he was born. How do you feel this morning, my darling? How does any mother feel, Louis? I am afraid it will be another girl. What are you doing here? You are going hunting. I want to be with you. Make certain you're well taken care of. I have Madame de Gumigny, who has always attended me. (laughs) What can I do? Surely there must be something. Yes. Distract me with some news. Court gossip, anything. <laughs> what is the news? Can you tell me? Uh, ah, the Americans are victorious at a place called um, Yorktown. At last. Thank the Lord. This revolution in America is costing us a fortune. Mm. Who was responsible for the victory? Lafayette. Yes. And Rochambeau and Miromeny. I'm glad the English were beaten. I'm always afraid they'll be in France next. Oh, nonsense. Our fleet is every bit as good as theirs. Louis! 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 Uh, don't, don't tell me now. Now, but I, I haven't had lunch yet. You, you go have your lunch, dear, and ask Madame de Gumigny to come here quickly. At one o'clock, how well I remember my son was born. 
They took him away directly and he was baptized. Then a knock on the door and there was Louis with the infant in his arms and he was saying, Monsieur le Dauphin, demand d'entrer. <laughs> the Dauphin demands to enter. Louis and I were so happy. We laughed and cried and held on to each other with the little one between us in our arms. Antoinette, you will agree that you have been separated from your seven-year-old son for his own good? Is that what you would have me say? Are you also aware of the health of the young Dauphin? His health? Has been severely damaged... If that is true, it is only since he has been placed in the charge of the commissioner of the commune, Simone. I would have the citizen jurors know that this child one day was surprised by Simone in indecent defilement. And when the commissioner asked the boy who had taught him this criminal behavior, he replied his mother and his aunt. What do you have to say to that? Nothing. The young Dauphin declared in the presence of the mayor of Paris and the prosecutor of the commune that his mother and his aunt Elizabeth, sister of the late Louis Capet, that these two women often made the child lie down between them. That there then took place acts of the most uncontrolled debauchery. That there was no doubt from what Capet's son said that there had been an act of incest between mother and son. Widow Capet... What answer do you have to this accusation? I have no knowledge of the incidents you speak of. I have omitted another important fact which I would like to bring to the attention of the citizen jurors. After the death of Louis, these two women treated the Dauphin with the same deference as if he had been king. I have told you before that my son is a little child. And because of that, I did help him to eat first, as would any mother with her child. Lieutenant, will you give me your arm? The widow Capet would like to rise to her feet. Would she care also to answer the accusation? If I did not reply, it was because nature recoils from such an accusation against a mother. I appeal to all mothers who may be here in this tribunal. <laughs> It is getting late, my dear sister-in-law. Or rather, I should say it is now early morning. I think back, and it seems to me I have always been accused and blamed for doing that which I felt was best for France. Even my own brother Joseph turned against me when I visited him in Vienna. I am told the gardens of Versailles are more beautiful than these of Schoenbrunn. Is that so, Maria? <laughs> Maria. He calls me Maria. Bless you, dearest brother. To again be an Austrian as I was born. Just for the few weeks that I am here. I hope you keep those thoughts to yourself in Paris. I do, I do. Joseph. Why do you look so sternly at me? I must talk to you as Joseph II, Emperor of Austria, as well as your older brother. What have people been saying about me? Only the truth, I suspect. While in residence at Versailles, you would stay out all night. Then return home at six in the morning and on to the races at ten. If the ministers scheduled a meeting with you, you might keep them waiting for hours. Is that so terrible? I am the queen of France. You are the queen of the French people who don't care for a queen who wastes money and spends all her life in enjoyment in a country that is the poorest nation in Europe. It was poor before I became queen. And anyway, Louis assures me there's plenty of money. Something is wrong with how the treasury is run. That's why I've had three new ministers of finance. I got rid of each of them myself. Have you ever asked yourself by what right you interfere in the affairs of the French kingdom? What studies have you ever made? 
What knowledge have you acquired that you dare imagine your advice or opinion can be of any use? Joseph! Particularly in affairs which require wide knowledge. I didn't come to Vienna to be insulted by you. I don't care if you are the Emperor of Austria. Maria, you are a pleasant young woman who thinks of nothing but frivolity. Your appearance and your amusement. I'm going back inside the palace. I'm not going to listen to this. You act only from impulse. You repeat only the opinions of those who bow and scrape before you. Maria, it is foolhardy. And one day, you will have to pay for your sins. Now I am at the end of this letter, dear Elizabeth. I sincerely beg pardon of God for all... All the faults I have committed during my life. Farewell, my dear Elizabeth. May this letter reach you. Think of me always. I embrace you with all my heart together with my poor children. My Lord, what agony it is to leave them forever. I am so very tired. I shall lie down on my cot for a little sleep. The last sleep I shall have from which I can awaken. It's the call to arms, Your Majesty. The troops are being mustered and patrols sent out everywhere to make certain nothing will interfere with the execution. Who are you? Where is Lieutenant de Bune? Oh, he was taken from here an hour ago and arrested. But what for? I was asleep. I didn't even say goodbye to him. He was denounced by one of his men who saw him several times bring you a glass of water and several times return from the tribunal with you walking bareheaded. Arrested? Everything is being taken from me. Your, your Majesty, uh, will you eat something? You are a gendarme, young man. Yes, Your Majesty. What is your name? Philippe. Philippe, you had better not be overheard calling me Your Majesty, or they will come and arrest you. There is nothing majestic about my position anymore. <laughs> of course, uh, I could always swear that you called me Your Former Majesty. Have you been in service long, Philippe? Oh, when I was 14, I was with the troops who guarded you when you went to Paris to the opera. Sometimes people would jeer at you and, and, and make remarks, but you took no notice of them. I always thought you courageous. Nothing can change that for me. How old are you, Philippe? I'm 18. So young and already in a responsible post. My father was in the gendarmerie before me. Father to son. It often happens in the military service. Well, sometimes the son is more proficient than the father. That's the case with Henri Samson. He does a far better job than his father did. Is that the Samson who is executioner of my husband? Oh. oh. Forgive me, Your Majesty. It was clumsy of me. What time is it now? Seven o'clock. Is there something I should do at seven o'clock? I've been instructed to fetch you some food. It isn't necessary. Everything is over for me. When will I be taken away? I don't know, Your Majesty. Even you who are sent to guard me do not know. Why is it such a secret? I'm told there was a plot to try to rescue you. So they've placed thousands of soldiers in the streets to make sure it will not happen. I have not heard of such a plot. Oh, someone is coming in here. Marie Antoinette, are you ready? Ready? Now? We are waiting. The scaffold is prepared. What you have been hearing, the words spoken at the trial, the letter written to her sister-in-law, the account of the lieutenant who was arrested for bringing the prisoner glasses of water, are all documented. France has kept extensive records of her past. 
We shall rattle the skeleton once more when I return shortly with Act Three. alone was this woman, once a child bride who played at being a queen. By the time responsibility came to her, it was too late. By then, the hatred of the French for their Austrian-born queen knew no bounds. But in her conscience, Marie Antoinette was certain she had done no wrong. False, she said, the morning of her death. False, yes, but never crimes. Antoinette, are you ready? But I have not pressed. Philippe, you will watch over the prisoner until the executioner arrives. Yes, sir. Antoinette, you will have five minutes to dress. Philippe, you will remain here. Five minutes? Five minutes? Is there no woman anywhere to help me change my chemise? What? You wish servants still, do you? I have not been well. Just... Someone to help me get dressed. Do you hear the woman? Send me a servant. Take my arm. Fetch me a glass of water. If it would not make me laugh, I could weep. Do not punish Lieutenant de Bune. He did nothing I did not ask him to. Where is he? Very touching your concern. How concerned were you when you rode to Versailles and all your plumes and the men and women on the road begged you for bread? I did not know they were hungry. Nor did you care. So you ordered your coachman to whip the horses faster. But enough of accusations. You have been condemned. What of the lieutenant? He will be taken care of. What a pity such solicitude could not have come to you sooner, Antoinette. Philippe, leave us for a moment. Yes, sir. You do not recognize me, do you, Antoinette? Yes, I did, Georges. You made not a single sign throughout the trial. Your face has changed, it's true. But I felt no need to throw myself at your mercy. You had me broken on the rack because I angled you, remember? They butchered my face. So, of course, by the time it healed, I was unrecognizable. I had nothing to do with that. I merely expressed... The wish you'd be taken away. I had no knowledge of what would happen to you. All you did was give the orders, hmm? Now those who gave the orders are those who are condemned. The wheel turns, Antoinette. The poor above and the rich below. In those years, I always advised you well. I told you the truth, but you hid it from yourself. You would not believe me when I told you a man who feeds his family on one fish head a day could not look kindly upon a royal family that eats millions of francs of meat and fish. So it always comes down to money. It was not money that had me banished. I could not help what happened to me, Georges. I needed someone, and you spoiled it. You made it ridiculous and impossible. I was not surprised you had a lover. Nor was I the only one at court who knew Louis had little interest in you as a woman. I want to forget all that. I do not wish to talk of it anymore. Marie, Marie, you are not in a position to make demands. I wish to talk about it. I wish to remember. And I wish you to recall every moment as well. Why, Georges? I want you to remember me as I was. When I could stand up straight. Not the hunched cripple. I am today. I came to your bedroom at Versailles. Remember? Who is it? It is me, Georges, Your Majesty. Georges, can you come back later? I'm busy. No, no, I cannot. It is imperative this document must be signed. Uh, the ministers have been waiting all day and the king is not back from the hunt. I have someone with me. Can you slip it under the door? No, I cannot and I will not. <laughs> oh, all right. Wait a minute. Step aside, George, and let the poor man out. Excuse me, sir. Well, come in. What are you standing there for? Oh, get me the silly paper that requires a royal signature. Put it on the table. Where do I sign? Aren't you going to read it first, Your Majesty? Of course not. That's what I have you for. Where do I sign? 
Here with the seal is? Yes, please. All right. So, so I have a lover. Is that such a surprise? No. Axel Fersen is a handsome young man. Handsome? He's brilliant in everything. And Georges, you needn't worry about the king. He knows. Marie! Marie! Speak of the devil. Uh, Marie, my darling, the hunt. I never enjoyed one as much. And, um, hello, Georges. Some document or something? You have been hunting, and so have I. Uh -huh. You've been hunting? What? <laughs> Pleasure. Axel was here. Oh, I see. Uh, Georges, uh, you had some business for me to then to... Uh, the Queen, uh... It's all right. I signed it, Louis. You see, Georges, I told you you knew all about Axel. No, oh, Marie, for heaven's sake. There was no way to keep it from Georges. He arrived, and so I had to send Axel away. What happens in our chambers is strictly between you and me, Marie. Oh, Georges doesn't mind. I told him it was with your consent. <sighs> Georges, you will go now. He wouldn't say anything. Would you, Georges? <laughs> I did not say anything. But five days later, I was arrested, thrown into the Bastille, tortured, and then deported to Guiana. It was only when I returned several years ago that I learned it was not King Louis who had ordered me disposed of. But you, Antoinette, you were annoyed that my presence had placed the king in an awkward position, and an annoyance must be eliminated. But now, the wheel has turned... You have five minutes to dress and no servants. No one to order about. The days of being waited on hand and foot are over. Five minutes. No more. Philippe, come in and keep watch carefully. Five minutes. He said five minutes, didn't he? I have my, uh, my white negligee I wear in the morning. A queen must die in white. White for a royal funeral. My muslin tissue, this, this chemise, I must change for a clean one. Where can I change? There is only this one room. Monsieur. Your Majesty. In the name of decency, allow me to change my linen without witnesses. I'm instructed not to leave this room. I will turn to the wall and keep my eyes closed. I, I would not embarrass you. Philippe, is the woman changed to her funeral dress? Y yes, sir. Uh, she is changing. Make sure she hides nothing that could stop the course of justice. Yes, sir. W w what does he mean? Make certain I don't take any poisons. Two more minutes. Philippe, have you asked if she wishes to see the Abbe Girard? No, but I shall. The Abbe has offered you the service of his ministry. I decline the offer. But what will be said when it's known you refuse the help of religion in these final moments? Philippe, uh, you will tell those who speak of it that God's mercy provided for it. May I suggest, on the way to the Place de la Révolution, the Abbe ride along with you? If he so wishes, listen to them. Do you think the people in the streets will let me go to the scaffold without tearing me to pieces? I am ready now. George, you may enter. Philippe, did she ask for the Abbe? He may ride with me to the guillotine if he wishes. Pay attention, madame. I shall read the verdict to you. There's no point. I know it only too well. The tribunal, according to the unanimous declaration of the jury, condemns you, Marie Antoinette, widow of Louis, to the pain of death. Condemns you, Marie Antoinette. He was a poor fool, my husband, the king. But it is a weakness of the Bourbon. Continue. He had no idea how to rule France, and neither did I. But in those last hours, he became a man. He had been condemned to death by one vote. The Duc de Chartres. One vote. The Duc de Chartres cast the single vote. The Duc with whom... I danced the day I was married with Judas. I danced with him at the wedding. Antoinette, what are you mumbling about? Are you listening to the sentence? And then I watched my husband driven off to his death in a coach. <laughs> I was only Louis XVI's wife. I was bound to submit to his will. 
Can't you understand that, gentlemen? The time for explanations is past. Philippe, Henri Sanson is outside. Bring him in. I must be calm. I must set an example. Come in, Henri. Prisoner, hold out your hands. Are my hands to be bound? It is customary. My husband's hands were not bound. Sanson, do not hesitate. Do it. Sanson, so tightly. Must, must, must you tie her hands that roughly behind her back? Philippe Henri has learned from his father. He knows more about this than you or I. But the, the scissors, what, what is he to do with them? Watch. <laughs> her hair. <laughs> All her hair. Nothing must interfere with the descent of the knife. <laughs> The courtyard. The cart. It is to take you to the Place de la Révolution. My husband rode to the guillotine in a coach, not a garbage cart. There was but one king, I am sorry to say. For him, a coach was used. There is someone in it already. The Abbe. He and I will sit on each side of you until we arrive at the scaffold. And Philippe. I've been ordered to remain here. Henri, be gentle. It is an ugly duty, Philippe. There will... There will be just you and the Abbe. No one else. But the crowd. They could come at me and drag me from the cart. There are 30,000 troops along the way to protect you, madame. Goodbye. Take heart. You'll be with your husband very soon. It is a long ride. Yes. Long live the Republic! Is this the Rue Saint Honoré? It looks so different with all those people. What is that? The cannon at the Bastille. Madame, we have arrived at the scaffold. Please, don't touch me, anybody. I can climb from this dung heap without any help. Let them all scream. Show the hatred. I don't care. I have never cared. I hated them all. Always. There's the ladder to the scaffold. They don't dare come near me. I can climb ladders as well as any farmer. I climb to the roof of the piano often to rescue my kittens. Look at them staring at me. They could never hate me as much as I love them. Pardon, I stepped on your foot. I did not do it on purpose. I must tie you to this plant, madame. They would have the world believe being a queen is enough to condemn you. That to reign over others is to be a traitor to man. The kings are a race born to harm people. That we care no more for our subjects than we care for the insects we crush with our foot. It is true. But you will never kill all of us. You will never! He is holding up in my severed head for all to see. I feel... Nothing. The end of a queen. But not quite. Five years later, those pitiful small possessions of Marie Antoinette's that were used in evidence at the trial were placed at auction. The little green Morocco case with scissors, needle, and thread brought five francs, 75 centimes. The two little portraits of the friends of her youth were sold for four francs, 40 centimes. 
the end of a queen. I shall return shortly. never know with certainty what went on in the heart of the queen. We do know she met death unflinchingly. But was it pride, rebellion, or vindictiveness to the end that made her refuse to show the people the cringing queen they wanted to see? Those who saw her die never knew that when the knife fell, Marie Antoinette entered history. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Norman Rose, Russell Horton, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Marshall. A shocking crime has been committed. As the bard himself might put it, murder most foul. After an extensive manhunt, the culprit is apprehended. He turns out to be a quiet, almost meek family man who could very well be your neighbor. As a matter of fact, his neighbors are hard put to believe it. Him commit murder? Why, he isn't the type. Which raises the fascinating question, is there a type? Now, uh, what was stolen, ma'am? A pair of spectacles, sir. Mm-hmm. And you're telling me someone broke into the house, which is filled with valuables, and only walked out with a pair of glasses? Yes, Lieutenant. Mm. And what are they worth, those glasses? Thirty-two dollars. I see. But they must be worth more than that to the thief. Else why risk prison if he were caught? Hmm. Is there something special about those glasses? Obviously, Lieutenant. Obviously. Our mystery drama, Cold Comfort, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. I'll be back shortly with Act One. For almost 30 years, the shop has been in the neighborhood, and the sign on the window has read, Amos Crandall, Optometrist. The place is small, simply furnished, and uncluttered. Amos, or Doc as he is called, knows practically everybody in the neighborhood. And practically everybody knows him. Doc doesn't say much, but he doesn't charge much either. He does a very nice job, and he's always there when you need him. But since the average person doesn't need him very often, most people don't know... Hey, yes? Are my glasses ready? Uh, you are uh, Mr... Bostow. Uh, William Bostow. Oh, yes. Ye- yes, Mr. Bostow. I have them uh, right here. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, uh, let's just slip these on. See if they're exactly right. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, indeed. Perfect. Does it fit all right? Oh, yes, yes. I, uh... <laughs> I could say these are the best I've ever had. It, it it just seems... Is it my imagination that this temple piece is a little bit thick? It's the pair you picked out. Yes, yes. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, it looks pretty good at that. I'm glad you like them. Yeah, let me write you out a check. I think I'll have another cup of coffee. Oh, you shouldn't have even had the first one. I I need something hot to drink. Oh, don't tell me you've caught cold again. No, no, it's just the weather. You're always cold, dear. 
We have no business being north in this winter. We're too old. We're not that old. No, we're not that young either. Well, I, I can't retire just yet. Well, we have enough money. Uh, not as much as you think. Oh, we can live very comfortably. I, I got a letter from my sister Jean. She writes... Now, a... I know what she writes. It's just wonderful down in Florida. The condominium worked out beautifully. There are still a few left. Now, why don't we buy one? Mm, I will think about... Wait a minute. What's this? Barstow. William K. Barstow. Who's he? Professor Barstow, an archaeologist. Oh, what did he do? He died. Did you know him? The man was in the shop, oh, a week or ten days ago. I made him a pair of glasses. And here he is, dead. Of what? It happened suddenly in the street. He had a heart attack. Does it say how old a man he was? Uh, he is 60. Oh, no, I'm really going to be late. I, I, I'll be back for lunch. Amos, promise me you'll think very seriously about retiring. I will, Emily. I will. Yes. Who? Did he set up an appointment? Uh, it's okay. Uh, tell him to come in. Uh, now what does he want? Uh, Mr. Trent? Uh, yes. Uh, step inside, Amos. Close the door. Thank you. Sit down. Thank you. Now, what's the problem? The... Problem? Yes, let me have it. Well, there isn't a problem exactly. I mean, Mr. Trent, my wife wants me to retire. Retire? Yes, sir. Retire? Well, that's a new one. I never heard of anybody around here who ever retired. Well, there comes a time... You reach a certain age. Oh, yes. Well, maybe. But I don't know of anybody in this organization that's lived long enough to reach it. I have. You? I got old, Mr. Trent. Old? Well, you're only 60. That's old. <laughs> I guess I'm an old 60. I was a prisoner, you know. Yes, it was before my time. A POW. It was a bad winter. I nearly died. Uh, Amos, did you come here to tell me some war stories? They say it was the worst winter ever in Korea. The arthritis, the rheumatism, they never left me. I've been cold ever since. My wife knows I'm having a hard time, and so naturally she wants me to retire. To move down to Florida. That's what your wife wants you to do. But what do you want to do? Well, the truth is, I guess I do too. What do you think, Mr. Trent? I don't know. Maybe you think you can hand me a line like this so we'll offer you some more money. Oh, no, no, Mr. Trent. Well, we are being very generous as it is. Now, you have to admit that. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. And considering the fact that we wouldn't have to pay you anything at all if we didn't want to... Mr. Trent, I'm very tired. Amos, I am not the one who has to say. Well, who does? Well, you should know better than to ask. But the answer is somebody upstairs. See, I'm like you, Amos. Each of us can only go up one flight. You can climb up here, and I can go to the next landing. Yes, but will you do it for me? Will you ask? Well, sure.
sure I will, Amos. Don't worry about a thing. Mr. Trent, do you have news for me? Uh, yes. I've got news. Will they let me retire? Forget it. You mean they turned me down? I didn't even ask. You didn't even ask? You came in to see me the other day. You were... You were so upset that you just couldn't think straight. But you promised me you'd ask. Well, I had to humor you, Amos. Go up and ask for permission to retire. <laughs> That's all you'd have to do. Right away, they'd start thinking, why? Well, I, I, I just want to get away from everything and, and relax. Maybe get warm. Look. I did what I was told for almost 27 years. I did a good job, too. You had no it... choice. Now, I am your control. We both know what is in your record. Now, you were taken prisoner the first week of the Korean War, Captain Amos Crandall. And from that day on, you played ball with the enemy. Look, Mr. Trent... I had no business being called back. I, I wasn't fit physically. I'd been wounded six years before in France. It was not right for them to call me back. I needed the pills. I needed the special protein. I would have died. There is no point in telling me about it, Amos. You spied on your friends. And because of you, an escape attempt was foiled. Six men died. Your fault. No. It isn't true. I tried to warn them not to go. I, I really tried. We have all that information. The statutes of limitation on treason never expire. We need you to continue serving, Amos. I've given you everything I have. We'll be the judge of that. Now look, Amos. I stuck my neck out to do you a good turn. Let's forget about retiring, shall we? I'll tell you why I'm here. This is the pair of eyeglasses you mailed to your Pacific contact? Uh, yes. He just sent them back. Why? They're empty. Well, that's impossible. I know the film is inside the temple, the sidebar. Well... Look. Uh, I don't know what to say. I put it in there. I know I put it in there. Amos, let's get down to cases. Now, if you put it in there, it would be in there when he received it. Well, I don't know what to say. I'm positive. Since that... you didn't put it in these glasses, where did you put it? Where? What became of the film strip? Well, this is a model number 18. I, I, I may have... Did I make up another 18? Uh, just let me look at my book. I, I may have... Uh... Ah, wait. Here. I see it. I know what happened, Mr. Trent. Yes? It only proves what I'm trying to tell you. I'm... Getting tired. Careless. Uh, just tell me what happened. It was the day before. I made up two pair of glasses, identical frames, and I somehow put the strip in the wrong one. Which one was it? I made them up for a Professor William Barstow. Well, get them back. I can't. Why not? He's dead. Well, that should make it easier. Why? They didn't bury him with his glasses, did they? How can I get them? There is nothing to it. You go up there, ring the bell. Tell whoever answers you're the optometrist. Do you understand? Just say there was a mistake. 
You gave him somebody else's glasses. Uh, yes, but don't and you... It's clean and it's simple. It sounds good. Why, it's even true. Yes, uh, what do you want? How do you do? Uh, my name is Crandall, Amos Crandall. Uh, I'm the optometrist. Uh, that is, I have my shop a few blocks from here. Well? About a week before he died, Professor Barstow had a pair of glasses made in my shop. And? You, you know the ones I mean? Yes, I know the ones you mean, the new ones. Well, would you happen to have them? And suppose I did. I would like you to give them back to me. You would? Why? Well, you see, they're the wrong ones. Are they? Yes. I gave Professor Barstow another gentleman's pair by mistake. Did you? Yes. I would like to have them back. And here are the ones intended for the professor in exchange. I, I I know that he won't be able to use them. It's just that we have to keep these things straight. We do. Well, yes. May I have them? No. No. You may not have them. Good day to you. But, but madam, I... Sir, if you don't leave the premises immediately, I shall telephone for the police. Now, what does go on in that optometry shop? Obviously more than meets the eye. Our hero, Amos Crandall, known as Doc, is evidently employed by foreign agents. But does this woman know that? How? And why should she refuse what appears to be a most reasonable request? For enlightenment, I suggest the second act, shortly. What do doctors recommend to avoid constipation? These days, doctors stress the importance of fiber in the diet. Food fiber that helps the system regulate itself naturally. Metamucil is the laxative made from natural fiber. No chemical stimulants. So for occasional constipation, doctors recommend Metamucil more often than any other laxative. The way to overcome constipation is the natural way. But if not nature, Metamucil. Read, label, and follow directions. You don't have to stoop to doing tedious lawn trimming chores when you can trim without bending or stooping with a weed eater grass trimmer from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you that now you can take advantage of special prices on weed eater string trimmers, like the lightweight clippy trimmer designed for smaller lawns. Get it for just sixteen eighty eight. Or if your needs are greater, choose the weed eater snippy with adjustable assist handle. Now just twenty four eighty eight at participating True Value Hardware stores and home centers, and say that Pat Summerall sent you. Mildred Velez of the South Bronx remembers working with a Vista volunteer. One of the things that we did do is enter three abandoned buildings and start to cut. This was done purely on a volunteer basis. There were no monies. There was only spirit and hope that it could be done. One of the buildings is ready to be opened in two weeks from now. People can start moving in. Somebody started something here. A contagious idea. That hopelessness is just a place. A perfect place for just giving up. Or for rebuilding from the ground up. One of the other things that the Vista volunteer did was uh, a lot of counseling and English and math. Some of the kids have obtained their high school diploma and now going to college. And I have to give the credit to the Vista volunteer for doing that. Join Vista. It's a year that will last you forever. Call 800-424-8580. A public service of Vista, this station, and the Advertising Council. According to 
the ancient philosopher, the bravest may be those who have the clearest vision. Perhaps. Today, we can say that the clearest vision may be achieved by those who have the best-made spectacles. We are dealing here with a maker of eyeglasses, but evidently, he's not seeing things too clearly at the moment. I told you I would notify the police if you continue to make a nuisance of yes, yourself. but madam... Do not you... call me madam. I am Mrs. Maggie Trainer, the late Professor Barstow's housekeeper, rest his soul. What I'm trying to say is that I, I gave him the wrong glasses... I merely wish to exchange them, that's all. That's all? Absolutely. Sir, what is your game? My game? In the first place, you're lying. Now, why would I lie about a thing like this? You tell me. Why do you say I'm lying? You claim you furnished him with the incorrect pair of glasses. Yes, that's true. Well, how would you account for the fact that he came home that night with a spring in his step and a twinkle in his eye? Unusual for him, I would say. And so I inquired of him, Professor, is this a holiday? No, he replied. Well, I pursued the matter further. What is the cause for this rejoicing? Do you know what he said to that? Do you? No. He said, I have never seen things so clearly. Have you had a revelation, I asked. No, he replied. I have finally obtained a pair of decent spectacles. Well, now, sir, what do you say to that? Well, I... I... I'm only trying to tell you that... Yes, and you are trying very hard. But regardless, I cannot believe you. Well, why would I want to lie about a thing like this? You search your own conscience for the answer. Now, please. You appear to be a reasonable woman. I am not a reasonable woman. I am a loyal woman. There is taking place an inventory and an accounting of all his property. The man died without a chick or child of his own. Until the state decides on how it's all to be disposed of, I am the guardian. Not so much as a single speck of dust on his desk shall be touched until I am relieved of my responsibility. Now, this discussion has endured much too long. Yes, but you don't understand. I need those glasses. Very well. Proceed in the proper manner. Present yourself at the Metropolitan Bank and Trust, which is the executor of the estate, and register your claim. But I... I am sure they'll consider your request, provided, of course, it's legitimate. Uh... Now, sir, I've taken up far too much of your time, haven't I? What do you mean she won't give you the glasses? She says, go to the bank. On the face of it, Mr. Trent, it's a very legitimate position for her to take. Do you want me to go? Uh, no. But it's the only way. It isn't the only way. I don't understand. Oh, you don't have to. This doesn't concern you. I told you before, I'm getting too old for this. Don't say that, Amos. Nobody gets to be too old. Uh, well, what, what can I do? I'll keep on being young, Amos. You must see the spot you'll be in. If I had gone upstairs. First, you ask to retire. Which starts all kinds of bells ringing. Second, a thing like this. Well, people have been eliminated for less. Mr. Trent, you wouldn't do, do anything like that. In the ordinary way, we never do. Our hands are always clean, Amos. We just make sure certain documentation concerning your past activities is made public. Nature takes its course. Now, you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? 
What do you want me to do? What exactly what you're doing now, Amos. But do it better. What are you going to do about those glasses? I've already told you. It doesn't concern you. I wish you'd stay home today. It's very cold and blustery. How can I just stay home, Emily? I, I can't just give up on everything and retire. Retire doesn't mean giving up. It means... Well, it should mean that you're ready for something new. Yes, but I have an obligation to my customers, to the neighborhood. Oh, well, somebody was here to make glasses before you came on the scene, dear. Somebody will be here after you're gone. Now, look, Emily, when the time comes, I'll retire. And when will that time come? Well, do we have to talk about it all the time? No, we don't have to talk about anything. I'll just read the comments. Uh, Emily, Oh, forget I... it. No. I, I just wish the... Oh, well, look, well, why is this name familiar? What name? Barstow. Oh, I remember you made him a pair of glasses, and, and a little while later he died. Yes, but so what's in the paper? Well, it says here there was a robbery. His housekeeper, Mrs. Maggie trainer reports that the place was entered last night while she was out uh, visiting her sister. Was anything taken? Well, I would assume so. She's going over the list right now with the police. Now you're sure there was a break in, Mrs. Trainer? Positive, Lieutenant. How do you know? Well, the rear window was open when I returned, and I always make sure to lock it before I leave. Uh, I see. Well, you promised me a list of the stolen articles. Where is it? Lieutenant Schwartz, it seems only one thing was taken. His eyeglasses. His eyeglasses? Yes, sir. His brand new pair of eyeglasses. Oh, were they, uh, were they of any special value? Made of gold, perhaps? Oh, no, no, sir. They were made of horn. Or, or is it some kind of plastic they use today? And, uh, that's all, all that was missing? Yes, mm. Lieutenant. Mrs. Trainer, are you saying that a thief broke into the house last night... And of all the things he could have taken, and there are many valuable historical objects, he settled for a pair of ordinary eyeglasses? Oh, but these weren't ordinary glasses. No? No. Something's rather strange about those glasses, Lieutenant. The gentleman who made the glasses was here just the other day. He wanted them back. Why? Why don't you ask him? You you see, Lieutenant Schwartz, I had given them to Professor Barstow by mistake. As well, Mrs. Trainer tells me that Professor Barstow claims they were the best pair he ever had. Well, that's possible, but they weren't his. I had made them for someone else. I I didn't think she would make such an issue of it. Uh, well. Sorry I bothered you. I, I was only trying to straighten out a mistake. I'll I make the other gentleman a new pair, Lieutenant. The, the money involved isn't worth fussing about. Yes. Well, I'll let you get back to work, Mr. Crandall. Beats me. Why would anyone want to risk a break and entry which can get him seven years just to steal a pair of glasses? I wouldn't know. Anyhow... Whatever it is, what can we do about it? <laughs> Even if some nut for some crazy reason did steal them, how can you hope to recover a pair of ordinary eyeglasses? Oh, it's Mrs. Uh, Trainer. Do not pretend you have forgotten my name, Mr. Crandall. What can I do for you? You can return Professor Barstow's glasses. Now, where are the glasses? 
I don't know. The other night, you broke into the professor's apartment and you stole them. What? I did not. Then you had it done for you, which comes to the same thing. Madam, this time it is you who is causing a disturbance. A legitimate one. And this time it is I who can call the police. Mr. Crandall, the fact is you have a reason for stealing those glasses. I want them back. Mrs. Trainer, I give you my word I know nothing about it. Why is it so important for you to have those glasses? Uh, please. What is your motive? Indeed, sir, who are you? Who am I? Well, you see my name on the window. I will run this thing down, sir. I will go wherever it takes me. Depend on it. <laughs> seat taken, sir? Uh, no, no, no. Hmm. It's a nice day, hmm? Yes, yes it is. Uh, all right, Amos. Tell me. That woman, the housekeeper. Yes? She's trying to make trouble. What kind of trouble? She insists that I'm involved with the robbery. The police came to see me. Uh, and, uh, what happened? Nothing. They think she's not quite... And she comes by almost every day. She accuses me. She insists. She's going to get to the bottom of things. Yes. Well, all right. It doesn't have to be a problem. We can take care of it. A most efficient gentleman, this Mr. Trent. When he decides to take care of a problem, we know it'll be done in a most effective way. However, there's always a first time for everything, and it usually occurs in the third act, which arrives here in just a few minutes. You know how it is with an oyster. Man or nature introduces a grain of sand inside the shell, and the resultant irritation may produce a most lustrous pearl. We have something of the sort here. We have a very smooth espionage operation that's just humming along. And a woman named Mrs. Maggie Trainer is now about to become an irritant. What shall be produced here? Well, won't you come in and sit down, Mrs. Trainer? <laughs> I'm sorry to say we uh, haven't been able to find the glasses. Oh, bother the glasses. Who cares about the stupid glasses anyhow? Uh, but, Mrs. Trainer, I thought but that I you... I have been out doing your work for you, Lieutenant. Now, you pay attention. Why should Mr. Crandall be so desperate to recover those glasses? Uh, uh, Mrs. Trainer... We must first establish that they were stolen to begin with. Ah, so the wind blows in that direction, does it? Well, I am sorry, but uh, we have to accept that responsibility. Well, then accept this one. Uh, for the sake of an argument, assume I am sane. He is desperate, as I said, to get those glasses. Why? Now, uh, Mrs. Trainer. You appear to be a woman of the world. Mm. And where will this approach lead us? <laughs> well, no, I appeal to your, your sophistication. Now, we have here a pair of spectacles worth at most uh, 30 or $40, huh? dollars Thirty-two fifty tax included. I have the bill. Well, then you prove my point. To the best of my knowledge, you haven't made one. Well, it is this. We have quite a bit of crime in the city. Oh, the understatement of the year. Now, people complain, and with justice, that there isn't enough of a police presence on the streets. 
Now, let's have a sense of proportion here. Well, would you rather I spend my time trying to unravel the mystery of a, a $32 pair of glasses or that I should devote my efforts to more serious crime? Well, huh? How do we know how serious a crime this one may be? Oh, Mrs. Trainer. Who is Mr. Amos Crandall? What is he really doing? Chew on that question for a bit, Lieutenant. We shall discuss it further. Good day. Yes, uh, Mr. Cheswick? I'm a police officer. Uh, may I come in? I'm sorry. I, I won't take the chain off the door until you prove it. Well, uh, here are my, my credentials. Uh, are you from the local precinct? Uh, yes. Well, let me telephone them first and ascertain if indeed there is an I.W. Schwartz. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. One can't be too careful. The stories one hears... And besides, that there was a burglary in the building just recently. Oh, how do you know? I read about it. Well, had you heard anything that night? I'm always hearing things in the night. Mm. Your neighbor across the hall, I mean, uh, your late neighbor. Oh, yes. Professor Barstow. Yes, yes. Splendid human being. Mm. Mrs. Trainer. Oh, the housekeeper. Yes, yes, a splendid woman. In a physical way. Uh, well, uh, s some days ago, a man rang her bell. Now, they had an argument in the hallway. Now, I wonder, uh, being so close by, if you might have heard it. Oh, you can hear everything that goes on in this building. The walls are paper thin. Now, did the man sound excited or upset in any way at all? Oh, he sounded both, and in every way. Why he made a stupid little mistake seemed like a matter of life and death. Huh. What did he say? Well, it wasn't so much what he said. It was the way he said it. There was torment, despair. And what word am I looking for? The agony in his voice. Agony? Exactly. Agony. I tell you, I'm still not fully recorded. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cheswick. Oh, I'm uh, happy to perform a citizen's duty. What can I do for you now, uh, Mrs. Trainer? You could start doing what you paid for. I understand you spoke to Mr. Cheswick. Uh, yes, ma'am. You wanted, of course, to gain another perspective on the hallway interview I had with Mr. Crandall. And? Well, you were right. He was extremely disturbed. And therefore? Well, I'm not sure. Sure. The fact that I have a disturbed optometrist is hardly grounds for an investigation. I spent my own money. I hired a private detective. It cost me $350 for two days' work. Well, off the record, what did you find out? Amos Crandall has been in business at the same address for some 27 years. He's a reserve officer in the Army. He served in World War II and Korea. In Korea, he was a prisoner of war for almost three years. Hmm. And what else? That's all. Well, that's a lean return for all that money. I know. And I to continue at these prices. You have the facilities, the manpower. But I don't have any reason to do it. Oh, come, Lieutenant Schwartz. You mean you're not even curious? Oh, it's 
the police lieutenant. Uh, yeah, Mr. Crandall, I was just passing by. I thought I'd drop in. Is there anything I can do for you? No. No, but I was wondering, is uh, there anything I can do for you? What do you mean, Lieutenant? I'm not sure I know. Well, then why... Mr. Crandall, this business of the glasses and the robbery in Professor Barstow's home... You know, something doesn't feel right. I, I'm not sure I follow you. Well, that's my problem. I don't know where I'm headed. I'm floundering. I, I know there's something here, but I don't know what it is. Mr. Crandall, are you in any sort of trouble? Trouble? Why would I be in trouble? Oh, I, I don't know. All I'm saying is... If you are, I'd like to help you in any way that I can. I made a mistake, the kind of error that anyone could make who deals with the public, and I, I just don't know why it's been blown completely out of proportion. You don't? No, no, I don't. And that's the truth. Well, then I guess that'll just have to be the end of it. Yes? Amos, you all right about that uh, Maggie Trainer? Was I? I've been tailing her. She keeps running back and forth from the police station. She's going to keep muddying the waters. Yes. Poisoning the well. Uh, who, who's that on the phone, Amos? Oh, Emily, it's a it's, it's, uh, customer. She has to be taken care of, Amos. And the sooner, the better. Do you... Uh... Do you really think so? Oh, darling. I just want you to know she won't bother you anymore. Goodbye, Amos. How can he say that? She, she'll bother me for the rest of my life. What did you say, Amos? Huh? Oh, nothing. You see, you're, you're starting to talk to yourself. You're working too hard. People calling you at night? Well, why can't these things wait till morning? Emily, it was very cold there in the winter. Amos? It was a very wet kind of cold. It would seep inside your bones. It would freeze the marrow. What are you talking, Amos? Well, it was a long time ago, but I remember every day, every hour, every minute. There was no escape from the cold. No place that was warm. Unless... Unless you were willing to do certain things. Certain secret things. Do you understand, Emily? Do you understand? Yes. You have no idea what a man will do for a cup of hot soup. Weak, watery, tasteless, but hot. Well, that was the beginning. And I don't remember everything. I, I don't want to remember. All I know is it was very cold. Uh, excuse me. Amos, where are you going? For a walk. In the cold? The cold doesn't bother me anymore. Emily, no more. Oh, oh, what are you looking for, Amos? It, it's your revolver. Yes, dear. Oh, no. I won't let you do it. I won't let you go out. I'm sorry, dear. Look, I'm your wife. You can't have any secrets from me. Darling, you can only share the life we've had together. Not the one I led before we met. Please, Amos. Emily, believe me. And trust me. Oh. 
you. Uh, please, let me in. Have you taken leave of your senses? Mrs. Trainer, listen. A man is coming here to kill you. What? Now, get inside quickly. What is this fairy tale? Ah, it's true. Well, then why don't we call the police? I have to kill him myself. Well, what are you talking about, kill? Uh, the, the eyeglasses. It's tied in with things that you wouldn't understand. But it's dishonest. Oh, yes, yes. How dishonest. About as dishonest as you can get. It has to do with helping the enemies of your country. Oh? And does it have to do with when you were a prisoner of war? Yes. I thought so. Did you perhaps collaborate with the enemy? Yes. I, I couldn't help it. Listen. He's here. He's climbing into the next room. Who? Oh, run. Where? Out the front door. Run quick. But I... Now. Amos. Amos, it's you. Yes, Mr. Trent. Well, you didn't have to come, Amos. I said I was going to do it. I know. But I won't let you. You won't? You'll know what can happen to you. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm so cold all the time. So it's all over, Mr. Trent. If that's the way you want it, sure. The police are coming. Don't move. You think you can shoot me, Amos? If I have to. No, Amos, you can't. I can look in your eyes. You can't move. You're scared. Don't reach for your gun. Why not? You're not going to do anything about it. Tom! Eddie! A man's climbing out that window! He's got a gun! Don't let him escape! Are you all right, Mrs. Trainer? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you, Lieutenant. Well, thank you, Superintendent, Mr. Cheswick here. My dear, I heard someone ringing your bell as if it were a call to judgment. He shouted, someone was coming here to kill you. So I didn't wait. I called the police. Mr. Crandall? He's dead. This one killed him. Oh. It was an espionage ring. I know. How do you know? He told me. He saved my life. Does the truth have to be published? Well, in cases like this, the truth is always what'll do the least harm. Well, could he just be a man passing by who tried to save someone's life during a robbery? Well, I, I don't see why not. You better get inside, Mrs. Trainer. It's a very cold night. Yes. The cold. That's how it began. And that's how it ended. In the cold. Cold, heat, hunger, thirst. We are a sophisticated society, more or less, and so we are prone to forget how these primal urges are the driving forces of mankind. We look for complex motives. Psychiatrists and sociologists go on for volumes on the twists and turns of the psyche. And yet, there are those who would destroy the world for a bowl of soup. Hi, I'm Julia Amato with a really good reason to see your white Westinghouse dealer right now. 
big $25 or $50 factory cash refunds on top quality white Westinghouse appliances, top and front load washers, frost-free refrigerators, dishwashers, and electric and gas ranges. The factory cash refund offer ends May 10th, so hurry into your white Westinghouse dealer today. Take advantage of great appliance values and get a big $25 or $50 factory cash refund. Now is the time to white Westinghouse your house. Got a special house? Get a special house paint with a very special offer. Buy four gallons of Olympic Overcoat and get another one free. Overcoat's the house paint that's tested tough to take on the weather. So it protects your home season after season. And now you can get one gallon free when you buy four gallons of any Olympic product. Even the number one selling stain. So hurry to your participating Olympic dealer today. Buy four gallons and get another one free. Special offer ends May 31st. Pause for a moment and listen to your shoes. They may need to be cat's pawed. Hey, stop! What do you think you're doing? We just need heels and soles. How could you throw us out in the street when we've been so good to you and your feet? New shoe prices out of sight. Look for the sign of the cat and make your tried and true shoes as good as new shoes. With Cat's Paw, Heels and Soles. Take us to the shop. Come on and get us Cat's Paw. Good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the Serta Perfect Sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper, perfect sleeper. Buy it's a healthy investment in yourself. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. You've often heard what the Frenchman said... Plus ça change, plus ça la même chose. The more things change, the more they remain the same. You've heard it so often that by now it's become conventional wisdom. However, it isn't exactly true. Because things don't remain exactly the same. There is a difference. Very small, perhaps, but it's oh so vital. Indeed, as another Frenchman said, leave la différence. Now, sir... I must inform you, you are about to undergo an illegal change. I understand. You are, in effect, going to give up your present consciousness, personality, psyche, and for all I know, even your soul. And you shall become an entirely different human being. Are you aware of that? Yes. And you still wish to go through with it? Yes. Prepare the circuits. <laughs> mystery drama, The Headhunters, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Gann and stars Len Cariou. I'll be back shortly with Act One. which is a little more than a century from now. There have been vast, sweeping changes, but most are external. There are more mechanical things, and they are of a complexity undreamed of in our day. There is more efficiency, and once again, we have expanded the frontier. At the end of the last century, the average American never dreamed that his grandchildren would be able to jet, he didn't even know that word, to Paris, London, and Rome. But now his great-great-grandchildren can actually go on tours to Venus and Mars. But having said all this, it must also be stated 
that the basic problems, as always, remain the same. Hello, Dad. Erna, come in. Sure you're not busy? Never mind. You're having dinner. Join me. Well, Dad, I don't want to put you to any trouble. What trouble? All I have to do is dial. Well, that's right. I forgot. What do you have? That doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it'll taste synthetic. You back to nature people kill me. Please, Dad. We are the wave of the future. Honey, you're the wave of the past, and it receded long ago. Here we are. Now, you mean it's better to go to some hole-in-the-corner food store, haggle with some shifty-eyed hustler for some beef, some bread, some fruit, vegetables grown Lord knows where, under who can tell what conditions? But, Dad, at least it's natural. Less than a hundred years ago, all meat came from animals. But what was an animal? A cow, a pig, a sheep, but a convert. I know that argument. A device for transforming feed grains into beef, pork, and mutton. Today, we do the same conversion without the animal. And all those millions and millions of acres are now used to grow grains for fuel. But it doesn't taste as good. Ah, that's just a conceit for you BTN trendies. I defy anyone to tell the difference. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. We really shouldn't argue. Huh. Where did I go wrong? If your mother were alive, it would have broken her heart. Well, let's eat supper. Daddy. Hey, what's this? Oh, Daddy, I'm so unhappy. How could you possibly be unhappy? You're going to be married next month. No, I'm not. What do you mean you're not? Well, Robert. What about Robert? He, he said he doesn't want to marry me. Robert's in love with you. Oh, Daddy. Look, you and Robert, you both passed the stability tests. It's been definitely established that your degree of mutual attraction registers high on the scale for love. Not anymore. What do you mean, not anymore? Well, Robert just said he had fallen out of love with me. So he went to be retested. And it's true. People don't just fall out of love. All I know is that he did and I'm miserable. Yeah. Well, honey, I wish there was something I could do. You can't do anything. There is something I could say, but I'm sure you don't want to hear it. What's that? You're better off without him. Hello, Robert. Oh, Mr. Stearns. You here in your official capacity as a police officer? But I'm not a police officer. Mm -hmm. Let that be your conceit. I'm a member of control. And would you explain the difference? Robert, I just want to ask you a very simple question. What happened? <laughs> I don't really know what did happen, Mr. Stearns. I just woke up one morning and I was no longer in love with you. Just like that? <laughs> You fall in love just like that, therefore you can fall out of it the same way. And that's what happened? Yes, that's what happened. I guess that answers my question. Dad, you're just in time for dinner. I hope you dialed it. That's going to be my secret. I will say... It's nice having you around the house again. Oh, uh, by the way, I I spoke to an old friend of yours today. I should say an ex-friend. I bet it was Robert. You shouldn't have done it. Honey, I was just curious. I know you were only personally curious, but I'm sure Robert thought you were using your position to pressure him. I only wanted to know. Besides, well, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't? He's got someone else. Oh. A girl. Believe me, she's older than she looks. By the name of Arlene Delva. Delva? That name seems familiar. You mean you know her? No, I, I'm just trying to think. Well, the brassy, blonde, empty-headed type is what he really goes for. You were right. I am better off without him. Then can we say, all's well that ends well? I guess so. Well, shall we try dinner? Smells delicious. 
Mmm. Tastes great, too. Tell me, did you um, really dial it? Or did you spend all day scrounging for the stuff and making it? <laughs> You'll never know. And how did you spend your day, Mr. Controller? Mm-hmm. Controlling, as usual. And whom did you control? Let's see, what did we have? Um, oh, a thief. There are still thieves? Oh, yeah. They crop up. Why would anybody want to steal today? Nobody really has to do without the necessary things. True. But it seems to go deeper. So we changed him. And um, we had someone with homicidal tendencies. We changed him, too. We had someone with sexual identity problems. And uh, we did the indicated changes there also. Dad, all my life I've been hearing this shop talk, especially when Mom was alive, about changing. Does it really work? Oh, yes, it does. You mean you can make a, a complete change in someone's personality? We can. It started more than a hundred years ago. Only then it was called conditioning. You could use the power of suggestion to make people want to buy certain products. With audio-visual sensations, that would create a favorable attitude. It all went on from there. The techniques were refined, and now we're at the point where instead of changing just an attitude, we can alter an entire concept of life. I don't know if I like that. It can only be used by the state. Even so. And then only by a special court of justice warrant to cover a specific criminal case. I still don't like it. Well, the old way of treating criminals, which was based on punishment, was hardly better. A man committed a crime and you put him away in jail for a number of years. When he was released, he wasn't always changed. It was a waste of everyone's time. Now we simply change him into a law-abiding, normal citizen. Like old time? You remember he used to do the work around the place for us. He was a man who had actually murdered his wife. And he was changed into a fellow so kind and gentle that I could trust him to be with you and Mother. You remember. Yes. And he was everything you say. But I recall there was something missing. What? In his eyes. Well, there was nothing wrong with his eyes, as I recall. Yes, there was. They didn't sparkle. <laughs> Hello, Robert. Anna, what are you doing here? Don't worry, Robert. I won't embarrass you. <sighs> Anna, I, I, I really don't know what we have to talk about. There's nothing at all for us to talk about. When people who are like us say goodbye, we've said it all. <sighs> well, I, I don't want to seem rude, but... Are I, you I, expecting I... her? Well... I have no intention of staying. I just came here to do one thing, Robert. Come closer. Well, what is it? I want to look at your eyes. My eyes? What for? I want to see what they're like. <sighs> you know what they're like. I knew what they were like at one time. Erna, what is this? Just stand still, Robert. It's all I ask. Let me look into your eyes. But there's no point. Well, for old time's sake, please humor me, Robert. Well? All right, Robert. Thank you. Now, Erna, darling, that's absolutely impossible. Daddy, I looked into Robert's eyes. They were the same as old Tom's. You're making an extremely subjective judgment. I know what I saw. But it's absolutely impossible. Is it? And it's absolutely illegal. Are you telling me it couldn't happen? Someone couldn't have changed Robert. It can only be done under the proper government auspices. As I told you, you need a court order. Private citizens cannot do it. Why not? Private changing is illegal. It's the most serious crime anyone can commit in our society. Are you telling me no one's ever tried it? Besides, the investment in equipment is incredible. It would be absolutely beyond the reach of even the richest private citizen. Somehow, it can be done. And everybody knows it's being done. You hear rumors. But there are no facts, darling. I know how deeply you felt about Robert. I guess you can't face the fact that he simply fell out of love with you. If that were the fact, 
I could face it. Why do you deny it's a fact? Because I looked into his eyes, and they don't sparkle anymore. Hello, Carver. Busy? Through for the day. What can I do for you? The uh, computer still alive? About to shut her down. Problem? I don't know yet. I'd uh, I'd like a scan. Mm. Do you have your warrant? You owe me a favor. Okay. It's very likely nothing at all. Can you do it now? Mm. I'll put in my bypass so that our little extracurricular activity doesn't register and will not uh, appear on the duty roster. Mm. Now, what do you want scanned? The name is Delva. Uh, who? Delva, I think. Well, does he have a first name? Probably, but I don't know it. Well, could save a lot of time if I had a reference point. He has a daughter named Arlene. That's all right. Let's see if that singles him out. Well, we got him. Ah. What do you want to know? First, does he have a criminal record? Let's ask. Stand by. Delva, Maxima, one arrest. Find out what for. Charge watch. Head hunting. Did I hear that right? Head hunting? That's exactly what you heard. Head hunting. That's exactly what we heard, too. Headhunting. Now, what's this? Do you mean that in this most civilized of societies, they practice the most barbaric of ancient customs? Really, sometimes you have to stop and ask yourself just where is the human race going anyhow? Well, I know we're going to come back for the second act. civilization at the beginning of the 22nd century. We had a brief glimpse of some of the highly modern techniques of living. We saw how the world of a hundred years from now had left us just as far behind as we had outpaced the world of a hundred years ago. However, an extremely alien, archaic, and uncivilized word has just entered the conversation. Head hunting? You heard what our computer friend said. What happened? Let's find out. Charges dismissed. Lack of evidence. And that takes care of that. Anything else? No. No, I guess not. So much for the twinkle in his eye. What was that you just said, Daddy? I did some very private investigating for you. Why? So I could lay something to rest once and for all. What's that? I made a private computer scan on a free citizen. Daddy! And I did it because you seem to feel that Robert has been changed. Well, it's just an instinct. Never mind. Thing. You said he had a new girl, Arlene Delva. What about her? The name, Delva. I knew I heard it before in a criminal connotation. And I thought maybe this could have been a criminal change. An illegal change made for private purposes. Aren't you the one who claims these things are impossible? You were right. Criminal changes are the biggest problem we have. And you can see why. Now remember, you can't say a word about this to anybody. Well, you had grounds for suspicions. Why couldn't you do an official scan? Because if it turns out I'm wrong, my neck could go on the block. And I was wrong. It was illegal for you to do an unofficial scan. Hmm, but I'm a controller. Sed quis custodiate ipsos custodis. <laughs> What's that? Ancient Latin. Who shall guard the guards themselves? Look, I did it for you. 
But you broke the law. Sometimes the only way to enforce the law is to break the law. And where does it end? This is a world of accommodation. Do you understand? Sometimes you have to stretch a point here and there. Certain trusted people should have the right to uh, take certain shortcuts. Should they? Otherwise, nothing will ever get done. Nah, I know it's bothering you. You do? You ask me where it ends. Honey, it has to end when a controller cuts a corner here and there. Not for the good of society, but for the good of his pocketbook. If you know what I mean. Yes, Daddy. I never took a dishonest dollar. I never will. I know that. I thought I'd run down the possibility that somehow your Robert could have been illegally changed. But it didn't happen. Oh, yes, Daddy. Should we have some dinner? <laughs> it does taste better when you cook it yourself. <laughs> you see? Don't breathe a word outside. I could be ruined. <laughs> Carver, hello. You owe me one. I know. It's uh, a private change. Oh, I, I don't like to do them. I don't like to ask you to. Then ask me for something else. I can't. I can only ask you. Why me? Because only a top guy could handle it. Carver... I let myself get talked into doing a change once because there was a very strong humanitarian angle. Well, that is why I'm asking you again, Stearns. There is a very strong social aspect to this one. Is money going to change hands somewhere? Well, Carver? Well, uh, you don't have to touch a nickel. Is there a headhunter in back of it? There is a fantastic plus for society involved here. You didn't answer the question. You and I, we both know headhunting is illegal. But we also know in a quiet way, the government has to use headhunters. Who is he? Just happens to be a coincidence. But it's the guy you wanted to scam. Delva. I see. Then he is a headhunter. Uh, yeah. You and the computer were playing a little game of charades with me. Uh, no, no, Stearns. He was acquitted. The fix was in. Does our boss, the great Chelsea, know about it? Chelsea is the one who fixed it. Uh, on orders from upstairs, naturally. Mm -mm. Count me out. Delva is vital to the government. He's found some of the best people we have. People we can't do without. Did he also change my daughter's boyfriend, Robert? Well? Uh, yes. We let him have that one. And what great social good was involved in that? None. But every now and then, you have to have something for yourself, too. I'll consider this conversation off the record and forget it ever took place. You're annoyed because of Robert. But he wanted to be changed. He wanted to fall in love with Delva's daughter. Stearns, if you could choose a father-in-law, would you pick a millionaire headhunter or just a nice guy who's a cop? I said let's forget it. We need the change. We need this guy. Which guy? A fellow named Pruitt. He's an automotive engineer. He is a genius. So, why not let him alone? The whole Middle West grain crop can be destroyed by a blight over the next three years. Don't we have enough agricultural experts? No. Now, you know the story there. Half the stuff we grow to turn into fuel, and the other half we eat. Carver, I don't like it. For the last 50-odd years, nobody has gone into agriculture. Now we got this problem, and we're stuck. We need more than just a, uh, an agriculturalist. We need a genius. And this guy, too, it's the man. How do you know? We have Delva's word for it. Delva? I know how you feel about headhunters. But without them, where would we ever find these guys? Oh, 
I still don't like it. Well, I don't like it either when they're allowed to feather their nest, but this is a social necessity. You know, of course, we're breaking the law. Certain trusted officials can't be permitted to take a few shortcuts. Then society as we know it would cease to exist. What if the great Chelsea or some of the other brass decides to pop in for a surprise inspection? I think you'll find that everybody suddenly decided to go out of town for one reason or another. What's the matter, Dad? Hmm? The matter? Well, you seem fidgety. No, I'm I'm okay. I uh, I have to go to the office. On a Sunday night? There's a report I should have studied, and I. Uh... Well, I have to discuss it first thing in the morning. Okay. Erna, you know the talk we had? <laughs> Which one? Um, how did it go in Latin? Dipsy something? Oh, Chris Custodiate Ipsos Custodis. Who will guard the guards themselves? What about it, Dad? There's a lot to that. An awful lot. More than I ever thought. <laughs> We're ready for you, Stearns. Uh, this is Arnold Pruitt. Mr. Pruitt, I'm a controller. My name is Stearns. How do you do, sir? My specialty is changes. What we're doing is extra legal. Have you been so informed? I have. It cannot be officially condoned because it would set a precedent in which the government could change people who have not committed crimes. I understand. I tell you this to inform you that you have no recourse... Should you regret this later? Yes. Very well. First, I must test my circuits. You'll hear noise and see lights, but you'll feel nothing. Good. Let me tell you what is going to happen. Right now, you are an automotive engineer. In 15 minutes, you should be an expert on agriculture. Do you know anything about agriculture? Oh, only in a very general way, and just those basics that uh, may have been covered in elementary science courses when I was starting school. As you know, your brain is a series of circuits. These now are filled with all sorts of knowledge concerning automotive engineering. Yes. We must change the contents of those circuits. We have placed the entire science of agriculture into the banks of this computer. We shall then feed them into your brain. Uh, will I forget everything about engineering? You will be at the same point in agriculture as you are now in engineering. It will be as if agriculture had always been your life's work. Mr. Pruitt? Uh, will I... Will I be giving up something then? You'll be giving up somebody. The Arnold Pruitt, who was the engineer, he will become somebody else. <laughs> But engineering isn't just something that I know. I love it. It's so many things. Memories, feelings. The first motor I ever put together when I was a kid, fixing the family. Our school, winning all the prizes, graduating summa cum laude. How can you take all these things away? By replacing them with other things that will be just as real, just as vital. We won't merely fill your brain. We will also alter your psyche. Is that what I want? I don't know. No one should be placed in a position to make a decision of this kind. But you placed yourself in this position. It is important, isn't it? Mm. They say I'm the only one who could solve the problem of blight. The country needs me. We can't live without the grain crop. Why is there blight? What are we doing wrong? That's what you would have to find out. It's a challenge. Do you realize what a challenge? Yes. An entire nation depends on the skill and resources of one man. How can I turn it down? How can I possibly back out now? Mr. Stearns. Yes, sir. Change me.
As simple as that. Change me. Change every nerve, every thought, every memory. Change my mind, my psyche. And in doing all that, change my soul as well. Evidently, there will be cataclysmic changes in Act 3. But let us make all of them. Don't you change anything. We shall return in just a few minutes. of new words have come into being during this most surprising century. Mankind has not only made the most sweeping changes in his environment, he has also made the most unbelievable changes in himself. And seemingly, there is no end to them. Change me, Mr. Stearns. Once again, Mr. Pruitt, and for the last time, I feel it only right to tell you. You'll be giving up all your memories. We must alter your entire person. Mr. Stearns, you said you would replace my present memories with others. How can you do that? How can I remember things I never experienced? It doesn't matter whether or not you've undergone certain experiences, just as long as you believe you did. Well, Mr. Pruitt, do I activate the changing mechanism? Change me. Try Relax, Mr. Pruitt. Carver, open the Genesis circuit. In the beginning, Mr. Pruitt, there was a void. It was without form and without substance. There was an all-encompassing darkness. And then there was a cry. And a burst of light. It's a boy. And then the world is filled with sounds, all sorts of sounds. Steps, windows, doors, voices, especially voices. Tender voices. He's so beautiful, Frank. So beautiful. He is going to be somebody when he grows up. Of course, dear. President. No. No, he's really going to contribute something. What do you suppose? Something concerned with the earth. Do you know why? Because the earth is eternal, and all that is good for mankind must come from the earth. Yes, the earth. Arnold Pruitt, little Arnold Pruitt, you shall make the earth be fruitful and multiply its blessings for all mankind. You do know what he was talking about, down deep in your subconscious. From the very first moment of his life, a child knows what is being said all around him, and he understands it deep in his psyche or soul. Arnold Pruitt, we are what has been made of us from the moment of our birth. The child walks through the woods with his father. See how this earth is black, rich with nutrients. See how everything grows here. How beautiful. And the ideas. And the facts. Do you remember what you said in a history class in high school? Uh, I, 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 of course. And how proud you were? The history class. George Washington. First in war. First in peace. First in the hearts of his countrymen, and and, and, and? and did you know that George Washington was also America's first agriculturist? He was. That's right. He was America's first scientific farmer. Yes, yes. He introduced methods of fertilization and crop rotation. People. Aren't you working too hard? <laughs> oh, no, not hard enough. Why don't you take out that nice girl, Betty? <laughs> we don't have anything to talk about. Why should the young men and women have a great deal to talk about? <laughs> she 
she doesn't know the first thing about agriculture. She's really very bored. Well, take her out anyway. You really shouldn't stay home all the time. You know, the, the basic thing is yield per acre. Really? In places in the world where people are starving, if you can increase yield per acre by even 5%, you're not just talking about a statistic. You know what you're talking about? No. Human life. An increase by even so much as a single bushel means you can save another human life. The National Bureau of Fellowship. Yeah, look at this list. An unusual mind. Do you know who said that? The Secretary of Agriculture. He made the presentation. An unusual mind, he said. A genius. I always knew. I knew it from the day he was born. Thoughts, dreams, hopes, ideas, experiences. Everything changes inside you on the court. Everything. You know the facts. Yes. That will come on when you're older. Growing things. The science of growing things. It possesses you. It is now a part of you. You are now living for one thing and one thing alone. Agriculture, Mr. Pruitt. Mr. Pruitt. Two turns on the third circuit. Carver, is the new environment ready? In his office, his home, his laboratory are all set up. His new assistants are standing by. Here goes everything. Is there a copter waiting? Yes, it's outside. Get him into it. Right. Have him back at home before he recovers. No problems. Stearns, you've never done a better job. Did you hear the news, Dad? About the blight? Oh? What about it? It seems that two weeks ago, this agricultural scientist, Pruitt, I think his name is, Anyhow, he thinks he knows what causes it. Yes? What? Well, it's a technical rigmarole, but the gist of it is that he has a way to beat it. Well, that's what counts, right? Hello, Mr. Stearns. Who are you? My name is Maximus Delva. Yes? I owe you some money. For the change you made? You don't owe me anything. Don't be foolish. We don't have anything to talk about. You don't like me? That's right. Because I'm a hate hunter? True. What harm do I do? This business of change, it's wrong. Even when we do it to protect society from the criminals, it's wrong. We take away a man's free will. And suppose his free will makes him decide to be antisocial. Then let him pay for it. The way it was done in the old days, with prisons and the scaffold. Maybe, maybe that's the way it has to be. Well, I did not come here to argue. I came to offer a deal. I'm not interested. Mr. Stern, you and I could rule the world. I'm still not interested. I have an instinct for people who can be changed. You have a talent for doing it. Right now, we have been performing for the benefit of others. If you'll excuse me, Mr. Delvin. But now, why don't we turn things around? Why don't we make change so they accept certain ideas and support certain political positions? You get the drift of this. Mr. Stern. Yes, and it's drifted right by me. 
Thank you, sir, and good day. Carver, we can work out a case against this Delvin. Why? Why? He's up to his ears in illegal changes. I know that. Now, maybe the government winks at some here and there, okay, but the bad that Delva suggests outweigh the good. Well, what do you want to do? I want to ask Chelsea to begin proceedings. <laughs> don't. What do you mean, don't? Chelsea's and everybody upstairs, they're all in it with Delva. I don't believe it. <laughs> How do you think the Delvas of this world exist, huh? In the beginning, you need them. So you make an accommodation. But one thing leads to another, and before you know it, everybody's in bed together. Well, not me. Huh? Don't rock the boat. Rock it? If I have to, I'll sink it. I'm going to start proceeding. Please don't. Don't make me invoke control regulation 460. What are you talking about? You know what 460 is. It authorizes any control officer to arrest another member of control whom he suspects of antisocial activity. You're crazy. No. You are... What are you doing? You know what I'm doing. I am invoking 460. Guards, Mr. Stearns is under arrest. Get your hands off me. Don't fight, Stearns. We want to help you. We want to change you. Change? Not much. Just smooth out a little wrinkle in your psyche. The scruple wrinkle. The one that doesn't let you play ball. <laughs> now, once we get rid of that, it's clear sailing. I have a right to appeal to Chelsea. I have already got Chelsea's authorization. If you want to read it. Carver, don't do it. Please. Prepare the circuits. <laughs> changed. If I am, it's a change for the better. I feel wonderful. As if anything, everything is possible. What are you saying? I have a feeling we're going to be rich. On a controller's pay? And you're going to get married. Oh, who would want to marry me the way I am? But you don't always have to be the way you are. Someone who keeps swimming against the stream. I can't help it. You know who keeps swimming against the stream? Salmon. And when they get there, after the most incredibly excruciating journey, you know what they discover? They've only gotten there to die. Daddy, I can't help the way I am. And I can't change. Don't say that. Honey. Anyone in this world can change. Or be changed. And he should know. Did he change her? Probably. For her own good. Notice how everything that people do for us is for our own good. Even when they kill us, they usually justify it by saying it was for our own good. I'll have something good and highly benign for you when I return shortly. mechanism is man. How complex a machine. How many, oh, an infinite number of parts are constantly meshing one with the other to produce even the most simple gesture. And what happens when we try to readjust the delicate balance? What happens when we attempt to change the psyche? 
the truth is, we shall produce a different human race. And will it be better or worse? If we live long enough, we'll find out. Our cast included Len Cariou, Tracy Ellis, Earl Hammond, and Paul Tripp. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I guess she drove off and up toward the house. I didn't hear anything or bother to look back. Because my eyes were fixed on the lake, I still saw the swans swimming. Swans which, according to my mother, I had never seen. under a willow tree, and I stared into the clear, still water. Oh, so clear, I, I could see way down to the bottom. And there, at the bottom of the lake, I saw, I saw something that flooded me with feeling, rage, impotence, and despair. I heard myself scream. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... that makes simplicity a grace. Thus spoke Mr. Johnson. He was merely one of many fascinated by the human countenance. Be it breathtakingly beautiful or incredibly hideous, there can be mystery, even magic, to a face. It can inspire the brushes of artists, the pens of poets. The face, that certain face, can be a mover of mountains, the source of heroic actions, the object of of noble crusades. On the other hand, it can also inspire causes far less worthy. Let me get this straight. You're telling me he didn't kill her? Why can't you believe me, Sergeant? He's got a record a mile long. He's a cheat, a liar, a con man. But he isn't a murderer. Can you think of a better suspect? Yes, Sergeant. Who? Why, me, of course. Our mystery drama, The Innocent Face, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Roberta Maxwell. I'll be back shortly. of dreams, but not surprisingly, most dreams are beautiful in their simplicity. The urban sophisticate longs for the tranquility of a summer in the country, and the small town daisy yearns for the glittering lights of metropolis. As always, the most desirable heavenly place on earth is, it seems, a someplace other than where we happen to be. But it is not our point, however, to argue the differing view of paradise. We only request that you, the listener, remember that even paradise had a snake. Shipping department, one moment, please. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Gilmore. Now, the reason you haven't received your order is because it hasn't arrived... The reason it hasn't arrived is because there's a dock worker strike, and it's still sitting in the ship's hold. Well, uh, yes, I'm trying to explain that, Mr. Gilmore, but, uh... Hello? Are you still on the line? How do you like your first week on the job, Wanda? 
Why, he hung up on me. That's the third time in an hour. I guess I'm not used to people being so unfriendly. Quite a switch from, um, what's that town you're from? Pulaski Pond. Yeah, Pulaski Pond. Iowa, right? Arkansas. Whatever. I still say you shouldn't work so hard. But, uh, well, I want to work hard. I don't want to be in shipping forever. Hey, Wanda, the way you look, you won't have any trouble getting ahead. What do you mean? Come on. You know your face is your fortune. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. No. Well, what's so great about my face? I'm not even pretty. Who's talking pretty? You've got something different going for you. I don't understand. Yeah, something completely different. And I'll tell you this, you won't be in the shipping section for very long. Take my word for it. Excuse me. Yes, what is it? I'm busy. I was wondering if you could tell me where to find Mr. Sanders' office. I don't know my way around yet, and... Why do you want to see him? He's the vice president of this company, isn't he? Yes, I am. You're Hartley Sanders? Is that package for me? Yes, sir. It was sent downstairs by mistake. Oh, thank you, Miss... uh, Miss... Beasley, sir. Wanda Beasley, shipping and receiving. You, uh... You must be new here. Two weeks, Mr. Sanders. Yes. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a minute. Yes, sir? I... I like you, Miss Beasley. But you don't even know me. I I, I like your face. My face? (laughs) There's something about it. There is? It's friendly, open. Yes, it's it's the kind of face I'd like our clients to be greeted by when they walk in here. (laughs) How would you like to work for me? I already do. No, not in the basement. I mean here, upstairs. As my, uh, my receptionist. In this beautiful office... Oh, but I can't type or do shorthand. All you have to do is answer the phone and smile, Miss Beasley. Smile? Are you interested in the receptionist's job? Very much, sir. I'm extremely interested. May I help you? Uh, yeah. Is, uh, is Sandy in his office? Mr. Sanders is tied up in a meeting. Do you have an appointment? No, I was just in the neighborhood. I thought I'd drop... Hey... What's your name? Wanda Beasley. Well, Wanda Beasley, it it would appear that I have some time on my hands. Uh, you suppose you could find it in your heart to help me? Help you? Yeah. Let me take you to lunch. You want to take me to lunch? You seem surprised. It's just that I've never been... I mean, no one's ever asked me to. You really want to take me to lunch? Why? Because it's lunchtime. I don't even know your name. It's Harper. Eugene Harper. Look, Mr. Harper. Uh, Eugene. Very well. Eugene. Where I come from, a man doesn't go up to a total stranger and ask her out to lunch. Oh, why on earth not? Because. Because I still can't believe why you want to take me out to lunch. All right, Wanda. If my first reason wasn't enough for you, I'll give you a second. It's because I like your eyes. I... I'll get my coat. Then after graduation, I spent two years working at the Pulaski Dry Cleaners. But why am I telling you all this? Maybe it's the wine. I don't know what's gotten into me. I've never had wine or anything alcoholic during working hours. I'm sure I must be boring. No, no, not at all, Wanda. It's refreshing to meet a a young woman who obviously has life before her waiting to be experienced. What a lovely thing to say. I get the feeling you're still a bit uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? Do I make you nervous? No. Wanda... Maybe it's the wine giving me the courage to say this, but nobody as good-looking as you has ever given me the time of day. You think I'm (laughs) good-looking? Don't take my word for it. Half the women in this place have been staring in your direction ever since we arrived. 
There's that lady in the corner table. The lady with the red hair. What? What What lady? Where? The booth. Over there in the corner. I don't see anybody. She must have just left. Anyhow, she couldn't take her eyes off you. I thought for a minute she knew you or something. Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> In any case, I'm sure the reason people are staring, if indeed they really are, is because we make such an attractive couple. We do? Oh, look at the time. I'd better be getting you back to the office. Yes. I hadn't realized how the time had flown. As long as we're on the subject, uh, what time do you want me to pick you up on uh, Saturday? Saturday? Drive down the coast might be nice. You really want to see me again, Eugene? Now, listen, Wanda... I only do what I want to do. Is 10 o'clock in the morning too early? I have to admit, California has beautiful weather. It's wonderful. Look at the water, how it sparkles. <laughs> if, I, if I didn't know better, I'd swear you'd never seen the ocean before. But, Eugene, I never have seen the ocean before. Are you for real? There's no ocean where I come from. How much longer till we get to San Diego? Oh, 20 minutes or so. I can't tell you how thoughtful it is of you. Do you want to show me the sight? Hey, just wait till you see the surprise I have in store for you. A surprise? <gasps> what is it? Oh, it isn't a what. It's a where. And if I told you that, it wouldn't be much of a surprise, now would it? You still won't tell me where we're going? Haven't you figured it out yet? Up ahead, what is that? It looks like some kind of toll plaza. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the border. The border of what? <laughs> How many do you know? That's Mexico? The border of Mexico? Let me guess. You've never been to Mexico either? No, never. For Pete's sake, Wanda, where have you been? I already told you. Pulaski Pond. <laughs> Yeah, it's not very glamorous, is it? This is a foreign country. I'm standing inside a foreign country. <laughs> you really get a kick out of it, don't you? A month ago, I'd never been anywhere. Now look at me. First California, now Mexico. Yeah. Well, in any event. Hey, listen, why don't, why don't we turn off the main street? I think it's awfully crowded and noisy. Exciting. But, well, hey, why don't we try this street? It's, uh, it's nowhere near as crowded. What a charming way to arrange shops. Partially enclosed. Is this in any way like the bazaars of the East? I've read a little about... Uh, Wanda, come on, down this way. I guess it doesn't matter. Persia or Mexico, a marketplace is a marketplace. Here's the place. What an interesting little store. Oh, look at all those lovely embroidered things. Senorita, senor, you would like a blouse such as that? It's very beautiful, but very expensive, I'm sure. Oh, no. I can give you a good price. What are those toys hanging up there? Oh, so, you like the piñata, senorita? I've always liked piñatas myself. Are they for decoration? They are for celebration. Well, Wanda, actually, they're animals fashioned from paper mache filled with candies, uh, little toys. How do you open it? I smash it with a stick, Signorita. With a stick? If, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, this shop specializes in piñatas. Oh, see, si, Senor. I was hoping to purchase one, but, uh, gee, I don't see any in the right color. What color did you have in mind, senor? Oh, uh, yellow. Hmm. Well, if the senor would be so kind as to wait, I will see if perhaps I can find the color he wish in the bag. Thank you. What a nice lady. Yeah, yeah, she's, uh, she's very accommodating. Well, Wanda, you see anything you like? Lots of things, but I really can't afford any. Oh, no, this is a date. Surely you don't expect to pay for anything on a date. I've seen the way you've been admiring that, uh, that lace blouse. Uh, let me buy it for you. Oh, no, Eugene. It wouldn't be right. Hey, it wouldn't be right for you not to get it when I know you would look really lovely in it. 
You really think I'd look lovely? Oh, no question about it. Ah, ah, I see you, uh, I see you had a yellow one in stock after all, eh? It is very fortunate, senor, very fortunate indeed. The very last one. Well, I must say it is a pleasure doing business with you. Oh, but no, senor, the pleasure is mine. It's been such a lovely day. I think it has been the loveliest day of my life. All these souvenirs and this beautiful blouse. You didn't have to buy me so many. Oh, no, no. It was nothing, Wanda. Could, could you do me a favor? Of course. Wanda, do you, do you think you might possibly carry all that junk through customs by yourself? I, I don't know. I, I suddenly, I, I, don't, I don't feel very well. I, what is it? What's wrong? No, it's, I'll be okay in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, you, you go ahead, okay? I don't understand. Why can't I just wait as until you... As a favor, would you just do as I ask? Sure, of course. Whatever you say, Eugene. Are you a citizen of the United States? I certainly am. I've just moved to Los Angeles from Arkansas. Anything to declare? Uh, I suppose I do. This thing called a, a piñata. Yeah. Of course, this lovely blouse. Don't you think the embroidery is exquisite? Anything else? This leather keychain, this doll, and uh, this carved hair comb. Thank you. Go ahead. Wanda, you were just terrific. I was? You did it. Did what? I got to admit for a second I was worried, but you just sailed right through. What? What are you talking about? Eugene... Why do you look so relieved? And before I passed through customs, why did you seem so nervous? I wasn't nervous. Almost uneasy. Now, Wanda... No. Wait. I want to know. Tell me, Eugene. What is it I'm supposed to have done? Please, tell me. She asked him a question, but it would seem that the answer is not exactly trembling eagerly on his lips. And just a word to those of you who are convinced that the situation is obvious and plain as the day. If things were as simple as they appeared, there would be no genuine necessity for a second act, which waits with further explanations when I return. journey, according to the French philosopher, begins with a single step. Monsieur Voltaire, of course, had no idea how aptly his view would sum up the situation of Wanda Beasley. In this particular case, her first step was taken when she approached the front of the line at the customs desk at the United States border. As far as she knew, the only items she had to declare were the usual collection of bright souvenirs that an average tourist might select. A lovely way to end the trip. However, in this case, it would seem that the journey is just beginning. Why do you look so relieved, Eugene? And why were you so nervous when I went through the border check? You're imagining things, Wanda. What were you so worried about? I wasn't worried. No? I, I just wasn't feeling very well. You look fine now. Look, I really don't want to stand around in this crowd and debate my health. Could we just talk about it in the car? Could it have been something you asked me to carry for you? Calm down, will you? This toy? This paper mache piñata? Why were you so insistent about getting this particular one, Eugene? What's inside, Eugene? Candy. I don't believe you. What's inside this piñata? I told you. Eugene, in the name of heaven, it's not drugs. Please say it isn't drugs. It isn't drugs. Then what? Look, let, let, let's go back to the car and we'll talk about it. So now we're back in the car. Will you please tell me? First, lock the door. 
Okay, now, in the glove compartment, you'll find a hammer. Did you get it? Yes. Okay. Now, I want you to take the hammer and smash open the piñata. No. I want you to do it, Wanda. I'll have nothing more to do with I this. I said smash it open. Don't ask me to do anything else. Do it. Oh, it's... It's candy. <laughs> candy, after all. Well, unwrap one. What is this? <laughs> Don't you recognize a diamond when you see one? Uh... Diamond? Yeah, an uncut diamond. There ought to be a few dozen mixed in with real candy. A few dozen? <laughs> ah, the look on your face. I'm a smuggler. I'm a diamond smuggler. Come on, don't get so uptight. How could you? It's against the law. It's a crime. Look, Wanda, I, I owe certain people some money. There are people who aren't very understanding about not being paid. You still had no right They to... would have no qualms about hurting a person. These people would hurt you? Yeah, well, perhaps it's better that you don't know. I've involved you enough as it is. Why, Eugene? Why did you involve me? Your face. My face? It's unbelievable. I've never seen a face so... So what? So honest. I knew you could just breeze through customs. So you used me. I should have known. Why else would a man as attractive as you ask somebody like right, me? At first, at first, all right. You could say I used you, but now... Oh, please. Don't say any more. Now listen to me. But you don't have to worry. I'll keep my mouth shut. That's what they say in the movies, isn't it? Wanda, I'm trying to tell you something. After after getting to know you, I... I well, you're different from other women I've met. Different? Yeah, I, I need a woman who's, who's going to be a good influence on me. To, that woman is you. You, Wanda. Me? Yeah, I... I suppose I... I must have known it the, the moment I walked into the office. You did? Yeah, the way you were talking on the phone. The, the smile in your voice. Oh, oh. Wanda... Wanda, I... I admit my weakness. It's... It's gambling. I... I just can't help myself sometimes, but... Perhaps with, with the right woman standing behind me, I... I, I could change. Uh, is it possible you are that woman to guide me to get me back on the right path? Here are the copies of the contract you requested, Mr. Sanders. Oh, no. thank you, Miss Beasley. And the invoice from that missing shipment out of Taiwan. Excellent. Uh, Miss Beasley, have I told you what a fine job you've been doing these past months? <laughs> must be the typing class I've been taking nights at the college. I admire your attitude. The desire for self-improvement is most commendable. Nice of you to say so, Mr. Sanders. As a, just one thing. Yes, sir? I am not trying to pry, but I understand that you've been seeing Eugene Harper quite frequently. That's right. Well, I, I just feel I ought to, to warn you that uh, Eugene is... Well, he, he has a reputation. A reputation for what? Well, let's just say that sometimes he gets in over his head. A man can always change, Mr. Sanders. Is that what you honestly believe? All he needs is a good influence. <laughs> You said this was the last time. It is, Wanda. Last time it was another one of those piñatas. The time before that, the diamonds were inside the bottle of aftershave lotion, and no, now... Just go on through. What if I get caught? You won't get caught. Now, what if that agent recognizes me? He sees thousands of people a day. How's he going to remember you? Just go ahead, please. Mm. All right. Are you a citizen of the United States? Y yes. You purchase anything in Mexico? 
Just this doll. Yeah, the doll. All right. Next. Wanda, I promise this is absolutely the last time. I've heard that before. This time I mean it. Really? Look, now now just just walk up to the counter and, and show that agent your honest face. I uh haven't seen you in a long time, Eugene. I uh I've been busy. That's why I was so happy when you called to ask me to meet you for dinner. Yeah, well, we have to talk, Wanda. It's about Mexico. You want me to go through customs again. Come on, I haven't done that for a month. I meant it when I told you we, we wouldn't do it anymore. Then you paid off your debt. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's wonderful. It's what I hope for. You can start a life with a clean slate, a right. clean conscience. Right, absolutely. That's uh, that's why we won't be able to... We uh, won't... What? We won't be able to get together that often. Uh, oh. Things have been getting pretty hectic and... Uh, you don't need me anymore. Wanda, honey, that isn't true. Then when will I see you again? Sweetheart, I'll call you. Just a minute. Wanda, what, what are you doing here? I I waited for you to call me, Eugene. Wanda, I... I waited one week. I waited another week. I, I thought maybe something happened to you. No, no. I'm sorry. If I woke you up, I... Look at the door, honey. Oh. I, I, I can explain this, Wanda. What's to explain? A woman's voice coming from... Another room. Eugene, I asked you who was at the door. It's nobody. That's right. It's nobody. I didn't mean that, Wanda. It's all right, Eugene. Somehow, I forgive you. Oh, what do you want? Your name is Sherry Sterling? What if it is? I just wanted to make sure you... are one of those cosmetic ladies, I don't buy. But I'm not selling. All right. All right. Is that your sample case? Well, you, you can come in for a minute, but that is it. But, uh... Thank you. This apartment, it's beautiful. Yeah. It is nice, isn't it? The furniture, the balcony... It must be very expensive. I wouldn't know. I don't pay for it, if you know what I mean. Oh. So, what kind of makeup do you sell? With my color hair, I need just the right shade of... Your work. hair? I don't remember when I've seen such an unusual color of red. It's natural, if that's what you're thinking. No. That's not true. Well, if you're going to insult me, you... I... I do remember where I've seen that color red. The restaurant. Long ago. What are you talking about? That first date. That very first date. You were in the restaurant. You were that woman with the red hair sitting at the table in the back. Oh, wait a minute. You've been his girlfriend all along, haven't you? Do I know you or something? My name is Wanda. Wanda? Does it ring a bell? Wanda, I'll give you a hint. We share a mutual friend, Eugene Harper. Eugene? Oh, uh, hey, yeah, yeah, I I thought you looked familiar. Uh, yeah, the restaurant, I remember now. But what do you want? Admit it. You have been his girlfriend all along, haven't you? We see each other. And this fancy apartment, the expensive clothes you're wearing, he pays for it all, doesn't he? What if he does? Only he can't afford it on his salesman's salary. So he has to resort to illegal activities. It's none of your business. It is my business. I love you, Jean. You? <laughs> What's so funny? How could anybody love you, Jean? I mean, hey, he's all right for some laughs every now and then. But love? I could be a good influence on him while you... Oh, yeah. I can see it in your face. 
What do you see? Oh, you got a face like a loyal little puppy dog. You'll ruin Eugene. I don't have to listen to this. That's why I have to do something. Get out of here. That's why I have to stop you. Or do I have to throw you out? And I only know of one way to stop you. What? what, what what's that? What does it look like? Well, that, that's a gun. Yes, it is a gun, isn't it? What are you going to do? I thought that was obvious. I'm going to kill you. I don't believe it. I'm quite serious. Over a guy? You'd kill me over a guy? Not a guy. Eugene. But he's not worth killing anybody for. He's nothing. If you'd said anything good, that you loved him, that you cared about him in any way, I would have turned around and walked out of the door. But what you've just said, it proves to me that you're just using him for what you can squeeze out of him. Look, oh, we can talk this over. No, you, you, you'll never get away with this. I'm not sure if I can. No, no, wait! We began our tale with diamond smuggling, and suddenly we've arrived at murder. A deed dispatched by none other than hard-working, good-natured Wanda Beasley. This would only go to prove that even the mildest sheep in the flock can go astray. And while this particular little lamb claims she doesn't care whether or not she is apprehended, we'll see if she takes the woman's prerogative and changes her mind in Act Three. By this time, the police have already been summoned to the scene of the crime and discovered the body of Sherry Sterling. Obviously, it should only be a matter of time before someone is apprehended for administering the fatal gunshot. The question is, who? Never fear, however, for according to the great Mr. Webster, other sins only speak. Murder shrieks out. Of course, how loudly it will shriek and in exactly which direction... We are just about ready to discover. Open up. It's the police. Hey, hey, come on, you guys. It's three o'clock in the morning. Eugene Harper? Yeah, what do you want? You're under arrest. Arrest? You must be crazy. What's the charge? Suspicion of murder. Murder? What murder? Are you, that is, were you acquainted with a Miss Sherry Sterling? Sherry? Dead? How? <laughs> that look a shock. It's almost believable. No, wait, wait, wait. Let, let, let me get this straight. Sherry is dead, and you think I killed her? Give it up, Harper. We found the gun. You mean she was shot? You ought to know it was your gun. That's impossible. You guys are out of your minds. Let's go. This is insane. We'll talk about it downtown. I'm not going anywhere. This is this is some kind of frame-up. Make it easy on us and come along quietly, Harper. For the last time, I didn't do it. The gun is registered in your name. I already explained that. It was stolen about a month ago. It's a convenient coincidence. I'm telling the truth. Why won't you believe me? Look, things probably won't go too bad. They might lighten the charge to second-degree murder. A good lawyer could get you out with a minimum. I didn't do it. I couldn't. I was nowhere near her apartment the time you said. That's why we keep going in circles. You won't tell us where you were. No, I was... I was halfway across town. Doing what? Where? I... I can't tell you. Let me tell you what we have here so far. Sherry Sterling was your on-again, off-again girlfriend for the past two years. The murder weapon was registered to you, and to add to your troubles, you were unable to account for your whereabouts at the approximate time of the murder. Ah, for it's almost 10 a.m. How about giving us all a break in confessing? Because I already told you, I have nothing to confess. Harper, do you have a visitor? Wanda. 
Eugene. You came. I I can't believe it. Why not? Well, after everything I did, everything I I said, and and now on top of everything. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. What do you have to be sorry about? It's... It's my fault I'm in here. That's not true. I appreciate your loyalty, Wanda. Heaven knows I don't deserve it after the way I've I've treated you. You're wrong. You have no idea how wrong. I didn't kill her, Wanda. I know. I swear I didn't kill her. Of course you didn't. Wait a minute. Are you you saying you believe me? That's why I'm here, Eugene. No, No matter how bad it all looks, you... You actually believed me? At first I was numb. I didn't know what to do, even if I wanted to do anything. But I've come to do the right thing, Eugene. You couldn't possibly have killed that woman because... Because I was with you. No, that's not it at all. Yeah, 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 it's perfect. That's just exactly what I was hoping you'd say. I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to clear your name. Okay, now here's what the story will be. We had dinner at your place. We took a little drive uh, out to the beach. We, we came back and, and, and we watched some TV. I, I, I didn't get home till one, maybe two in the morning. But the truth is... Yeah, I'll tell you what the truth is, honey. I was losing $5,000 in a poker game over at the marina. Wait a minute. Are you saying that you really do have an alibi? Uh, you think any of those fine, upstanding citizens are going to implicate themselves in an illegal gambling operation? Sure. Wanda, the trouble with you is that you actually believe the best in people. You want to know who saw me there last night? A county judge, two state senators, and the managing vice president of an investment firm. Yeah, it isn't very likely they'd want to destroy their careers, but more to the point, they'd show their appreciation in a decidedly negative way. Not to mention the, uh, well, let's call it the cartel that runs the game. I'd be dead the minute I walked out of here. Are they the same people who... Never mind, never mind that now. What I need is an alibi that isn't going to kill me. A real joke, isn't it? The truth is deadlier than a lie. The truth, Eugene, is going to save you. Yeah. Yeah, you just keep that expression on your face when you talk to Ross. You look real sincere. But I'm not. And Wanda, if you can get me out of this mess, I'll be grateful forever. You will? I promise. I'll try to make it up to you. I've really learned from this experience. You have? Yeah, I'll turn over a new leaf. I'll, I'll, I'll change. You'll help me, and, and we'll do it together. Don't worry. I know exactly what I'll tell them. Oh, please, uh, sit down, Miss Beasley. Thank you, Sergeant. Mr. Harper, he's been held here for a crime he didn't commit. Oh, is that a fact? He's an innocent man. Oh. He couldn't have killed Sherry Sterling because he was with me the entire evening. Uh, with you? Yes. I cooked dinner at my apartment and then we took a drive up the coast highway and then we watched television and then... Well, if this is true, why didn't he tell us before? Because... Yes? Because he was protecting me. Protecting you? Hmm? Why are you doing this? I don't understand. Do you know the penalty for perjury? Perjury? If you took an oath in a court of law and tried to convince a jury that Eugene Harper is Sir Lancelot, <laughs> they'd laugh you out of here. But it's true. No, no. I'll tell you what the truth is. Now, you're a nice, idealistic young girl who's in over her head. You come to the city and you meet a guy who's polished and charming. He takes you out a few times to a couple of fancy restaurants and some places you've never seen before. During this entire time, he's still seeing his old girlfriend. But by this time, it's too late. You take what crumbs you can get because you've convinced yourself that you're in love with him. And now, Miss Beasley, due to some misguided notion of romantic loyalty, you're willing to lie to save him. I'm not lying. Miss Beasley, I've been a cop for 15 years. I can look a person right in the eye and tell whether or not they're being truthful. Without a doubt, 
You are probably one of the worst liars I've ever met. Sergeant, I'm telling you... And the reason you're such a terrible liar is that you don't get very much practice. I am not a liar. The guy's got a record a mile long. Petty theft, mail fraud, insurance scam. But he isn't a murderer. Can you name a more likely suspect? Yes, I could. Who? Why, me, of course. You? (laughs) Oh, that's good. That's very good. Listen to me, Sergeant. It's the truth. I killed her. Oh, now, of all the... She was no good for him, don't you see? I certainly do. So I went over to her apartment, and we got into an argument. That's when it happened. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, what about the gun? The gun? Well, that's simple. I borrowed it from the glove compartment of Eugene's car about a month ago. I forgot to tell him. Why? I thought I might need it. Ah, oh, now you don't expect me to believe any of this, do you? Didn't you just say that you could tell when a person was lying and when they were telling the truth? Now, if it were just your voice, Miss Beasley, maybe you'd be halfway convincing. But there's something more, something that proves to me that you aren't capable of an act of violence. What are you talking about? <laughs> your face. My face. I have never seen such open, unconscious, downright uh, innocence in a face before. But I'm not. You wouldn't hurt a fly. I killed her. I killed Sherry Sterling. Now, I don't doubt that you wanted to kill her when you found out about the two of them. We all kill in our minds one time or another. It wasn't just in my mind. You don't have any real evidence, do you? I... Uh, No. You see, wishing a person dead and then finding that it has become a reality, that can make anyone feel guilty. That's not it at all. It's natural to feel even partly to blame. But you'll get over it in time. No, I won't. Hopefully you'll even get over Eugene Harper in due time. Never. Never. Frankly, you deserve better. (laughs) You're a nice girl. How can you say all these things to me? You barely know me. You're innocent, Miss Beasley. It's written all over your face. Good morning, Mr. Sanders' office. Certainly. I'll give him the message. And you have a nice day, too. Goodbye. Well, how are you this morning? Just fine. Mr. Sanders, I have a message for Uh, you. Never mind that right now. There's, uh, something that I've been wanting to... Well, what I mean is... Yes, Mr. Sanders? I'd like to say how much I admire you for the way you, you... You tried to stand up for Eugene Harper during that awful trial. It didn't go as badly as I thought it would. But the way you were willing to sacrifice yourself... With the reduced charges, he could be out of prison in eight or nine years. It might be a learning experience for him. You know, I've... I've never been so moved. Maybe all things do happen for the best. I don't think I'll ever forget the way you looked. I beg your pardon? Your... your face. My face? It was just beautiful. Oh, it was? Uh, Miss Beasley, I I was wondering if perhaps you'd care to join me for lunch? That would be very nice. Oh, good. And, uh, one more thing, Miss Beasley. <laughs> May I call you Wanda? To those of you without a romantic bone in your bodies, let me assure you that Miss Beasley and Mr. Sanders are most definitely on a first-name basis by now. And if you're wondering where justice enters the picture, a simple reminder that justice is, after all, blind. 
Not all the time, of course, but just often enough to keep those scales forever most precariously balanced. This story was about the magic of a face. A chance, arbitrary kind of magic which bestows a valuable legacy to every person. There are the quieter but equally priceless treasures of character, innocence, kindness, honesty, and countless other virtues which can make their imprints on a face. We each see what we wish to see. And conversely lies the true secret of human interaction. For we all are different things to different people. It's simply a matter of your point of view. Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Paul Hecht, Ian Martin, and E.V. Jester. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Memory, the ability to recall... For some, it is total. For most of us, a patchwork of light and shade. We can't always remember the things we want to. The things we would like to forget, we so very often can't. The most unpleasant, we lock in some secret room of the mind, hoping to close them away forever, till some chance key unlocks the door and lets the skeleton of remembrance loose to rattle its bones and haunt us again. What are you doing, Barry? I'm trying to sketch what this guy might look like without the beard and the dark glasses. There. Would you recognize him, Meg? Yes. It's that face you always draw without knowing you're doing it. Who is it, Barry? Who is he? Oh, someone like Lazarus, who seems to be risen from the dead. mystery drama, Out of the Past, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Yeah. I suppose we all have a secret known only to ourselves, except for whoever took part in it. It could be anything, something we are ashamed of, because at the time it made us ludicrous, or that we are afraid of, or some precious moment of love, or tenderness, or happiness that existed only in the moment when it was. Or, most disturbing of all, it could be something quite dreadful, which lurks in the back of the mind all the time. Something that we have tried to bury and refuse to remember. Hi, this is Barry Jordan's machine. I'm not here at the moment, so please leave a message and phone number, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Don't forget to wait for the beep. Barry, this is Herb Peters at WVKD. Where are you, out bashing a few at tennis? Look, as soon as you feel you got time to make a living, I got a job for you. Call me. You know the number. Hi. Anybody home? Just me. Who's me? Oh, never mind that. Who are you? Barry Jordan, all-American husband. Oh, don't I know it. And I'll settle for being just your wife. How was tennis? I was sensational. Oh, did you win? Come on, you can't have everything. I was ambulance chasing. Sir, I'll have you remember, I am a corporation lawyer. So, did you chase any corporations? <laughs> As one working stiff to another, don't knock my profession. Yeah, well, at least yours is gainful. Well, so is yours. Yeah, when I sell a canvas for work. Oh, which reminds me, you have a job. Oh, what? 
Herb Peters called you from WVKD. It's on the answering machine. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'd better call him right away. Uh, while you're at it, I'll rustle up some dinner. What are we having? Din don a la ennui. Well, what the heck is that? Turkey again. <laughs> I told you we shouldn't buy such a large bird for Thanksgiving. Herb Peters, WVKD. Herb, it's Barry. What's up? Oh, Barry. A uh, few days work in the courtroom if you want to go for it. Oh, brother. How long? Well, how long is the trial? Who knows? This one shouldn't be worth more than a few days, but news figures this one's pretty hot, so they'll stick with it to the bitter end no matter how long it runs. Are you interested? Well, sure, but... I know it's hack work, and it's a bore to a serious artist, but the pay is good. No, no, it isn't that. But Meg and I were planning on taking off to New Hampshire for a ski week. Oh, I didn't know you skied. Oh, I don't, but Meg does. I was going to paint. So what? There'll be snow there next month, uh, the month after. Yeah. Only then, Meg won't have any time off. Well, that's what you get for marrying an emancipated woman. You gotta live their lives instead of your own. Hey, now, now, now. Wait a minute, buddy. The only reason Meg works so hard is because she wants me to have some time for some serious painting. So make some easy TV dough, and before you know it, both of you will be free to do whatever you want to. Yeah, I guess. Ah, uh, okay. What's the case? Fergus armored truck robbery. Got away with something over a million dollars in small bills, mostly either unmarked or out of sequence. There were four guys. Two of them got killed in the caper. One spent half a year in the hospital before he recovered. Oh, what happened to the fourth guy? Never found him. Or the money. Look, Barry, suppose we have breakfast tomorrow here at the studio at 8.30. There'll be time to brief you before you get to court. The trial won't begin until after the lawyers have picked the jury, so probably won't be till after lunch. Deal? I guess. I don't know why. I, I got a feeling I could regret this. Okay, see you tomorrow morning, 8.30. It always comes when you don't want it. Oh, you need any help, honey? No, no, darling. I had everything cut up and prepared. It has to simmer for a while. What are you doing? Mm, I'm just looking through an old sketchbook of yours. That stuff? Mm -hmm. That's all discarded. I meant to throw it out. Nothing you draw, sketch, or paint ever gets thrown out. Genius. Oh, come on. Well, look at this sketch, for example. I don't even know what it is. It's a boy you sketched. You... Wait, wait a minute. Here. In, in, in the midst of this crowd. Here, in, in this one, too. And Barry, I've seen it in others. I don't know who he is, but his face seems to fascinate you. Well, he's got nothing to do with anything. He's just... Part of the crowd or the audience. Oh, but it's such a haunting face, Barry. That great wide brow with the strange kind of indented temples. Those staring, accusing eyes that, that look so much bigger than normal. Because the lower part of his face is so pinched and mean. Oh, it, it's a frightening face. Yeah, it's all in the eye of the beholder, darling. Oh, not something like this. That's why you're... A great artist, Barry. You have to be recognized. Why, you can turn a person outside in so that it's not his face you're looking at, but a picture of his soul. I love your praise, darling, but I'm really not that good. Oh, yes, you are. Well, just as long as you think I am. Uh, tell me, what did Herb want? Oh, he, he has a job for me, a new trial. No TV cameras, so they want some graphic art to use on the TV report. You know, courtroom drawings. You're going to do them, aren't you? Well, it could cut into your vacation time. Oh, never mind that. You're all that matters. Meg, this is illustration work. It's it's not uh, it's not for eternity. It could buy you enough recognition so you can paint for eternity. Come on, you do it. It's important. Now let's eat. More coffee, Barry. Oh no, thanks, Meg. That was super. <laughs> Are you as good a lawyer as you are a cook, honey? No complaints yet? Well, how was your day in court? Oh, a bore. Not that I spent much of it there. I didn't impanel a jury till nearly three in the afternoon. But you had to hang around. No. I still don't see why this case is supposed to be such a hot item. Well, what's it about? Well, it's kind of a dead issue. You see, a couple of years ago, four guys heisted a Fergus armor truck. The gimmick was they had an inside man. 
What do you mean? Well, one of the Fergus guards was assigned to stay inside the truck. Uh -huh. The doors could only be opened on his say-so once he was convinced the coast was clear. Well, so how was he implicated? I'll tell you, three guys in stocking masks jumped the outside guards, and according to the testimony of one of them before he died, the inside guard opened up for one of the masked robbers who then double-crossed him and shot him. Oh. Then, one of the robbers turned on his two buddies, shot them, and cleaned out the negotiable cash and hefted it to a waiting getaway car. How much did they get away with? A million, give or take a buck or so. Two million? No, no, only the ringleader got away. Well, wasn't somebody driving the getaway car? Yeah, he was found down by the river in the abandoned car, shot through the head with a bullet. Incidentally, that came from the same gun that killed the inside guard. So this ringleader... The killer. He got away. Yeah, along with the million. It's never been found. Mm. One of the two robbers he shot lived, and that's what the trial's all about. He, he spent six months in the hospital recuperating and a year and a half on bail pending the trial. And nothing new has happened in all this time? I mean, they didn't turn up the money? They have no new leads? To who was the main guy in all of this? Well, that's it. That's, that's what I can't figure. I mean, why bring it to trial? I could hazard a guess. You could? Yeah. Maybe the plaintiff has copped a plea. He's ready to identify the main guy and lead them to the money. The insurance company is probably putting on some heavy pressure. <sighs> Sorry you had a wasted day. Uh, it wasn't wasted. I spent most of it in Courthouse Square. The sun was just perfect. I knocked off three watercolors and some pencil sketches. A couple of them are not too bad. Hmm. Let me see. <laughs> My kindest critic. Here, I'll get my sketchbook. Let's look at it in the living room, okay? Why not? I'll bring a little coffee for both of us. Yeah, that'll be nice. Oh, uh, put the cups on the table for a minute. Yeah, first, here we are. How does this one grab you, huh? Very. That is beautiful. Oh, thank the architecture of the courthouse and that fantastic morning light. I, I think I think I sort of caught it. Oh, yeah, hey, this this one, this one's not bad either. Huh? Well, it's just stunning. Well, who's the old tramp in the foreground? Oh, that's just some guy with a beard. He was uh, sitting on one of the benches. Oh, the colors in this are lovely. Oh, there's that guy again. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I <laughs> didn't realize he was still sitting there. What's this, darling? Oh, that's funny. I, I don't remember sketching those. It's the same bearded man, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, now, what made you so interested in him? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Hey, look. Yeah? Here, here he is again. Oh. Wait a minute. What? It's something. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just beginning to see that I didn't see then. Barry, what is it? Uh, just a sec. Here, um, here, let me get a pencil. Uh, what are you doing? Trying to imagine... Well, this guy might look like without a beard. Why? Uh, ju just, uh, just give me a moment longer. <sighs> it's so darn difficult with those dark glasses over his eyes. I'm only making a guess, and maybe it isn't a guess. I don't understand. No, Charlie. just, just, just one moment longer, Meg. <sighs> there. I wonder if I'm crazy. Would you recognize him, Meg? Well, I don't know. Now, look, I mean, supposing his eyes were, were just, just a little more... Just a little more like this, and the lower part of the face were narrower, like this. That's the face you're always doodling. The one I asked you about. It could be. You don't suppose he really could be alive? What do you mean, alive? I mean, you see, all, all these years, I... I've been so sure he was dead. He's he's haunted me, you know. He's he's ridden on my back like like the old man of the sea. So you do know him. You do know who belongs to the ghost face of that evil lost boy you draw. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Meg, I never thought I would ever tell anyone about him. I I've tried to bury him to to forget him, but I guess I always knew I'd have to tell you eventually, Meg. Tell me what? What I've been terrified to tell anyone for the last 20 years. So, what 
he has been turned to loose a ghost from the past. Who is the evil boy with the hooded eyes, so full of accusation? Is he the man of the present who hides behind the dark glasses and the heavy beard? If so, why is he still alive instead of dead long ago, as Barry seems to remember him? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Nothing is harder to begin than a confession, no matter how simple it is. Barry Jordan is struggling with that problem now. As the evening darkens outside the windows of their living room, Meg and he sit frozen into temporary immobility in a small pool of light thrown by the lamp she has turned on. The light is on Barry as he gropes for words to start. You never knew my father. He died before we met. I'm sorry I never got a chance to know him. Oh, no, don't be. Barry. No, he was a bigoted, narrow-minded, petty tyrant. He ruled He ruled the house like a despot. After my mother got sick and, and died, he, he was even worse. I'm so sorry, darling. Both my brothers and my sister couldn't wait to be old enough to break away, just, just to escape. I mean, you have to understand about my father to understand the story I'm going to tell. How, how he terrified me. All right, darling. What, uh, what did he do to you? No, he didn't do anything, Meg. I, I did that myself. What did you do? I killed him. Well, I let him die. Not your father. Yeah, Sundays. Sundays were always the worst. There was no TV, there was no radio, no games even. Oh, yeah, I could read the Bible or do homework or sit at attention if neighbors called to give their respects. I'd have to sit there listening to the drone of those dull conversations, trying to stay awake with murder on my mind. The day was a thousand years long. Oh, I suppose a lot of kids have had to weather dreary Sundays like that. Yeah, 50 years ago, maybe, not 1960. Not when the sun's shining outside and everyone else is playing ball. Oh, this one Sunday, this one Sunday, suddenly, miraculously, I, I was free. After Mass, the priest caught me and he, he told me that my father had called. He had to take my mother to the hospital or something. She'd be taking tests all day and my father would stay with her. I was to go straight home, not to worry. Mother would be all right. They'd be back by supper time. But you didn't go straight home. <laughs> Darn right I didn't. At first, I thought I'd go back and get into the neighborhood ball game and, and then I was afraid some nosy parent might report me to my folks. Instead, I went the other way. Down to the river. You were still living in Kendrick City then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I got to the river, I sort of wandered along the dock area. The very last jetty jutted out some, and I walked out to look at the water. Wasn't anybody around. Just me. I found some loose stones, chucked them in the water, and I knelt down to peer over the edge. I got the fright of my life. I nearly bumped heads with a guy who was clambering up from the pilings below. What was he doing down there? I don't know. Whatever it was, he didn't seem to want me to know. First off, he said something like, you know, what are you doing spying on me? I, I, I said I wasn't. He was, he was about two or three years older than me. He had a, a black, scraggly sort of mustache and, and a mean face. I'll never forget that face. The one you draw all the time, without knowing you do. Yeah. Yeah, he he asked who I was. I told him my name. He he wanted to know where I lived. I, I said the North End. and <laughs> He grinned and said, rich kid, huh? Mm. I said, no, no, no. Well, where did he live? He told me the South End, Hell's Kitchen. He told me his name was Duke. Didn't I want to go for a boat ride? I said, Sure. He drew me to the edge. He showed me an old rowboat tied up to the pilings. Was it his boat? No, no, I don't think so. Oh, no, that didn't stop him. He, he couldn't untie the knot, so he he brought out a switchblade to cut the rope. How to row? Were there oars in the boat? No. No, Duke took up a floorboard. He, he used it like, like a paddle. Hmm. We started out towards the middle of the river. How'd you get the nerve? 
You can't swim? I mean, you've always told me you can't. You don't even like the water. I, I, I told him I couldn't swim. He said he couldn't either. But you went anyway. Well, I didn't want to chicken out. It was an adventure after all. Until we started to get pretty far out on the river. I got... I wanted to go back. And that's when he pulled a gun on me. Well, what for? He said, all right, Fink. You ain't getting no chance to rat on me over the side into the water. Barry, I can't believe this. No, neither could I. I thought he was kidding. I, I said, I won't. Take your choice, he said. I, I used the gun once to kill a guy today. I could just as well use it again. Oh, oh but you're here, Barry. You're here. How did you get away from him? Ah, uh, instinct. Self-preservation. Oh. I'd been paddling and the board was in my hand, so I belted him with it and the gun went over the side into the water. Mm. He started reaching for his knife, but he was groggy. I started to struggle with him and as I did, we fell with our combined weight on the gunnel of the boat and it capsized. Oh, how awful. What did you do? Well, when I surfaced half drowned, I, I thought I was dead. It was all black suddenly, but, but just then I, I found something to hang on to. What? Well, it, it was the seat. I, I'd come up under the boat, you see, and mm. in the air pocket, I, I, was, I was trapped there, but, mm. but the boat was settling, you see. I, I, knew, I knew I couldn't stay there too long. And so as soon as I could get up the nerve, I, I ducked under the water. I held onto the rope I'd found and, and came up on, on the outside. And, and then I pulled myself back on, on the boat till I was spread-eagled on top. Barry, it's so fantastic. Are you sure you didn't dream it? <laughs> I wish I had. Oh. What happened to the other boy? Uh, he drowned. No sign of him anywhere. How did you get out of it? <laughs> you know, that was simple. The current of the river drove the boat onto a, onto a sandbar, and I just climbed off and, and ran for home. Were your father and mother back when you got there? Uh, no, thank heavens. I went by some back alleys. No one I knew saw me. And Well, when I got home, I stripped her and dried my suit. I, I could even remember ironing it. I, mm. I didn't want my father to know or anyone. You mean you've never told anyone about this since it happened? No. Nope. You're the first. But why? Why? I killed someone, Meg. But that was an accident. Yeah, but can I prove it? I, I was alive. He was dead. But through no fault of yours, he brought it on himself. Yeah, maybe. But you see, I committed the first sin. I disobeyed my father. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't let him know that. Oh, he had you that terrified of him? Yeah. He had me that terrified. Mm. And all these years, you've hidden this secret, making it a guilty thing. That's right. Twenty years. Oh, how dreadful. And what a dreadful man your father must have been. I have to take the blame. Don't you see, Meg? That's why I, I've got to find this bearded man. I, I've got to hope and, and, and pray he turns out to be this guy, Duke, grown up. And, and maybe I can grow up, too, and get this cross off my back at last. <laughs> Cup of coffee, no fixings. I'll drink it here, Betty. Oh, hey, Barry. How you doing, kid? I can't complain, Lieutenant. What brings you down to Courthouse Square so early in the morning? Well, I was going to ask you the same thing. Well, I'm doing some graphics for the Fergus robbery case. Uh, yeah, no, but uh, court doesn't convene till 10 a.m. Oh, so I came early looking for a friend. Oh, that's funny. That's what brought me here. Oh, uh, thanks, son. Mm. You find your friend? No, not yet. You? No, uh, but we will, sooner or later. Uh, I wish I could be as sure as you. This case, your headache, Lieutenant? You bet your bucket, kid. And I thought it was all in the DA's hands now. Uh, the trial is just a showpiece. Bait. What? It's been a mind bender from the beginning, Barry. Here's a holdup. Four guys on the outside, an inside man, a Fergus man, bought off to open up the truck. The moment he opens the door... This one guy, one guy, mind you, pumps lead in him. Then he turns around. While his buddies are holding up the outside guards, he guns all of them down. <laughs> we call him the mad dog. Yeah, but he got away with a million. He needed help for that. The driver of the getaway car was still around. He didn't get the old double O till the dough was smashed somewhere. It was time for the dog to hand out more lead poisoning. 
I tell you, I want that killer so bad my teeth hurt. Yeah, but after all this time, you still have no lead? Just Burnett. The guy on trial you're drawing pictures of. Yeah, but he claims he never saw your, your mad dog out of his stocking mask. That's for the record. Between you and me, when Burnett was in the hospital first and thought he was going to cash in his chips... He gave us a clear identification. Oh, yeah? Who was he? Uh, your mad killer. Who knows? A string of AKAs a mile long, but no way to nail down any of them is his real name. All we had was some mug shots. They didn't lead you to him? We've had an APB out on him for over a year. He's gone to Earth someplace. That's why we finally went to trial. To flush him out. Oh, yeah? How? Well, the one thing we were able to do after the robbery was to sew up this town in 20 minutes. I'll stake my bottom doll. I never got the dough out. So? So the result of this trial is going to be on all the radio, TV, all the media. What's the result? Burnett can't really identify the main robber. He doesn't know where the money is. Now, once our mad dog is sure of that, he'll make the break, take the money and run. Then we got him. Oh, yeah, how? The town sewed up. Uh, you can't stop everything that moves. Only what we have to. Taxis, out-of-town plates. Suppose he has a private car. Only one way this baby has a private car. It's stolen. We'll monitor all those plates. Uh, it's still not 100%. Hey, you know anything that is? I got a feeling we are going to get this guy. Well, uh, give my regards to that uh, sweet missus of yours. I'll do that, Lieutenant. Happy hunting. I hope you close the book on your friend. When I do, I'm not only going to throw it at him, I'm going to stub it down his gullet. Hey, <laughs> hope you catch up with your pal, too. Hello? Hi, hon. You still home? Oh, I was just about to leave. Any luck? No, no. I hang around here for a couple of hours. I don't know if you'll ever show again. Oh, Barry, I don't know what to say. Me neither. Oh, uh, I had a cup of coffee at the local joint on the square with Sid Sloan. Who? Oh, you remember? The lieutenant of police you think is such a swell guy? Oh, of course, him. Don't you? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm just jealous today. You know, he's looking for someone, too. Only he's got a whole police force to pin him down, and how am I going to pin my guy down when there's just me? Oh, honey, what can I say? Yeah, I... yeah. Hey, hey, May, he just went by. Uh, outside. Uh, the beard. Now, you hold the fort. I'll get back to you after I talk to him. Now, who do you suppose is more likely to clear up unfinished business? A lieutenant of police or a private citizen? And why should such disparate events as a childhood escapade of 20 years ago have any relationship to a more recent robbery and vicious massacre. Did I say they did? If I did, I didn't intend to. Our story is only a little more than half told. For its conclusion, you will have to wait for Act Three. Except by chance, how does a man reach across the tangle of the years to solve a mystery buried two decades ago? And even supposing that a solution was there, how can a man be faulted for being human enough to miss the opportunity? We're not talking about Lieutenant Sid Sloan, of course. He is a man with the whole power of the establishment behind him to make things happen. Barry Jordan is an individual who can only try. Yes? Meg? Oh, he, oh, you just caught me. I was going out the door. Did you see him, darling? No, no. By the time I got out of the phone booth and down into the square, I missed him. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't make it so tantalizing? I mean, so near and yet so far? But I, I got a hunch. My boy lives around here somewhere. Otherwise, he wouldn't keep turning up. So, uh, don't count on me for dinner tonight, okay? Why? Well, after the trial is over this afternoon, I'm going to go prowling. I'm going to see if I can dig him up. Barry, that's crazy. You're not a policeman. You don't even know where to start. Why don't you... Oh. Yes, sir. 
What can I get you? Oh, uh, miss, uh, could you, could could I ask you a question? I, uh, um, I, ju I just want to ask you, have you ever seen this man in here? Well, how could I tell? It's just a drawing. Uh, well, um, here, here are a couple of other sketches. Well, what can I tell you? Beards and dark glasses are in. Hey, you from the police? No, no, why, why would you think that? Well, I just caught the end of the news on the TV. They nailed a guy for that armored truck robbery, but they're still looking for the mastermind and the million. Are you after that? No, no, no. This has nothing to do with that. This is... Now, this is a personal affair. Oh, well, count me out. Hey, what'd the beard do? Take off with your old lady? <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. Now, look, it's it's terribly important to me. Have you have you ever seen this man in here? Well, let me look. Here. Oh. Did you draw this? Yeah. Well, could you do a portrait like this of me? Well, I, uh... Oh, I don't need no favors. But you seem like a nice guy, though. And this crumb don't mean nothing to me. He don't even tip. Yeah, I've seen him here off and on. For that matter, he was here this afternoon just after I came on. Yeah? D does he uh, Does he live near here? Search me. Oh, look, mister, I got customers uh, here. Look, j just, just, just a minute, please. If if he does, where would, would you guess he might live? Well, this end of town is lousy with joints. Run-down hotels, women houses, you name it. Hey, look, I gotta go. Uh, look, look, miss, if I, uh, if I draw a picture of you and, and, and give it to you, could you, could you figure some way I, I could find this man? Oh, I'd sure like a picture of me. But I wouldn't want to kid you. I, I tell you what. If anyone would know, it'd be the Greek. The who? Papadopoulos. He runs the one arm joint across the street. Well, why would he know? He sends out all around the neighborhood. This beard of yours has got to eat, don't he? Yeah, yeah, hey, that's a great idea. I'll go right over. Oh, you won't find him there now. He's closed up. Oh, well, what time does he open up tomorrow? Tomorrow? Well, that's Saturday. No breakfast. Um, I'll say around 11. I, I can't find him anywhere tonight? But what do I know from the Greek? Say, for a freeloader, you've got some nerve tying up all my time. Story of my life, something for nothing. <laughs> hey, not this time. Um... What's your name? Trixie. Why? I just want to say thanks. Here. Hey, that's me. Ha, you just do that while we... Oh, hey, that's beautiful. You don't know what that does for me. Uh, so are you, Trixie. <laughs> and you don't know what you may have done for me. More coffee, Barry? No, no, thanks, me. Hey, it's 10.30. I better get going. I'll order some coffee from Papadopoulos in exchange for any information he may have. You want me to go with you? No, no, no. It's better I go alone. Hey, if I don't get a break from my Greek contact, I'll have to start gumshoeing again. <laughs> You're going to be gone all day? Well, I want to find him. Oh, well, I understand. Yeah, but I can't make a life career of it. This was supposed to be the beginning of our vacation. Oh, that's all right, honey. No, 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 it isn't. Well, my job is over now that the trial's finished. Hey, look, Meg, no matter what happens today, we leave this afternoon for New Hampshire. Know him? Of course I do. His name is Mr. Johnson. Uh, you wouldn't happen to know where he lives. What are you, police? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just an old uh, acquaintance. Uh, what the heck I care. He's a lousy tipper. Shelley Hotel. Uh, you wouldn't know his room number, huh? I, uh, I'm not such a bad tipper, maybe. Ooh, for five bucks, you could have my sister's telephone number. 421, top floor. He, uh, he don't like visitors much. I gotta see him. So, one hand washes the other. I got a ham and cheese for him to go. You want to deliver it for me? Sure, sure. Hey, I'll even pay for it. What, I call a gentleman. <laughs> In case you should get generous, you can keep the tip. <laughs> Yeah, who is it? Delivery. Cut for your hand. I uh, hold it. All right, just put it on. Hey, what is this? You know, delivery Look, boy. If, you, if you'll just let me explain. I'll say you'll explain. Uh, All right, just spread it on the hands against the wall. Hey, if, if, if you'll just let me explain. Shut up and get your hands up. The, the, the coffee. Drop it and shut up. What are you, fuzz? No, no, no. I'm not the police. Okay, you're clean. 
What are you looking for, Mac? I'm looking for you. Yeah, but well, you're going to be sorry you found me. I don't see why. I, I just want to know if, if if you're a guy named named Duke that 20 years ago capsized with me just south of Kendrick City in the Salt Ash River. What? You got to be kidding. Who are you? I'm Barry. The kid who was in the boat with a guy named Duke. Is that who you are? <laughs> got it all pat, everything that happened. I was there. What's your angle? Nothing. Now I know you're alive. I I don't have to feel any guilt about you anymore, so so we can say goodbye. Not so fast. You don't think I'm going to let you walk out of here? Why not? Because I seen you at the trial. What trial? Come on, the one that closed up yesterday. I should have known you cops had to get me going. How'd you make me? I don't know what you're talking about. The Fergus trial. You want to say that you weren't there? No, no, of course I was there. What for? I'm, I'm an artist. I, I was there to draw some pictures for TV because cameras are not allowed in the courtroom. That's all? That's all. Now, may I leave? No way. No, well, I don't see how you can stop me. Try this out for size. And I'll use it if I have to. Now, let's talk a little turkey. <laughs> Barry, we talked it all out. Twenty years ago, you caught me stashing some loot on the first job I ever ripped off. I took you out in that rowboat for two reasons. One, I had to get rid of the gun I used. The second, I wanted to also get rid of you. Just in case you've seen anything you shouldn't. You know, it's funny. Everything you say about the past makes me feel better. Well, it shouldn't. I'd just as soon wipe you this minute, except it don't suit my plans. Look, I've tried to explain. You can't get out of it. You might as well give up. With what's in them two suitcases by the door? Nearly two years it's been sitting in dead storage. After the robbery, that stupor was wheeling for us. Come back here with me. We broke open the steel files. Then we stacked the money in a suitcase, and next morning we took him to dead storage. And after that, you drove to the junkyard and you killed him. That's right. Dead men tell no tales. Like me? Now, look. It's four hours until I leave for my plane. You want to figure out what else I can do with you? Yeah, this is Lieutenant Sloan, 10th Precinct. This is Barry Jordan's wife. Meg, hey, good to talk to you. How are you? Lieutenant, Sid, I'm scared. What's the matter? It's Barry. We were supposed to catch a plane over an hour ago, but he... Barry's disappeared. (laughs) He's uh, run out on you? No, no, nothing like that. He... Oh, it's, it's hard to explain over the phone. Could I come to the station house and talk to you? Well, uh, you picked a bad time, Meg. You just caught me on my way out. Well, Sid, I'm really kind of frantic. I think Barry's in real trouble. A lot more than he can handle. Uh, tell you what, Meg. Uh, I'm on my way to the Houston Street Bridge. That takes me right by your place. I'll stop in on the way. <laughs> Raining like crazy out there. Wouldn't want to miss my plane. Time to say goodbye, mister. What are you going to do? Going to wait for the next L to go by. When there's enough noise to cover the shot, I'm going to take you out. You can't get away with it. Oh, I'll take that chance. Look, you'd, you'd be better off with my help. What good could you do me? I've been trying to tell you. Now, look. Lieutenant Sloan has every escape route covered. You can't break out. Right out. You don't know me from Adam. No, that's where you're wrong. Your buddy, Burnett, put the finger on you. What are you talking about? He ratted on you. Don't give me that. You were at the trial. You know he clammed up. Ah, that was a cover-up to flush you into the open. I told you, my friend, Lieutenant Sloan, has every escape route tied up. There's only one way you can get out of this city. Yeah, how? It's it's in my car. With me to vouch for you to get you on your plane. Who needs your help? I mean, you're a jinx. I should have taken care of you 20 years ago when you first stuck your nose in my business. Now look, if the cops have a make on me, how are you getting me past them? Well, the beard and the glasses have worked pretty good up to now, and you have me to vouch for you. 
What are you slowing down for? Well, we're almost across the bridge. We already paid the toll. There's a roadblock ahead. Would you would you let me handle it? Well, you better handle it good. I got a gun right up against you, which has already killed six people. Uh, you don't have to tell me I'm living on borrowed time. Oh, uh, officer. Yeah, what's the trouble? Oh, Barry, for crying out loud. Where are you headed on a night like this? Sid, uh, Lieutenant Sloan, why... Uh... Uh, you remember that friend I, I was looking for yesterday? Yeah. Well, uh, out of the blue, I I just bumped into him today. I'm I'm just driving him out to the airport. What's what's going on here? Uh, we're uh, we're just uh, running a check on some drug peddling. Uh, say, uh, any friend of yours is a friend of mine. I'd uh, I'd like to shake his hand. I'm uh, Lieutenant Sid Sloan. Put it there, friend. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure, Lieutenant. Nice to meet you. Oh, you won't be thinking that long, brother. That... Let, let go. Sergeant, get his other arm. Let me go. You... Not on your life. Which, from here on in, isn't worth a thin dime. I still don't understand how... Darling, when you didn't show up to leave for the plane with me, I was frantic. I knew something had happened, so I called Sid. At that point, there wasn't too much I thought we could do until Meg showed me a sketchbook and the man you were looking for. Then, the balloon went up. What balloon? The face of that boy that's haunted you all these years. He was a dead ringer for the face that's haunted me the last two. The mad dog, clear as a photograph. And your sketches of him without a beard showed Sid it was the same man. I want to tell you, Barry Pal, you are some kind of genius with that eye of yours. You ought to stick the painting from now on. Stay out of police work. I think I can promise you he will, Sid. Now, look, just a minute, May. I, I've got a living to make. Well, not for the next couple of years. Oh, what does that mean? Well, don't you know what the insurance company reward is for recovering that million dollars? Ten percent. What? For $100,000, darling, you can paint what you want. Hey, I think I'll start tonight. Let's, the three of us, go out on the town and paint it red. The pen, they say, is mightier than the sword. In this case, it was the pencil or the paintbrush. Maybe you've seen some of Barry Jordan's works. They hang in the best galleries, and the price for them is going up. One thing that can be said of his style is that it is modern. With it. Today. He is one painter who looks only to the future. Never the past. I'll be back shortly. Not all of us can be as lucky as Barry Jordan. There are dark pockets in all our pasts. But perhaps there's a lesson to be learned. Sooner or later, a man like Duke or Mad Dog would have been brought to justice. It was sheer luck that Barry was the agency. And even greater luck that by raising the dead, he didn't lose his own life. It was Longfellow who said, Let the dead past bury its dead. For all of us, the present... And the future is where we should direct our eyes. Our cast included Paul Hecht, E.V. Juster, Mandel Kramer, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
G. Marshall. Man against the odds. Why he takes chances to overcome obstacles. Why he challenges the seemingly impossible. That is one of the most elusive puzzles we know. And barely understood. Today, we shall try to uncover the story of one man who dared death in order to live. Aguinald, have you ever been to Königstein? I have never even visited the place, Captain. That is where you will be imprisoned. It's on a mountainside 750 feet above the Elba River. And the fortress itself is 150 feet high. Are you telling me it is useless to try to escape? And live. I have an army of guards with orders to shoot to kill. My orders, Herr General. I take great pride that Königstein is the ultimate lock for which there is no key. Our mystery drama, The Runaway General, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Norman Rose. I shall return shortly with Act One. I think the time has come for another of my WWHI stories, which is initially what I call my What Would Happen If stories. For instance, supposing the dead could talk to us, I don't mean aunts, nephews, cousins, or closer relatives. I mean the greats of the past. What light they could shed upon what shrouded corners of yesterday, huh? Fascinating. If they only could. Hang on by your fingernails, if you can, because that's just what someone you'll be meeting shortly actually did. And live to tell the tale. Let me introduce you to a man who knew him. Charles. All is you and I are closer now than we ever were in France. It's because of circumstances, you might say. We are both dead now. Henri, he died as commander-in-chief of our forces in the last great war. I also speak to you from the grave. I died... Not long after he did, having a position of some responsibility to the government. Henri was the most wise and foolish, foolhardy, and completely brave man I have ever known. For example... I do not know how much longer we can hold out against their motor fire. There is a movement a hundred yards ahead! It cannot be a Frenchman, it must be a German. Fire and keep firing! Find out who has been hit. Paul, rake them with fire. Paul, is there no one at the machine gun? General, over here, over here. Help me pull this man away from his gun. He's badly wounded. Ah, he's dead. I keep the belt stretched. You feed as I fire. I'm swinging around to the right. Now move with me, move with me. Jam the gun. Is there no other gun? This one will not fire. In the name of the Fuhrer. We demand that you French surrender. If you desire your wounded to be taken care of, raise the white flag. You will have one minute to decide. Monsieur what shall we do? Does anyone have a clean white handkerchief? I cannot believe my eyes. You had better believe them. You recognize me? Oh, but naturally I recognize you, General Giraud. You have not changed that much. But uh, do you recognize me? Let me look more closely. We have met before. Von Meist. Capitaine Von Meist. I was only a corporal then. We met in almost identical circumstances, you and I, 25 years ago. I was among those who captured you then. I only... I only pursues me, Herr Commandant. Another war between France and Germany. Always we are at one another's throats. And again, you are my prisoner. 
What were you doing in that machine gun nest? The commander-in-chief of the French army. Reconnaissance. Well, nothing can be done, General Giraud. Germany cannot be turned back. If you are a betting man, Captain, do not bet on that. The war is not over for me. Escape nowadays is considerably more difficult. Ah, do you know Königstein? Königstein, an old fortress on the river Elbe. No, no, not on the Elbe, General, but on a cliff 750 feet over the Elbe. No, I have never visited the place, Captain. The German people will take great pleasure in introducing its advantage to you. Imagine a fortress high on a mountainside. The fortress itself, 150 feet in the air. The view is splendid. It is overpowered. You are telling me it is useless to try to escape. And live. Should anyone attempt to leave, the centuries have orders to shoot to kill. My orders, Herr General. I take great pride that Königstein is the ultimate lock for which there is no key. I wasn't there. But the boss of this German captain were a challenge Henri could not overlook. I knew how stubborn Henri Giraud could be. Having been a student of his at Saint-Cyr, a military academy, there was one precept of his which none of us have ever forgot. A soldier's duty is to fight. If he is captured, it is dishonorable to sit out the war in an enemy camp. George, what? George, put your ear to the radiator, and you can hear me. Giro? Yes. We have half an hour before the guard comes around to our rooms again. <laughs> George, how are you feeling? <laughs> Between my bad lungs and the shrapnel in my shoulder, I'm not good for much. But tomorrow I shall feel perfect. I shall be happily on my way back to France. Yes, they will take good care of you at St. Cloud. I know that hospital. You will first go see who I have asked you to before you go to the hospital. I shall go visit your wife right away. You have it safe, what I gave you? General, I don't expect that anybody will search me. Do you see anyone between Königstein and Tars? Unwinding all that bandage I've wrapped in. <laughs> I tell you something about the wounded soldier on a train. He is left severely alone. In case he should suddenly decide to die. A soldier dying on a train is very upsetting to the other passengers. Give my wife my love and tell her I hope I shall see her before this war is over. Oh, General, I hope long before that. Lieutenant Martin, please, if you will, the first-hand news. Tell me everything you know. How is he? Ah, he is well, Madame Giraud. I have nothing but admiration for your husband. He must escape. France needs Henri Giraud. He is unconquerable. So it took him three tries before he could escape in the First World War. He never gives up. Not Henri. You know, of course, what was in that letter he gave you for me. Uh, no, I don't, madame. It's just as well. No need to endanger any more lives than necessary. Where were you followed here when you came? I didn't think to look back. I don't think so. You are certain? No, but what harm is there in my visiting you? I shall go right straight from here to the army hospital in saint Flou. I'm sure your orders and regulations did not include paying me a visit. Lieutenant Paris is now an occupied city. None of us are that free to come and go. Open the front door! Do you hear that? The front door at the end of the hall. It's the Germans. Will someone let them in? No. Because they know they are Germans who are always searching for victims to take with them. What happens finally? Do they break down the door? No. They have no real authorization. If no one answers, they think no one is here. And they will go away. I shall need someone to help. I cannot do what he asks alone. Ah, then you will permit me to be a fellow conspirator. So that he can run away and not be caught. 
or he needs certain things which he is going to ask me for. In this letter, there is a code. Already I know it. You mean he will write you the usual letters permitted, but secrets will be contained in them? Uh, for instance, I'll tell you. He says when he writes, My dear one, that will mean do not do anything for the present. They suspect something. Then he will write, I miss you, my darling. That will mean send me so and so, whatever. And then when he writes, I think of you day and night. That means stop sending me whatever. What are we whatevers? He will need clothes to go from Kennekstein to whatever transportation he will get out of where he is. All he has now is his general's uniform. So, if he writes me, I see sparrows from my window, that means shoes. Of course, it's very clear. He writes, I miss you, my darling, I see sparrows from my window. That means send me a pair of shoes. I smell the flowers and think of you means a shirt and so on and so on. <laughs> he thinks of everything. Hmm, you don't know my husband. He even sent me a code for send me two bottles of cognac which I will share with the gods. But he is going to need tools, something to make a robe ladder, heavy work gloves. Those are things a man can get more easily than a woman. Open the front door! I command you to open this door! Lieutenant, how did you get away to come here? Oh, when we got to the Gare du Nord, I asked to go to the WC and I, I <coughs> jumped out the window. They wouldn't connect you and me? I think I can be here on Sunday. I will let you know. Sundays is a good day. They have the whole front of the first floor to search before they reach my door. But what are what? you going to do? First of all, I am tearing Henri's letter. I have already memorized everything in it. Then, I am opening this back window and throwing the pieces to the wind. Madame Giro, open this door, if you please. Lie down, Lieutenant. Put this handkerchief over your forehead. Close your eyes. Do as I say. I'm trying to keep from coughing. No, don't. Cough. <laughs> Madame Giro, open this door. Certainly. Come in, come in. This poor sick soldier has been repatriated to go to the hospital in St. Louis. But he became lost when I opened my door where he was, in a dead faint. So I brought him in here and opened the window to revive him. I was just about to call the authorities. Do you have a stretcher with you? He's expected at St. Louis. He's deeply wounded. And that bandage about his shoulder has come undone. You two are soldiers. I am sure you respect this brave man, even though he is your enemy. Those were the days when everyone had to use every possible means to survive. Henri Giraud's wife had to be every bit as cunning and resourceful as she could be, not only to protect herself, but to become a backstop of aid to General Giraud so that he could escape to return to his own troops. I shall be back shortly with Act Two. investigating the account of the only man to escape from two prison camps in two wars. He was not a magician or a lunatic, although to be so successful, one would have to be a little bit of both. The escape artist was Henri Giraud, the commander-in-chief of the French army. His exploits are being detailed by his former student. Charles, please. was an average student. Giraud was a brilliant teacher at Saint-Cyr, a military tactician of the first rank, and yet he dared danger and death like no man I have ever known before. In the fortress of Königstein, he remained, planning his liberation. At the other end of the lifeline in Paris, his wife and the wounded Georges Martin worked and waited. Lieutenant, I think to meet him in church during the nine o'clock mass is a very good idea. We kneel and bow our heads and not look at one another. That 
way we can exchange news, and anyone who happens to look this way will think we're praying. You have had another letter from the general? I've had two since last I saw you. And there are two things I must ask you about. Are there rats up on that tower where my husband is kept? Rats? That's what Henri writes. Here, let me show you. He writes, I must be careful with the food. As there are rats which nibble at everything, especially one large rat who looks at me always with one eye. And so he explains I should send all the biscuits in the future in small tin boxes. Rats. I had an idea what he means. There are no cells. We were not even locked up at night. And there are no rats, not one. Then why would he have written this? To tell us he is being watched. The rat with one eye that keeps looking at your husband is from Meist, the captain in charge of Königstein. We call him the rat. He looks like a rat. And the one eye is his monocle. It is the way he squints at you. All right. But the small tin boxes. What do you make of that? When your husband makes a break for it, he would have to carry enough provisions to last him who knows how long. And the only way to keep and carry it is in small tin boxes. Uh, you said there was something else. There is. But it's not going to be as easy to send him as a small tin box. What is it? Copper wire. 175 feet of it? Mon Dieu. How did you know? Well, if it is copper wire he asked you for, alone it would not be strong enough to support his weight for 150 feet. He would have to wind or weave it around something else. Threads or, or cords. You said 175 feet? From the top of the tower is 150 feet. He is allowing an extra 25 feet to wind it stronger. Henri is almost 62 years old. At his age to climb down all that distance without being seen, without being shot at. The Lord protect him. George, did you bring the wire? Of course I brought it. Took me a week to find it and here it is. To make doubly sure, I brought 200 feet of wire to send Henri. Look. Oh, that's so thin. Uh, but it is very strong. Mm, mm, that smells good. <laughs> what are you cooking? A ham. And the trouble I had to go to get it. It must be about done. Come along, into the kitchen. Now comes the difficult part. Hmm. <laughs> What a heavenly smell. Doesn't it look beautiful? There. On to the table to cool off. Now, the problem is, George, how do we put your 200 feet of copper wire inside the ham so no one will see it? There is only one way. Remove, Remove the, the bone. bone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I'll take out the bone. And you start to wind your wire to the shape of the bone, and we'll place it into the hole where the ham bone was. Uh, who else but you would have known a ham is so heavy by itself that whatever is placed inside it would go unnoticed. When it is cool, you hold it, and I will cut out the bone. I hope the Germans will respect the integrity of a food package to a prisoner and not cut off some slices before it reaches my husband. <laughs> It was at this point that I personally became involved with the escape from Königstein. Giro had been in prison a year, had tried three times to run away, and three times had been retaken before he could get out of Germany. I'd been at the front, returning to Paris for a week's leave, when Madame Giro came to see me. Charles, I am not giving up hope. But the reason Henri has not been able to escape is... Madame, for... madame, the days of World War I are 25 years behind us. Henri was younger then. What is he now? 62, 63? I beg you, when you write to him, tell him don't try any foolishness. Some trigger-happy German guard will shoot him. And that will be a great tragedy for France. I was going to say... All he needs are accurate, 
up-to-date maps of Germany, especially Saxony, and the latest timetables of the local trains. You haven't heard one word I've said. He's been caught and brought back because I couldn't get in the maps and the timetables. He had no trouble getting off Königstein. The guards take the prisoners for walks along the Elbe and in the fields once a week. It was nothing for him to disappear. But even with the compass I'd sent him in a bar of soap, he couldn't find the roads back. And he was captured. All right, all right, all right. I'll get you the maps you need. How are you going to send them to him, huh? In a cake? I'll find a way. I am confident. Do you know, Charles, I sent him a Tichorian hat last month. He just got it. No one found out. Fantastic. A hat in a ham with a feather. When can I have the timetables and the maps? Uh, by Sunday. Is Sunday all right? The church across the way from Dimego. Nine o'clock mass. Madame, even the churches are watched. Place what you have in your prayer book. We will leave the church after mass at the same time, but no recognition. If there is no one watching, I shall go to the cafe and take a seat in the back room. I shall have a gentleman at my table. Sit with us. <laughs> Madame, <clears throat> uh, monsieur, uh, may I join you? Charles, this is Georges. Oh, how do you do? <laughs> yes, uh, you were in church this morning, madame. As always. Yes, well, I sat in back of you. Uh, you left your prayer book behind you. Oh, thank you. That was careless of me. Uh, the waiter is watching us very closely. I think if we desire to exchange a few words privately, we had better order something so he will go away to fetch it. You're right. He won't get any tips standing around and not serving people. I uh, will have a coffee. Madame, what will you have? I'll uh, have some wine. Well, uh, why don't we all? Uh, sure. Uh, anything. Uh, waiter, waiter, a bottle of red and uh, three glasses, please. Huh? Now, <laughs> well, you see, he's gone. Charles, the maps and the timetable are inside this prayer book. As you asked. George, take it to Henri. George has escaped from the hospital at St. Cloud. He is going back to Königstein to help Henri get out. Look out! There's trouble! Goodbye, friends. Oh! Oh, I shoot! George got away from the cafe, holding onto a prayer book under his arm. At one point, a shot. I saw George stagger a bit, then run on and turn a corner. Why he was suspected and of what, I don't know. A man who willingly returns to Germany to help a friend deserves every known medal of honor. I prayed he would reach Henri Giraud safely. Psst. Je garde. Oh, oh Georges. What are you doing springing out at me from behind a tree? What are you doing in Königstein? I came to help. I was going crazy at the hospital. You were safely out of Königstein and you came back. It is nothing I had to. It has been over a year. Are your wounds healed? Almost. My lungs are better. A guard will be along shortly. They let us wander this field for an hour, then they come and round us up and count noses. Temptation to escape once a week. We must talk. You are in the same place in the tower? The same. I can find my way in. It sold all week to me. Tomorrow night, the chimney sweeps from the village start their annual cleaning of the chimneys and fireplaces. I, I remember. They are here for three days. Put soot on your hands and face and at eight o'clock stand with them at the gate. If you talk to no one, they will think you are one of them. Now, once inside... I know the way. Here, Henri. I this under your shirt. Ah, inside this prayer book, something for me, Yes. Keep it well hidden. There's a bullet hole in it. And a bullet. <laughs> that book saved my life. I pray it saves yours. Tomorrow night, then. George, we have two weeks and two days. The moon will be new and at its smallest. Ah, two weeks. How shall I spend them? I need a complete change of clothes. I have that already. Already? How? Oh, right. Henri. I am wearing your clothes underneath mine. In a package I have hidden in the woods are your shoes and shirt and socks. Your wife gave them to me for you. 
<laughs> Formidable. Also, I have a wallet filled with German marks. Two weeks, two days, we will meet at Schandau. That's the 13th, huh? Mm. At two o'clock in the afternoon on the bridge. In broad daylight? No one will recognize me. You will put my French clothes into a suitcase which you will carry. We will walk slowly together to the station and take the first train out in any direction. On board, you will put the suitcase in the lavatory. I will go in and change. And what would you wear when I meet you on the bridge? My raincoat looks civilian and my Tyrolean hat. Ah, yes, that hat. I shall keep it on always. In the past 14 months, I have learned a possible German. I shall be a traveling Swiss salesman. I have to keep moving until they believe I have crossed the border somewhere. The only way to hide my six foot three is to sit down on a train. So that is what I shall do. One train this way, another that way, until I can finally escape through the border to Switzerland. It will be a long journey. You will have food? As much chocolate and biscuits as one could eat in a lifetime. Uh, you know, I had better go now and join my fellow chimney sweeps. On the 13th, I will see you on the bridge at Chandon. Oh, you may find me somewhat changed. I'm going to shave off my mustache. A bientôt, mon général. Au revoir. Henri, the 13th, uh, it is not a Friday by any chance. When last I saw Georges, I didn't know whether he had escaped the Nazis or not. I decided my family could wait. I got duplicate maps and timetables, commandeered a car, and was in Chando in 16 hours. I searched the town for Lieutenant Georges Martin and found him. We made our plans. He would be the outside man and I the inside man. We proposed it to Giro and he agreed. Konigstein was not hard to enter at night. Just wait and scoot past the sanctuary. Getting out might be a problem. The night of the new moon, Henri and I went over the escape plan for the last time. Now we look over the edge of the parapet. Once the sentry has passed below us, we have ten minutes before the next one. Behind this pile of wood is my rope. Tie it around me now, and when I say so, let me down. When I am near the bottom, I will pull the rope uh, as a signal. Hold it out from you so I kick out and clear the moat. All right. It is time. There goes the sentry. No more rehearsals. Now, we do it. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, goes the old saying. But a soldier in his 60s dangling in midair with sentries below ordered to shoot on sight is not a relaxed midnight entertainment. Hang on, I would say to Henri Giraud. I say it to you also, until I return shortly with Act Three. as you may know, is an unexcelled means of communicating across miles, even light years. But the drama of radio, as you listeners to the Mystery Theater can attest, that drama knows no bounds of space or of time. Which is why we can ask the distinguished deceased, in this case a gentleman called Charles, to divulge a story known to very few. Here again, then, is Charles. was the night of Henri Giraud's departure. I was fastening that famous rope of his about his waist. That is tight enough, Charles. It is the strangest looking rope I ever saw. I hope it holds. I started with the copper wire my wife smuggled into me, and then every time we would be taken for an airing, Robert, the one who is standing guard, and Jacques, he's at the bottom of the stairs as lookout, we would pick some long lengths of hemp. It took months, but I wove all that together with the wire, and this is it. And around your waist, what's that rolled up? My old raincoat. It looks civilian enough. And inside that, you will never guess. Oh, no, no, I won't try. A Tyrolean hat with a feather. 
I look more Swiss than a walking cuckoo clock. <laughs> My wife sent it also in a ham. I think, yes, our friend the sentry is passing. Over the parapet I go. Now, let me down easy. Uh-huh. Au revoir, mon ami. All set, Sean. All set. Lower away. I'm letting out the rope slowly. Bon voyage. It wasn't easy loosening the handmade cable with all its knots and imperfections a foot at a time. Knowing I had but nine minutes left to get him down and away and haul it back up without being seen. He was still within earshot when I felt a tug on the line. What is it? I am struck. The rope is caught. Can you kick yourself free? One more try. If I can only... Uh, no. No, I'm afraid if I do, the rope might not hold together. I'm going to pull you back up. Stay with it. Hang on. Uh, uh, there you are. Uh, thank Thank you. Just in time. There goes the next century. Uh, I am climbing over the parapet. Uh, uh, that, that was a close one. Yes, the rope would go up, but it wouldn't go down. You're not going to try again tonight, are you? Of course I am. As soon as the next century passes. But why? You do not understand, Charles. Georges is in Chando with all my clothing. Enough German marks to keep me under cover for weeks, months if I have to. What happens to him if I do not turn up at the bridge at two tomorrow? Georges can take care of himself. As I can. We are not important. Your safety is. You are the only leader the French trust. You are the only one to rally all of us so that this shame of being occupied by the Germans can be forgotten and we can fight again. Exactly why I must escape from Königstein tonight. What can I do for France from prison? After the next century passes, let me down. The odds, slim as they were, were overcome. Henri made it straight down the cliff 750 feet into the forest. He hid there until it was dawn. And some time later, wearing his raincoat and his Tyrolean hat, he walked into town and stood on the bridge over the river, munching a chocolate biscuit. Follow me. I know the way to the station. Happy to... Amazing. You almost did not recognize me, did you, Georges? Your upper lip looks a little naked. Mm -hmm. That is a very nice suitcase you are carrying. Mm. Put your own clothes in it. Suit, shirt, tie, shoes, everything. Mm, The timetable. And the maps and the money. Good. Here comes our train. Now, after you leave that suitcase for me in the train lavatory and I change and come out, I want you to get off at the next station and come back here to Chandon. Why? I want to get back to France, too. And so does Charles. He helped me last night, as you know. Then after I got down, he had one of the boys lower him as well. He will be waiting exactly where you found me, on the bridge at 2 o'clock tomorrow. It will be easier if the two of you travel together. One can keep watch for the other. They won't be on the lookout for him? No more than for you. Nobody knows either of you was even in Kornstein. That is ours. It will be in the station for exactly three minutes. Shall we run for it? No. No, just walk fast enough to get to the ticket office. You buy two for the furthest point the train goes to. I will be right beside you, bent over, tying my shoelace. <laughs> Yes, uh, please, uh, please, uh, bitte Herr Lostig, uh, uh, sit in my best chair, yes, a cigar. I don't smoke, Capitan. Uh, well then, a, a drink, uh, please, a whiskey, cognac. No. Uh, you have come all the way to Königstein from Berlin? Well, uh, surely there is something I can give you, yes? An explanation? Ah, yes, oh yes, an explanation. The SS would like an explanation. Oh, yes, yes, of course. First. How did General Henri Juro, probably the most important war prisoner of the Reich, how did he escape from your prison? Second, who assisted him? Third, 
Where are the party or parties who assisted him? Fourth, why is it that after I have questioned every one of your staff, no one knows anything, especially not Captain von Meist, which I believe is your name. Uh, Hello, Stick. Believe me, it is a, a very complicated situation, and I am endeavoring, as I have been for over a week, to know what happened. Yet I have discovered very little. Have you discovered also that I have today replaced your sentries with men from the SS? They are all on their way to Berlin for court-martial and execution. Dereliction to duty, that is the punishment for traitors. And why you, Captain, will also no longer be here. Uh, Where am I going? To Berlin. You will be questioned a little more thoroughly there. But, Herr Lustig, I I have told you everything. The SS has many questions. They have questions I couldn't even begin to dream of. They will be interested in a rope made of wire and hemp from your fields, where you allow your prisoners to go. No discipline, Captain von Meist. Giro is very good at disguises, and I have never met the man. All we know is he is six feet tall. Is that positive identification? There could be thousands of men six feet tall. Uh, He has a very big mustache. Ah, thank you. I will remember that the next six foot tall, clean-shaven man I meet. What Henri Giraud had to do until his pursuers ran out of steam was to hide his height by sitting down. And the only place that was possible without attracting attention was on a train. So he traveled from one border to another, one train to another, always trying to cross into another country, always on the alert. He sat up, rarely slept, ate what he brought with him, and as much as he could, kept to himself. Do you mind if I sit here? Uh, oh, not at all. The compartment is empty. Uh, two men just got off at Bursay. It is uh, stuffy in here, is it not? Do you mind if I open the window? I wish you would. I have tried. It uh, refuses to budge. Uh, when you do as much traveling as I do, you have to put up with a great deal. Oh, you you'll travel a lot, you said? Oh, yes. I am a salesman for Beaufort and Company, a Swiss firm. Commerce must go on, war or no war. And uh, what do you sell? Uh, cuckoo clocks, thermometers. Uh, would you care to see some samples? Uh, uh, no, thank you. Of course you would not. I am sometimes ashamed to say what I do. But I have done my share. Africa Corps. You were in Africa, really? Oh, I will show you my medals. There you are. I was an Oberleutnant under Rommel. He was my hero. Ah, 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 mine too. I would still be with him, but uh, I was wounded and they sent me home. Swiss volunteers were the first to be let go. Are are we stopping? Up ahead. We are taking on some Gestapo agents to search the train. I have been doing that for a month. Now I've had enough. I am going back to Berlin. There have been lots of delays on the trains lately, I notice. And uh, not due to bombing, either. Ah, it is that French general, Giraud. Your who? Giraud. We captured him in the last war, and he escaped. This war, the same thing, from Königstein. Four weeks ago, he disappeared. Oh, Giraud. It's funny, I've never heard of him. But when you are fighting with the Africa Corps, what the French do is not very important. When were you demobilized? Uh, last April, after Tobruk. Oh, I could hardly move. My leg is not quite right yet. You were with Rommel at the catch of Tobruk? Your paper, sir. We got ourselves from the British enough supplies for 30,000 men to last three months. Your papers, please, Marchnell. You, with the feather in your hat. Who are you speaking to? This is a former overlieutenant of the Africa Corps. We are discussing military matters about which you would not have the slightest interest or experience. Schuldig, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Apologize to my friend here as well. I apologize. This man is a war hero, and you are rude and insufferable. And just so that you know how easily I have let you off, here is my identification. Lustig, SS. 
Now go. Before I report you. I apologize. Because a man is in civilian clothes, the guest apple thinks he's a nobody. Uh, tell me, did you ever speak with the field marshal personally? With Rommel himself? Oh, yes, that was a very interesting occasion, and I do not mind telling you about it at all. Oh, by the way, when are we to cross the border? <laughs> we already have. My dear friend, we are already in your country, Switzerland. The escape of Henri Giraud, as we have dramatized it, and as told by a character named Charles, was none other than Charles de Gaulle. He studied military strategy with Giraud and knew him well. Sometimes they were great friends, sometimes not. The great may not always agree, but they are always great, and France the better for it, that they lived. I shall return shortly. Something about unraveling a true story that has always appealed to me. I don't like the fact that the mysterious force that makes a man outreach himself disappears into history. Fame, they say, is what you do today. What you did yesterday is only good to wrap fish in. Not if I can help it. Our cast included Norman Rose, Tootie Wiggins, Earl Hammond, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. into the far side of darkness, whether it be an intangible dream or foresight into the future. The world of shadows is our domain, and there are shadows in the world which we know as real. As the world has shrunk through communication, our tangible world has become laced with a network on which our lives depend. Its name? Espionage. In a pay station telephone booth in Washington, D.C. Don't identify yourself or me. Yes, sir. There has been another security break. I'm putting the counter move into effect. Everyone will be in place. You have been briefed. I leave Boston undercover for Los Alamos. Then by commercial plane for Washington. On Thursday, Nantucket. My secretary, Miss Chase and Van Phillips, will meet you at Dallas. Yes, sir. Dr. Sam Jeffries. Already underground. Don't fail me. Your life would be forfeit. Our mystery story, The Cat's Paw, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Larry Haynes. I shall return shortly with Act One. are not the creatures of fiction. They are real. 
They exist because nations, to preserve peace, must be alert to others that want to destroy peace. The spy, in high positions and in lowly ones, ferrets out secrets which give advantages to his nation over another. They are mostly, but not entirely, military secrets. At Dulles International Airport in Washington, D.C., Alfreda Chase watches the runway with Van Phillips. Why a commercial flight, Alfreda? No, no. Mr. Parker didn't explain. I'd expect him to fly in by Air Force. He's top security. He sure is. You ever see him before? No, Van. They've kept him squirreled away. Uh, we'll find out when he lands. The plane's late. What time have you got, Ben? Um, 4.02. What's the scoop on this guy, Alfredo? No, well, Parker hasn't said. Dr. Jeffries is reporting to Parker and then to defense? Parker first, because he's security chief of the nuclear regulatory agency. Then to defense, which oversees him and his operation. No idea what this guy has up his sleeve? Just a hunch. Dr. Jeffries is the brightest of the bright string of degrees. He knows everything there is to know about nuclear power. So my guess is that he's come up with a plan to switch the ICBM silo locations. And more. Such as? Well, I haven't the vaguest. But the public is leery of nuclear reactors. We have to be cautious. Uh, plane's coming in, Van. Look, I'll go help him with his luggage. But wait here. I won't be long. Dr. Jeffries? Yes, it's a pleasure. You're Miss Chase. I'm nervous, Miss Chase. You're not what I expected. Oh, well, all scientists aren't gray-haired and doddery. Yeah, but I never met one who looks like a football player. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. I did play in college. What I intended when I said I was nervous is that being security for you is pretty overwhelming. Dan and I wouldn't have had a chance if, well, you know, if... If there were spies intent on kidnapping me. <laughs> yes, I understand, and I appreciate your concern. Oh, here comes my porter. It's Van Phillips, also from security. I have the bag stowed in the trunk and the car's in front, Dr. Jeffries. Follow me, please. Yes. Van and I wondered why the Air Force didn't fly you in, Dr. Jeffries. Expensive. Oh, but a man in your position. Anonymity is protective covering, except for Ross Parker. And now you and Mr. Phillips. I'm pretty much unknown. And that's as it should be. I've been buried for almost a year. But then why didn't Ross visit you in Los Alamos? Oh, I have some personal business to attend to in Boston. But you're exposing yourself to danger. You know that. Well, I'll have someone watching over me, and I won't be in Boston long. And then it's uh, back to the desk. You're meeting with the Defense Department. I'm in Ross Parker's hands. I don't know what he has in mind. Do you? All I know is that Mr. Parker sent me in van to meet you. We're armed. If anything suspicious happens on the ride to the agency, we're prepared to act. And, uh, to die for your country? No. In self-defense. Dr. Jeffries, welcome to Washington. Hello, Mr. Parker. Any, uh, complications, Miss Chase? No, sir. None. Good. Doctor, are we... Slipped you into town unsuspected. Uh, sit down, please. Do you need me, Mr. Parker? If you have the time, I wish you'd stay. Oh, of course. Thank you. Miss Chase is to be trusted, absolutely. She's as much a part of the security system as I am. I, uh, I understand that the counter moves have you uh, steaming, to quote Miss Chase. Yes, we've been infiltrated by someone devilishly clever who is selling information vital to our defense. It will be stopped, but it will take time. One slip and it's ended. Defense has what you created. I've been told that it is brilliant. Oh, well, thank you. It's two parts of practicable, I believe. But there's still you. Oh, I can take care of myself. Famous last words. It's a violent world, Dr. Jeffries. I don't want anything to happen to you. You'll stay with me in Alexandria until next Monday, and we'll meet with defense. Well, this is only Wednesday, Mr. Parker. Well, you can use four days rest. Yes, I can. And, uh, I don't intend any rudeness, but I'm flying to Nantucket tonight. What? I have strict orders from defense... Well, I'm not under their jurisdiction, Mr. Parker. I have important... 
personal business in Nantucket, and this weekend is my only chance to attend to it. May I ask what's so important about Nantucket? My mother's funeral. Oh. Uh, p- please forgive me. Uh, Miss Chase, order an Air Force plane. He will fly to Boston at ten tonight and spend the night at headquarters. In the morning, he'll be flown to the island. Maximum security. You'll return, Dr. Jeffries, early Monday morning. The secretary arrives before noon from Madrid. Clear? Yes, sir. Questions? No, none. And thank you for understanding. That will be all, Miss Chase. Uh, where will I know... Dr. The... Jeffries will be with me at my home. I'll drive him to the airport. If it doesn't upset your plans for the evening, Miss Chase, I'd uh, appreciate it if you'd stand by. Van Phillips and I will be there, sir. Thank you. That is all. How did I do as Dr. Jeffries? <laughs> well, you convinced me, Sam. Very attractive little restaurant, Ross. That's out of the way and the food is good. You know, Ross, when you come to think of it, this is a weird way to live. We can never relax. Neither can they. Alfredo was right. Our work is like a chess game. What about her? I don't know. I don't trust anyone. She was highly recommended to the department by her congressman, qualified easily, and is a crack shot. Mm. Your Miss Chase is distracting. Your Dr. Samuel Jeffries until this caper is ended. Is that clear? Yes, sir, boss. Now, ready to listen to business? Yep, ready. I'll brief you quickly. Then we'll order dinner. First... You are comfortable with the impersonation? But you said I convinced you. You did. This genius you're impersonating, Dr. Jeffries, you've met him. He's serious. All business. No sense of humor. A machine. Mm. He's not even personable, from what I've heard. So far, your pretense has worked. Now, if nobody knows Jeffries... From what they know of him, from the serious papers he has written, our enemies could deduce his character... So play it straight. Yes, I understand. You know enough, but not too much, about our silo installations and our suspicions about the subtle sabotage of nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. No matter what might happen in the next few days, I'd miss you. You could not be brainwashed of anything not already known to them. Yes, that's correct. I know the patois, nothing more. When you land in Nantucket, a taxi with one of our men as driver will take you to what presumably was your mother's house. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Winship was her housekeeper. She's been given a password which she will state once you have entered the house. You'll reply with a line which I'll give you when you take off. Okay. Oh, uh... What about uh, the funeral? (laughs) You handled that line beautifully. I was touched. How is your mother, by the way? Oh, she's fine, fine. She still wonders what I do for a living. Well, about the funeral. Mm. Mrs. Winship has it arranged. A closed casket is at the funeral home. Uh, She and you and some selected stragglers will follow the hearse to the cemetery near the old mill. This, uh... This is really a big operation, isn't it? The biggest in years. Someone's going to try to grab you, Sam, and brainwash you or transport you. Or leave me for dead. Uh Uh-huh. You'd never be found. You'd be gone, baby. You must be Dr. Sam Jeffries. If you make a false move, you'll scare them off. I don't resist. I'm the uh, tethered goat. We call this... Operation Cat's Paw. Well, this is more like it, Dr. Jeffries. He rates an Air Force fighter. That thing scares me. You'll be in Boston in an hour. I... I'm sorry about your mother. Yeah, that's too bad. You see, uh... Funeral is tomorrow. Is Nantucket your home? No, no, no. It was hers. I lived and worked in the Cambridge area. Both of us were off-island. His mother moved to Scotset many years ago. Loved it, as I still do. All set, Dr. Jeffries. Yes, well, goodbye, Miss Chase. Mr. Phillips, I'll see you next Monday. 
Will he, Alfreda? See us next Monday? Here comes Parker. Well, that's a relief. Thank you both for standing by. Mr. Parker, are we... Are we certain that he is Dr. Jeffries? Of course. If he isn't, what's the point of the charade? A cover for the real Dr. Jeffries, who might have been captured and taken out of the country. I think we should follow him to Nantucket to see if he's taken off the island. Wise precaution, Miss Chase. You and Van leave in the morning. I'll follow if I can. we have heard is not fanciful. It is reported on good authority that free Germany, for example, is infested with 3,000 spies who work for a country behind the Iron Curtain. They infiltrate and cause disruption. The result is a weakening of a free country. At the highest level, a spy steals or buys information vital to defense. He would not hesitate to take captive a scientist like Dr. Sam Jeffries. We'll follow the almost certain attempt when I return with Act Two. What is it that leads a person to become a spy? Money? Other jobs pay much more and usually provide security. Glamour? Hardly. If you're a spy, you're safe only as long as you're anonymous. What is it then that causes a man or a woman to choose this dangerous occupation? Danger is part of the challenge. It is more than that, though, but uh, more about that later. The man impersonating Dr. Jeffries has arrived in Nantucket. Who is it? Dr. Jeffries. Silos ain't just for corn. Eagles nest in quite a few. Come in, Sam. All set at this end? Yeah, the cottage is clean. Ike Folger and I checked it out from light bulbs to wiring, curtains, bed springs, everything. Okay. Even found a microfilament recorder in a flower arrangement sent here when the body was lying in wait. And, uh... The funeral tomorrow? Yep. Ten in the morning. There'll be a short service at Graveside. Hmm. They moved in pretty fast, didn't they? You must have done a good job in Washington. That's my fatal charm. Parker pretended not to like it, but it worked. I made a pass at his secretary, Miss Chase. Uh, Parker doesn't suspect her, does he? Uh-uh, no. The idea was to start some gossip. Ladies' rooms don't hold secrets. Someone learned I was coming up here. Someone determined to get to me or to remove me. Uh, we've been preparing for a month. Uh, the couple renting your mother's cottage agreed to move out for a week. Uh, we're putting them up at Nantucket Town at the White Elephant. All expenses paid. I told him you were coming up because your mother was dying. You had to settle the estate. She didn't object. My mother? She was delighted to be part of the counter-espionage. Even told us what flowers to order for her funeral. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, where have we got her tucked away? A visiting your sister and brother-in-law in Cambridge. They're discreet. My mother is not. She will be this time. She knows your life is on the line. You know that, of course. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> are you staying here, Addie? No, I'm the housekeeper come days, but go home at night. Have you got a gun? No, Parker decided against it. I'm supposed to be defenseless. Come to think of it, I am, except uh, for all you shadows. Well, one of them is next door. Ike. Ike Folger. He's recording what we say, and he'll be on guard until I return early in the morning. You'll sleep well tonight. Yeah, I can use it. I didn't sleep much at the airbase, that's for sure. Uh, let's see, it's quarter to twelve. Uh, one thing, Sam. Lock up and don't go outside till I return. We don't know which way they'll jump. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll try questioning you, or maybe they'll try a snatch. Yeah, any one of them been spotted? No, no one who's obvious. So, by noon tomorrow, I am a sitting duck. Yeah. That's the idea. Well, 
Okay, how do I get around? A bus to town, car? A moped. You rented one, and it's outside on the screened-in back porch. You'll, uh, you'll want to go to one of the beaches. Cisco, Surfside, Dionys. That's where you might be approached. You know how to play it, Sam. Oh, yes. Well, I'll just toddle along. The place is yours. Good night, Dr. Jeffries. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Winship. Good night. Now, that wasn't so bad, was it, Sam? Oh, his funeral skull, probably not. Mm -hmm. That was uh, quite a cast you assembled, Daddy. Well, the minister was real. He had to be told the purpose. Oh, his eyebrows went up and his eyes widened. <laughs> like most, spies to him are about as real as Martians. By the way, did you notice the woman on the bicycle who stopped by the side of the road and watched the funeral party for a few minutes? Not too clearly. But we had a man sightseeing at the old mill. Binoculars. He followed her back to Sconset. She's from Philadelphia and is staying at the Red Rooster, a block from the Rotary. Her name is Duncan. Hmm. Did you place a tracer on her? It's being done. I don't expect much from that. Is she long? Yeah. I'll have some information about her by supper time. Good. I'm having dinner at the Red Rooster. If you say so. I have to be seen, Addie. I know. All right, you'll have a couple of shadows. I'll wait until you return. And uh, now I'm going to head for a beach. A surfside. We have it covered. Okay, surfside it is. Watch the cross rip. If you drown before they move in on you, I'll never forgive you, Sam. Hello there. Uh, if you don't mind. Pardon me? Sorry. Bad habit of mine. Uh, you just go back to your book. I can't resist smiling at a beautiful woman. Uh, well, I didn't expect you to look like... like a halfback. Uh, do you mind if I sit down? You have. <laughs> Uh, what did you mean you didn't expect me to look like this? Do you know me? I don't know you. You're Dr. Samuel Jeffries, a very distinguished expert in all kinds of nuclear things. And uh, how would you know that? Is it true? Well, uh, yes, I am Sam Jeffries. I thought my whereabouts were unknown except to a very few persons. Have you, uh, have you seen me before? I've never seen you, or I would certainly remember. <laughs> Thank you. Your picture, just a headshot, was in the Intelligencer last week. Oh, well, that's news to me. Uh, and you? Edith Duncan. Uh, Mrs. Scott Duncan. I'm a, a widow. Oh. We've been coming to Nantucket for years. This time I came back alone. I won't again. Memories are too short. I'm leaving in a few days. Oh, so am I. I, uh... I have to come back to settle my mother's affairs. She was, uh, she was buried this morning. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is Mrs. Jeffries... Oh, there is no Mrs. Jeffries. Oh, married to your research? Yes, I guess so. And now it's too late. Well, you said you couldn't resist smiling at a beautiful woman. Well, that's one thing, but marriage has passed me by. I am much too old. <laughs> Well, I've, uh, I've taken enough of your time. No, 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 no. It isn't often I get to talk with a man of real distinction. Or, for that matter, a real man. Well, thank you. The article said you'd come up from Washington. Yes, true. I uh, report back on Monday, and then I return to Alamos. Oh, what's it like to know so much about something that the public cannot understand? All that... The nuclear stuff, the ICBMs, placements, reactors. What's it like? It's uh, just a job, that's all. Oh, but a very special job. Just, just what do you do, Dr. Jeffries? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> well, I wouldn't understand it anyway. But seriously, I've read... I've lots of time for reading... That our missile sites are no secret to the other superpower. Is that true? Probably. They're hard to conceal. So are theirs. Ah, then it's a stalemate. Uh, not, not in this chess game. There are many more pieces. Well, aren't you in, in danger? Only from you, Mrs. Duncan. <laughs> will, you, uh, will you have dinner with me tonight? 
Uh, well, I don't see why not. You'd better call me Edith. And I'm Sam. I'm staying at the Red Rooster in Wisconsin. Good. My house is only a few blocks away. I'll meet you at 7.30. Shall I make the reservation? Oh, that would be perfect. Uh, wait till they hear about this in Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sam. Well, have a good swim. Just fine. Who is she? <laughs> Walkie-talkie? Uh-huh. Ike reported that she found a spot on the beach close to yours and that you couldn't miss her. Bait? I think so. Bait. Sure. Her name is Edith Duncan. Beautiful. And smooth as cream. Uh-huh. Deadly bright, too. Did she check out? No, no trace of her in Philadelphia. It's an assumed name. Well, they sure got her in place in a hurry. There's a leak in Parker's division as big as a broken pipe. It's your job to plug it, Sam. Well, I have a date with her at 7.30 tonight at the Red Rooster. We can cover that easy. It's after dinner that she'll make her move. Hypnosis, probably. Oh, I can fake that. I was briefed for that routine. And then probably a dose of truth serum. I won't fight it. I don't know any secrets, just enough to make her wonder. I hope. We'll have the end staked out. You'll be all right tonight. I hope you have a strong stomach. So do I. Good luck, Sam. Freddy, it's me. I don't interrupt. All went as planned. Oh, Lord, he's a handsome man. Having dinner here at 7.30. Now, I don't know what I'll learn. He's bright. He could be the real thing. I don't know. If he's an imposter, he's pretty good. After I manage the test and get him to his house, I'll drive into town and report. I'll get what he has. If it's nothing, I'll know what we have to do. I'm ringing off. I'll see you late tonight. Dr. Jeffries. Real phony. Parker accepted him. Then why did Parker send Alfreda and Van up here to check him out? Well, they've given you a nice suite here, Edith, and dinner was excellent. Would you like an after-dinner drink, Sam? Oh, no, no, thank you. I'm full. Coffee? I'm going to have a cup. Well, it smells tempting. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll have a cup. Whack. I'll help you. No, 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 no. I won't be a minute. Make yourself comfortable, Sam. Thank you. Have you stayed here before, Edith? Oh, for years. I like to be waited on. So did Scott. It's close to the little business section in the tennis club. They show a movie there every week. Oh, here you are, Sam. Oh, thank you. Well, now, drink your coffee. <sighs> Gorgeous and efficient. Efficient? Yes, we... We walk in, you say, have some coffee, and in 30 seconds... <laughs> it was prepared. I thought you might want a cup. You, uh... You watch a fellow pretty close, don't you? Well, I've had reason to. You're a very nice man, Sam. Well, thank you. And, uh... I'm afraid a sleepy one, too. Well, take a little snooze. What's that? Isn't it lovely? Necklace with a big pendant. Emerald. I'll take it off. When I swing it back and forth slowly, it's a prism of colors. Watch it, and it will help you fall asleep. Yeah. Back and forth. Mm. Back and forth. Yeah. Back and forth. Oh. Are you, Dr. Jeffries? Dr. Samuel Jeffries, the expert in nuclear research. Jeffries, expert, logistics, silos, sabotage. Where are the silos, Dr. Jeffries? The silos where they keep the intercontinental missiles. Silos. In Dakotas, Nevada. Where else, Dr. Jeffries? Dakotas, Nevada. You plan to move the missile sites, don't you, Dr. Jeffries? Dakota. Tell me the truth. Tell me your plan for relocating the missile silos. Plan? 
in Washington. Your plan. There was something in coffee. Something to bring out the truth. My head hurts. Uh, Think of nuclear reactor plants. Nuclear reactor plants. Sabotage. What is your counter-sabotage plan, Dr. Jeffries? I feel sick. I'm going to feel a lot sicker, you phony. Oh, how do I get you out of here? Let's see. Uh, ice water. Hot coffee. Half an hour will do it. Oh, if you had been Dr. Jeffries, Sam, you might have lived. <laughs> A spy has insatiable curiosity that motivates him. So does patriotism. They risk their lives in the service of the country without public acclaim. Other so-called spies are no more than informers who eavesdrop for money. Dr. Sam Jeffries, if that is his real name, has placed himself in jeopardy to plug a security leak. We will find out what happens to the man, now condemned, when I return with Act Three. Who is Dr. Samuel Jeffries? We know that such a man is a scientist from Los Alamos. He is a man of great importance in our ongoing efforts to anticipate an attack and to defend against it. Is he being used as a cat's paw to help security root out the spies who have infiltrated that branch of our service? Or is the man we have met as Dr. Jeffries an imposter? Someone clever enough to be working for the enemy? It is the morning after his dinner with Mrs. Duncan. Oh, Lord. Well, good morning, Sam. Mm. Oh. Oh, hi. Hi, Addie. Oh, how did I get here? Well, the gorgeous Mrs. Duncan led you into the street and sent you staggering home. Well, good for me. Ike Folger said you weighed as much as a sack of cement. He brought you home. Well, you're alive. You know what that means. Yeah, I know. It means they know I'm not the real Dr. Jeffries. So, now what? Well, they're in a tough spot, Sam. You could blow the whistle on Edith Duncan and we could sweat her about her connections and security. Then we could find the security leak. Yeah, we can still do that, even if they knock me off. Well, we could try, but you're the witness we have to have. If they get rid of you, Mr. Parker's Operation Cat's Paw is blown. We have no evidence against Mrs. Duncan. Parker's tongue would be tied. I see. So, today might be the last day of my life, huh? That's too bad I feel so rotten. I've started breakfast. Addie. Edith Duncan alone can't eliminate me. Now, there must be others on the island here. Yep. And you're the bait. They'll act fast. Today? Yep. Mm. Well, I'll have breakfast and shower and shave and go for a walk. We'll have our eyes on you, Sam. Oh, by the by, mm -hmm. who is Freddie? Well, I don't know why. Well, last night she talked to some Freddie, made arrangements to meet at Steamboat Wharf. No one showed up. Hmm. Well, I'll ask her when I... Uh, put on a robe. I'll get it. Yeah, I'll do that. And I'll brush my teeth. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Edith Duncan. I'd, I'd like to see Dr. Jeffries. Uh, come in. He ain't feeling too good. Just getting up. Well, hello there, Edith. Oh, this is uh, Mrs. Winship, my housekeeper. Uh, how do you do? I'll just fix your breakfast, Dr. Jeffries. Well... You're even gorgeous in the morning. Oh, I worried about you all night long. Oh, I was all right. Uh, let me uh, apologize for uh, overindulging. <laughs> was I offensive? Oh, not at all. Just sleepy. I helped you out and told you to take a few deep breaths. I'm relieved that you got home. Oh, I'll be fine. So, what are your plans for this beautiful day? Oh, nothing much. We're having a clam bake tonight at Cisco. Uh, why? Oh, I thought we might sightsee, have lunch in Nantucket. Oh, that sounds fine. Oh, would you like to join us for an evening on the beach? Well, uh, sure, sure. If one more won't spoil the fun. I promise you won't. No, I won't. I won't. I don't like the morning after. 
So I'll uh, walk over to the uh, Red Rooster at uh, what's good, ten or so? Fine. I'll be expecting you, Sam. Good. Well, goodbye. Oh, what a slick, venomous... Uh, well? Well, the game is on. As Holmes said to Watson, Clambake tonight at Cisco. Me and some of her other friends. Human? The, uh... Assassination Squad. Come here, Andy. Uh, yes, Mr. Parker. Sit down. Tell me. Edith Duncan doped him last night, and Ike helped him home. She came by this morning. We're going sightseeing, and tonight he's invited to a clam bake at Cisco. That's when we round them up. Mm. And as soon as they make a move against Sam, we appear. It will be touch and go. Sam knows that. So far, he's done just fine. He's one of our best. I don't want to lose him. Uh, what's the layout, Mr. Parker? At five, you'll board the Rover 2. It's doctored. I know it. It has enough power to outrun most. That's just in case. The rover, too, will anchor a half mile offshore and wait to see what happens. There are rifles aboard. You're in charge, should they be needed. So you think they'll knock Sam out and drag him out to sea? That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Another is a small seaplane. We'll cover the beach. Ike is handling that end. I'll be there, too. Well, we just wait to see what happens. That's right. Have you seen Miss Chase or Van Phillips? They're here? Miss Chase was suspicious of our Dr. Jeffries. I agreed to let them fly up and keep an eye on him. I don't get it, Mr. Parker. If Dr. Jeffries is a phony, as Miss Chase suspects, she reasoned that the impersonation had been rigged by the enemy. Why? To give them time to get the real Dr. Jeffries out of the country. Oh, no, I get it. And? But Dr. Jeffries is safe and working in Los Alamos. Have you told Miss Chase? No. I want her to enjoy her short visit. Uh, what about the Coast Guard? Standing by. Mm hmm. There's a foreign freighter due off the coast at nine tonight. All clear? Yep. I admit I got butterflies, Mr. Parker. Just don't let them shake your hands, Eddie. You might have to make your first shot good. What's happened to your friends? Oh, they'll join us soon. <laughs> Why, Sam? Tired of my company? Ah, oh, you know better than that. Are you, uh... Really leaving tomorrow, Edith? On the nine o'clock flight. New York? Boston, and then from Logan to Philadelphia. Will I ever see you again? With you in Los Alamos? Oh, I doubt it. You will be there, won't you? As far as I know. Not Washington? Oh, I, uh, I report in when I'm asked. You're sure you don't work there? You, uh... Don't trust me, do you? Should I? I don't even know who you are. You're not Dr. Samuel Jeffries. And you're not Mrs. Edith Duncan from Philadelphia. Oh, you put me on the spot, Sam. You're a special agent, the cat's paw. You know what that means. Yes, I do. How is it to be done, Edith? Well, you've got guts, I'll say that for you. Does that make it harder? No. It's you or us. If you had been Dr. Jeffries, I think you'd have stayed alive. You'd be abroad and cooperating with us. Or squeezed dry and disposed of. But you caught the wrong pigeon. One who couldn't coo. You'd name me and you could destroy an espionage system that has taken years to get into place. That's why you have to die, Sam. What if I overpower you? Oh. Little but deadly. A mauser? You didn't think I'd arrange this farewell without a gun protecting myself. Oh, no, no. I expected something like this. So, you kill me and feed me to the sharks. Now, stand up and strip. 
and put on these swimming trunks. My last dip? You catch on fast, Sam. And just how do you explain my uh, accident? I won't have to. You joined me and my friends for the clam bake. Then we left. And what did I do? You said you'd follow on your moped. My moped is here? That's right. We said goodbye. You decided to have one more dip. See? Yes, I see. Foolproof. Okay, now what happens? Walk to the edge of the water. And if I refuse? I shoot you. Then what? We drag you into the water. We? You don't think I'm alone, do you? Oh. Why the flashlight? Look. Look out there on the ocean. Oh, I see. Someone flashed back. Van Phillips. He's in a Boston whaler and is coming to shore with a very sturdy rope. He'll tie your hands. The rope is attached to the boat. Van returns to it. And off you go. I drown. Your goon cuts my hands free. I'm washed ashore. Or the sharks get me. That's a pretty good idea. He's close. Hello, Edith. Hello, Dr. Jeffries. Well, once again, you're my chauffeur. That's right. Hold out your hands, please. Whatever you say. Cover me, Edith. I am. Not too tight, Dr. Jeffries. No, no, just fine. Uh Uh-huh. Now, follow me into the water. I don't want to jerk you from the shore. You'd scrape your stomach. Very considerate, ma'am. Have a nice trip back to Alexandria. Alexandria? Oh, something no. They set us up. Well done, Edith. Thank you, Alfreda. You know, I'm still not absolutely sure about him. I am. The real Dr. Jeffries is in Los Alamos. We better scatter the clam bake and get out of here. It's chilly on this beach. It's a rifle shot. Look, a speedboat's heading for the whaler. The spotlight. Van is hanging over the side. The woman in the bow. Well, that was Sam's housekeeper. She's got the rifle. Let's get out of here. All right, ladies. You can't get away, Edith. Ike! Edith! Don't move, Miss Chase. Ike Folger's a pretty good shot. Keep her covered, Ike. I'll go see about Sam. Eddie? Is he all right? Yeah, he's fine. He's swimming ashore. I was. Eddie. Eddie Plus Van Phillips. Here. Let me give you a hand. Yeah, thanks. Did you get him? <sighs> we got him, Sam. Okay. And what happened to Edith? Well, she tried to run away. Dead? I don't know. I'll check. We'll get her to a doctor. Well, hello, Miss Chase. Here, Sam. Use the handcuffs. Is she the one? Miss Chase is the one. Nothing to say, Miss Chase? Shut up. How did you work the caper, Ross? Well, we suspected that they'd try to dispose of you at sea. We anticipated them. That's all. Mm. By the way, that was some shot, Eddie. Oh, uh, what happened to Van Phillips? Dead. He's in the morgue. We'll ship him back to Washington. Mm. And Alfreda Chase and uh, Edith Duncan? Alfreda was the top agent. We have ways of destroying her network. She'll talk. So will Duncan. We'll clean out the nest. And what about Dr. Jeffries? Well, he'll be in Washington on Monday as planned. You see, Operation Cat's Paw worked. In every country in the world, the game of espionage and counter-espionage is played every day and night. Ferrets are at work to undermine the stability of countries. They wage wars that seldom reach the newspapers. Someone is deported, someone else is freed for a price. That we read about. Only a few such stories come to our attention. There are thousands that do not. I'll return with another observation shortly. Feeling fit, feel so good. Burning up the way, you know. I'm Susan Anton. The ultimate in feeling fit is sleeping on a perfect sleeper pillow soft. Extra thick comfort on top and ultra firm support inside. Perfect sleeper pillow soft. Be a perfect sleeper. Buy a perfect sleeper. Perfect sleeper. 
It's a healthy investment in yourself. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snap. Pour on the crap. Barbecue sauce. Only one barbecue sauce can give you the snap of this secret blend of 16 herbs and spices. Ours. Pour on the snap. Pour on the snack. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snack. Did you ever want to own your own business? It might be simpler than you think. We can take the mystery out of it. Here's the first clue. We're the largest instant printing chain in the world. Right. You got it. Postal Instant Press. Pip. Now, clue number two. You can get into a franchise for a lot less than you think, and the balance of the purchase price, after your down payment, will be completely financed by PIP at below the prime interest rate upon credit approval. We can bring a lot of witnesses, too. Take the man and wife running their own business and doing well. The singles who are part of PIP's success story. The retirees. Or many more in the growing PIP family. All of these people are just part of the evidence. PIP trains you, backs you, helps you get started, keeps you going. If you really want to be your own boss, take a tip from PIP. Call toll-free 800-331-1000, except in Oklahoma. For a solution that makes money and good sense, call 800-331-1000 right now. We have traveled this time not into the realm of the occult, but into a very real shadow world. For the present, the infiltration by spies into security has been stopped. It's almost inevitable that it will be tried again. The price of national security is tenacious vigilance by trained men and women who risk their lives and let the glory go. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Marion Seldes, Joan Shea, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Advice that is eloquently simple and speaks to the heart of the matter. And yet, is it humanly possible to travel through life without making a single judgment? And what of those who are empowered by society to weigh the fate of others in the scales of justice and render the decision of life or death? Joe, I wish you wouldn't talk about it. Why not? They can't touch me. The cops can't touch me, baby. I'm above the law. Well, somehow they they might just find No, it. no, never. No, no way. <sighs> I have the law 100% on my side. I mean, can you imagine? The law is on my side, finally. And the law says I can get away with murder. <laughs> mystery drama, Matched Pair for Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Arnold Moss and Christopher Tabori. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Marshal Tawny Lansdowne was named after two justices of the United States Supreme Court. And when he was little, he never wanted to be a fireman or a ball player like other small boys. He always wanted to become a judge. And he did. A very good one. With his snow white hair and piercing blue eyes, he even looks like a judge. And so you might ask, what's his problem? We'll get to it before long, but first... Let us concern ourselves with what caused it. 
All right, all right. The world isn't coming to an end. Now, Mr. Stroud, you've gone and lost your key again. Good evening, Mrs. Hart. What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be in Chicago? Well, do you want me to fix you something to eat? Hmm. Would you, Mrs. Hart? Well, a boy an egg with some dry toast. How about uh, sirloin steak? Rare. <laughs> Certainly. Some French fried potato. Oh, dream on, Mr. Strong. Do you have any apple pie? You take one bite of red meat and you're a dead man. And as for those sweets and starches, what's gotten into you tonight? You know Dr. Downing forbids you to touch any of it? Dr. Downing never forbid me to do anything. You must be thinking about my brother. Oh. Oh, it's you. Mr. Marvin Strong. Yes, it is I. The bad penny. That turns up once a month. I'd like to make it once a week. But my dear brother needs at least 30 days to simmer down after each of my visits. Don't you have any more pride than that, Mr. Stroud? Then what, Mrs. Harp? Then living off your brother's bounty. It's not my fault. If I was smarter than he is... He could live off mine. He isn't home just now. And did he leave the usual little envelope? I know nothing about that. Oh, come on, Mrs. Harp. I really don't know. Oh, I've never been able to get over it. It's like the two of you are one person. Same face, same voice. But when it comes to morals, you're as different as day and night. Do you realize, Mrs. Harp, I hear the same thing from you every month, word for word. I'm about to leave the house now. Tomorrow's my Thursday. Oh? Are you going to stay and wait for Mr. Stroud? I'm afraid I'll just have to. I'm too uh, financially embarrassed. When uh, did my brother say he'd be coming back? Some time this evening. Well, you don't have to postpone your leaving on my account. I'll just make myself at home here. I'm sure you will. In here! In here! Who are you? Melvin Stroud. This is my house. Who's the dead man? My, uh... My brother, Marvin... My twin brother. Where is he? Right through here. In my den. You can see. He's dead. Let me get that telephone. Tell me what happened. I don't know. I came home just a few minutes ago. I walked into the library here, and I saw my brother Marvin lying on the floor. Just like that. Does he live here? No. He's come to visit me. He does that once a month. Place looks torn up. Hello. This is Lieutenant Lewis. Uh, hold it a minute. Mr. Stroud. Has anything been taken? I don't know. Oh, who bothers to think at a time like this? Offhand, it does look like a robbery. Now, does anything seem to be missing? Yes. The silver tray on my desk. And look. The painting is hanging down. Uh, that's my wall safe. Has it been opened? No, no. I can see it's locked. Only I know the combination. Oh, my Lord. What is it? Poor Marvin. The thief, uh, the robber must have thought it was me. Uh, we're twins. Uh, he must have insisted that Marvin open the safe. Uh, Marvin couldn't do it. And so the fellow killed him. Hello, Gus. It's a robbery and homicide. Man's dead. Get over here and start the routine. The sign there says you buy old silver. Oh, yes, sir. At Porkins and Perry, you can expect the highest prices. Huh. Well, let me show you what I got here. Uh, this tray... A little pot and a pitcher. Well, now, that is a fine-looking tea set. It <laughs> sure is. I must ask you for proof of ownership. Well, it's a family heirloom. Could you uh, identify yourself? 
Well, what do you want to see? Uh, my driver's license? Sure. Mr. Joseph uh, Talley. Oh, but you're from out of state. Well, what what else can I show you? Do you know anybody in town who can vouch for you? Well, yeah, sure. I I, I know Miss Marietta Winslow. Winslow? Is, uh, is she the daughter of the big real estate operator, Winslow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the girl I'm going to marry. Yeah, this picture I clipped from the Sunday paper is the picture of the two of us engaged. I see. <laughs> now, about the silver. Oh, yes, 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 the silver. It's a most unusual piece, but heirloom, obviously, English. You could have something extremely valuable here. Let me check the hallmarks. Where's the... Oh, the book is in the back. Wait a second, I'll, I'll go get it. Hello? Hello? Is this the special police number for the Stroud murder? Well, I'm not sure that this is anything. The man is obviously a respectable person, but this silver tea service checks out exactly with the description you set out. <laughs> Porkins and Perry at the corner of Sixth and Maiden. Oh, yes. Yes, I can keep talking to him. You say you found the silver tea tray, Joe. Yeah, I found it, Lieutenant. Where? I told you, it was just lying on the street near the curb. You didn't by any chance find it in Mr. Stroud's library after you killed his brother. I didn't kill him. And I wasn't in his house. Footprints around the back match your shoes, Joe. Yeah, I wear an eight and a half D, and so do millions of other guys. We have witnesses that put you in the neighborhood. And, of course, you just did a three to five for armed robbery. That's right. I already did it. I paid the price. So that one's squared, isn't it? Tell me something, Joe. On the level now, how did you get that tea set? Oh, Joe. Joe, I thought all that was over. Finished. Behind you. Honey, it is. Believe me, believe me, it is. It's it's just a, I I saw this package and and it was it was just lying there on the ground. Mm. Sure, I know I I should have picked it up and brought it to the police, turned it in. Yeah, but I uh, I. Yes, Joe. I just weakened for a minute. Can you understand that? I can understand. I would never steal again. But I said to myself, I mean, this isn't stealing exactly. I'm just picking something off the street. I know it's crazy. I know it now. I wanted money to buy you something. An engagement present. Oh. And I saw this silver and I thought, oh. It was so dumb. What are, what are we going to do? The district attorney wants to go to trial. Yeah, I know guys like him. He figures I got a record. He can railroad me home for this thing. Uh, I don't know what got into me. But it's really only circumstantial evidence. Yeah, and that's what most evidence is. Honey, look, just just believe me. I'm innocent. Come on, tell me you believe me. Yes, my darling. I believe you. Session Judge Marshal Taney lands down presiding. Please rise. And thus another one begins. Another play of human emotions that's more powerful than anything ever witnessed in a theater. How much comedy and tragedy have I presided over and conducted? Yes, that's the right word. The judge conducts a trial the way a maestro leads an orchestra and brings it subtly to his own conclusion. Well, now, what have we here this time? The People versus Joseph Walter Emmons. Yes, sir. Mr. Marvin Stroud arrived at the house at about seven that evening. I knew it was seven because I was getting ready to catch the 7.30 bus. I left him there alone in the house 
to wait for his brother, Mr. Melvin Stroud. I came home and I found the body of my brother on the floor in the library. It was about 10 p.m. I called the police. We entered the premises. We found the body of Mr. Marvin Stroud on the floor, as has already been attested to. You could see there was a bullet wound in the chest. Yes, sir. There were definite signs of robbery. The prosecution was laying the groundwork, and they seemed to have a pretty good case. I looked at the defendant. He had a record. He was, in my opinion, a bit too sleek and handsome, but this must not be allowed to influence anyone's judgment. And then I noticed her. She was sitting as close to him as the law could allow. I've never seen such faith, trust, and love in a woman's eyes. She believed him. And this could have an effect on the jury if she made them aware of it. Yes, sir. He brought in the tray. You see, we're dealers in gold and silver, porkins and perry, at sixth and baited. It was exactly as described in the police circular. But naturally, I notified the authorities at once. I wasn't going to have any traffic in stolen goods. It was a strong statement. As he made it, I could see the words pierce right into the jury. The defense counsel didn't see fit to intervene. I saw it was time for me to take command of the trial. Mr. Porkins. Yes, Your Honor. At the time the tray was brought into your shop, did you know for a fact that it had been stolen? Well, Your Honor, I... Uh, uh... You suspected that it might be stolen, however. Oh, yes, because it, it tallied pretty closely with the information on the circular. Well, earlier you said it tallied exactly. And now you say pretty closely. Well, what I bet was, Your Honor, it looked like it. But at the time you could not say for certain under oath that the tray had been stolen. Uh, no. No, Your Honor. Very well. You may proceed with your questioning, Mr. Dayton. I must say it did not look too promising for the defendant. Mr. Joe Emmons was headed for a guilty verdict even at this early stage unless something happened. The defense wasn't doing too well even on cross-examination. Yes, I knew the defendant. I was the arresting officer for his previous conviction. And that was a robbery, like this one, of a rich man's house. It wasn't getting better. The defense didn't have much of a case. Things were going steadily downhill when suddenly she jumped to her feet. He's innocent. I tell you, he's innocent. Now, miss, you must be seated. Oh, please. You'll be given a chance to testify at the proper time. But I must be heard now. I'm sorry. I must ask you to sit no down. No one wants to believe him. Everyone's convinced Miss, he's I guilty. must ask you to... It's a matter of life and death. I know he's innocent. I know Now, look, I told you, you'll have a chance to present your evidence. But I have no evidence. I just know in my heart that he's innocent. Miss, I can sympathize with your feelings, but I cannot permit you to disrupt this trial. Unless you promise to sit quietly and be orderly, I'll have you barred from this courtroom. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. I understand. You may proceed with your questions, Counselor. And on that note, we shall proceed with our usual between the acts intermission. What we seem to have here is one of those open and shut trials where the defendant is obviously guilty. But who was it that said, beware of the obvious, it is usually devious? We shall continue shortly. The purpose of a trial is to discover or construct what really happened. 
There is a welter of charges, countercharges, affirmations and denials, and from all this ferment, there rises the essence of truth. And what is truth? Isn't it odd? We may spend a lifetime looking for it, and when we finally encounter it, we may not even know it. Young lady, what are you doing in my car? Your Honor, I must talk to you. Oh, it's you. You want to discuss the case. I must. Well, that's impossible. Oh, please, Your Honor. And it's illegal, certainly highly unethical. I must tell you something. Only in court and on the record. I met him in jail. I was with a committee that tried to do things for convicts. I... We... It happens. We... We fell in love. Miss, I must ask you to get out of my car. He never had a chance. But I knew. A woman knows. Her heart tells her when a man is sincere. I know he's innocent. It would be awkward if I were forced to call a police officer. I'm right. I, I know I'm right. And that's all I wanted to tell you. It was touching. And I didn't realize at the time how deeply I was touched. There was something about this girl, something so, so real, so genuine. You just knew she was telling you the truth. And when she was finally called as a character witness for the defense, you could sense how everyone wanted to believe her. I know how difficult it is for a man like Joe Emmons to be believed. It's so easy to classify and reject him as an ex-con. But he's a human being. And he has changed. Of course, he shouldn't have tried to sell the silver tray. But a man can't change all at once. Then and there, I set the direction. The jury instinctively wanted me to guide them. They tried to read me. Well, it wasn't difficult to get the hint and feel the drift. Yes. I saw a man coming out of the house that night. Uh, I didn't think anything of it at the time. I, uh, why should I? But I remember him very well. Yes, yes. It was the defendant. Let me understand this. You say you saw the defendant. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Well, where were you? I was across the street. It had to be the boulevard. Oh, y yes, sir. The, the boulevard. It's pretty wide in that neighborhood, isn't it? Oh, you could say that, Your Honor. And it was a dark night. Well, it had been raining. It just stopped. How far would you say it was from where you were standing to where you had seen the defendant? Oh, 50, 60 yards, maybe. About half the length of a football field. And at that distance, on a dark night, you could see him clearly. Well, uh, it, uh, it, it looked like the defendant. Yeah, but that's not what you said before. You testified that you saw the defendant. Well, uh, it might have been the defendant. It's almost unbelievable. But all you need is just one little loose thread, and before you know it, the entire fabric begins to come apart. The fact is, in most trials, the jury believes those whom it wants to believe. And so, after I had charged the jury, they went out, and in time, it returned with a verdict that really surprised no one. We find the defendant, Joseph Emmons, not guilty. And that was that. I was convinced that justice had been done. A few weeks later... Your Honor, I'm Detective Lieutenant Lewis. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember you, Lieutenant Lewis. I, uh, I guess you heard about it from the DA. No, I haven't heard anything. I've been out of the country on vacation. There's nothing to be done about it anyhow. But we blew the Stroud murder case. What's that, Lieutenant? There's no other way to put it. There was a mistake... Well, whatever are you talking about? Joe Emmons is guilty. Well, not on the basis of the evidence presented by the district attorney. Well, that's just the problem. He didn't have all the evidence, especially the one piece that would have nailed the door shut. Joe Emmons' fingerprints. Well, why not? We found some of his prints in the library. Well, that would be undeniable proof that he was there. Yeah, but there was a mistake of some kind or other. It happens. And the prints just got mixed up. 
uh, that's all. That's all? Well, it got mixed up by accident, then it got straightened out by accident. But by that time, the whole trial was over. The DA says we're out of luck. Emmons was acquitted. If you try him again, it's double jeopardy. Is that right? It would seem to be. Oh, it kills me to see him get away with this. It would appear that he has. Sir, you're considered one of the top judges in the country. Yeah, I wonder. Could maybe something occur to you? Some kind of legal angle. Like what? Your Honor, if I knew like what, I wouldn't have to ask. Those were definitely his fingerprints. Yes, sir. No doubt. No question. Uh, let me think, Lieutenant. Maybe something will occur to me. Just a minute, honey. Oh. Hello, Judge Lansdowne. May I come in, Miss Winslow, or have you become Mrs. Emmons? Soon. <laughs> Maybe not tomorrow, but soon. Oh, come in, Judge. You, uh, you love Joe. That's obvious. I want you to do something for him, for both of you. Will you? Of course. Joe murdered Marvin Stroud. Oh, I knew that. You knew that? He just told me. But the jury came up with a verdict of not guilty. So, he's out of it. Yes, I see. What do you see, Judge? A great deal. You took advantage of me, didn't you? Me? Oh, you're a marvelous little actress. <laughs> That's the way the world goes round, Judge. I had come here thinking that you might help me. To do what? Promise not to laugh. I promise. I wanted you to convince Joe to confess his guilt, waive his rights not to be tried under double jeopardy, and accept some sort of punishment for his crime. See? I kept my promise. I didn't laugh. You're a strange young lady. I did it to teach my father a thing or two. And I'm going to marry Joe Emmons because that'll destroy the old gentleman. And that's the only reason, hmm? Well, Joe's very good looking. I could do worse, even if he is stupid. Why did he have to commit that murder and get involved in that robbery? Oh, it's just that he gets carried away sometimes. Well, you certainly aren't planning a very happy life for yourself, are you? Well, well, we got a visitor. Hello there, Judge. Hello, Joe. The judge says you're guilty, dear. Uh, not according to the law. Isn't that right, Judge? Legally, right. But ethically and morally, wrong. <laughs> you can't have everything. I was hoping you could come forward, admit your guilt, and ask for some sort of punishment. Why would I want to do that, Judge? Because you happen to be guilty. You were there when the jury brought in the verdict. Why should I rock the boat? Well, for one thing, you'll be able to sleep at night. Oh, don't let that bother you, Judge. I always sleep like a log. Well, we'll see what happens. Yeah, what can happen? I know the law, Judge. I learned it the hard way. Well, I know something of the law myself. It's full of surprises. I need your help, Lieutenant. Me, Your Honor? What can I do? I don't really know. We'll have to break new ground. What does that mean? Well, right now, from a legal point of view, he's safe and secure. Well, if you're convinced of that, shouldn't this be the end of it? Yes, ordinarily. But I want that man set up. Your Honor, are you taking this person? Absolutely. Well, things like this, they're hard to swallow, I admit, but it happens. You get a guy who committed a crime, everybody knows it. Sometimes you even see the blood on his hands. But he walks out of that courtroom a free man. Why? Because of a technicality in the law. Well, it's all my fault. He should have been convicted. Why do you say that, Judge? I could never explain it to your satisfaction, but... I want you to help me put this man away. Your Honor, I have to keep asking. How? See if we can unearth some new evidence. Well, maybe we could do that, but what's the use? No matter what we come up with, we still can't try him for murder again. Can we? Can 
we? On that legal point, we shall pause for our intermission. Let us briefly review. The legal situation seems to be clear. You can't be tried twice for the same crime. That would seem to be one of the basic support killers of our criminal justice system. But who knows what can happen when you get into a courtroom. We should find out in Act 3. face of it, it seems a rather simple crime, but if you look beneath it, you are lost in a maze of complications. First, a judge who has succumbed to a sudden feeling of vulnerability. Second, a very spoiled, rich young lady who wishes to get back at her father for wrongs that are real or fancied or does it matter. Third, a rather stupid thief who could be sitting on top of the world, but was unable to break a lifetime habit of crime. Fourth, a mistake in the police laboratory. And fifth, a law against double jeopardy. The pot is simmering nicely. What's the use of collecting evidence, Your Honor? He can't be tried again. You know that better than anybody else. It's not for this crime. But maybe we can get him for another one. Yeah, well, that's going to be a long, hard road to travel. And we can't even be sure it could lead us anywhere. But you will help me, Lieutenant. I will. But you'll have to tell me how... How did I even know myself? The lieutenant is right. Let it go. You win some, you lose some. But I'd lost a great deal more. I'd practically directed that verdict of acquittal. I had helped this man escape justice. I simply refused to sit back and do nothing. And so... Grasping at straws. Yes? Oh, it's the judge. How do you do, Mrs. Hart? Oh, fine, sir. Would you care to come inside? Thank you. Mr. Stroud isn't home at the moment. That's all right. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Me? Oh, well, won't you sit down? No, what can I tell you about anything? I'm not sure. Mrs. Hopp, what happened here the night Mr. Marvin Stroud was murdered? What happened? Well, sir, he came here like I told them at about seven. Was he a frequent visitor? Oh, no, sir. Just about once a month to pick up his check. Well, what check was that? He was what the English in all those stories I read call a remittance man. He'd be paid off regularly just to keep away. Why? The two brothers were as alike as, well, the proverbial piece in the pod on the outside. Inside, you might say, Marvin, may he rest in peace, was a mass of corruption. While Mr. Melvin is the very soul of, I suppose you could say, righteousness. They were identical twins. Oh, yes. Yes. I think that was mentioned at the trial. Anyhow. Marvin squandered his money in record time. Marvin kept on, keeps on, increasing his. And he kept supporting his brother, you say? Oh, yes. And I remember he would say to him, this will only be here for you while I am alive. When I'm dead, you won't see a penny, so mend your ways. Because all my money goes to a selected list of schools and foundations. You say they were diametrically opposed in personality and character. Without any doubt. Mr. Melvin had no use for poor Mr. Marvin. Poor Mr. Marvin? I think he was mentally sick. The way he carried on. But he would infuriate Mr. Melvin. That's a strong word. But it fits. There were times when Mr. Melvin would say to me, I could kill that scoundrel. Just because he disapproved of his brother's way of life? It went deeper than that. I think, well, I know, Marvin broke their father's heart. Melvin could never forgive him. But still he supported him. Why? Because in the end, he would say, blood is thicker than water. Besides, Mr. Melvin could die at any time. Why? Why? He has these very bad ulcers. 
He had a great many intestinal operations. But he would still become furious with his brother. Oh, yes, yes. He would rant and rave. But in the end, he would relent. And ah, this is really all I can tell you. I hope it helped. I have a report here for you, Judge. On Mr. Melvin Stroud. Good. Uh, he's an investor. He's very well thought of, very rich, very moral, very ethical. Not a breath of scandal. Now, this is what I get from his associates. What else? What else can there be? This is the original straight arrow. Did anyone mention his having a temper? Oh, yeah, he could uh, explode, but he'd always apologize and uh, make up for it. In describing his temper, did anyone ever use the word violent? Violent? No, no, not not, not exactly, but uh, I, I did sort of get the impression that word could uh, sum it up. All right, let's try for another word. How about vindictive? How did he behave toward anyone who might have done him an injury of some sort? Uh, what did somebody say? He, he used your word. Melvin wouldn't exactly be vindictive, but he would always make sure that person paid for it in the end. Well, we may have a theory. Rich Melvin killed his brother, poor Marvin. Why? Well, he never forgave Marvin for breaking their father's heart. No, no, I don't think so. Well, why not? You've had murders committed for less, and Melvin was a man of sudden outbursts of strong temper. I'll give you all that, Judge. But you know as well as I do that Joe Emmons is the killer. Why do we know that? He was there. His fingerprints. Could we be talking about two separate and distinct crimes? Marvin comes on his monthly visit to collect money. Melvin loses his temper. He kills his brother. He leaves the house. He plans to return after a while and say he found the body. And he hopes we'll believe it was done by a robber. Two things. First, how about the gun? We, he could have had a gun. I don't think so. He would have had to get a permit. He wouldn't want the publicity, a man like him. Well, therefore, he would have an illegal gun. Maybe. Well, then, by a coincidence, Joe Emmons happens along. He's had the place set up for a robbery. He may have cased it. He knows the housekeeper goes off Wednesday nights. He breaks in. He sees the body on the floor. He figures he'd better get out, but... But first, he picks up whatever he can find. Judge, you're giving me another coincidence. You know, life itself is filled with coincidences. Aren't people always leaving incriminating documents lying around? Yeah, sure, but why should Joe go around saying now that he beat the murder up? If he isn't guilty of murder, why should he admit to it? Well, because he... Because he's a punk. And this makes him a big man. Maybe, maybe, but... I still say he's the killer. Do you really think Melvin did it? I don't know. It's just something to think about. Besides, it's the only other possibility. What are you saying, Judge? Mrs. Harp, I don't believe you told me the truth. I never told a lie in my life. Mr. Stroud would never tolerate a liar. Concerning Mr. Stroud... You've been helping him maintain a deception, haven't you? Judge, what are you trying to tell me? You've painted a picture of this highly moral, deeply religious human being. Is it possible that Melvin Stroud could have murdered his brother in a fit of temper? No, sir. I would swear to it. Well, then don't. We've had Mr. Stroud under surveillance. He gambles, he drinks... He's quite a man for the ladies, in a very discreet way, of course. That's impossible. Alcohol would kill him. I suppose he had you fooled too, Mrs. Harp. I had nursed that man through four separate operations. I know what's left of his stomach. If you don't believe me, just ask his doctor. Poor Mr. Marvin, maybe. But Mr. Melvin, never. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Stroud. Why, it's Judge Lansdowne. What, what, what are you doing in a place like this? Oh, I was told I might find you here. You mean you're looking for me? <laughs> what for? Justice. What can I do for justice? 
tell me how it happened. I don't follow you. It's a pretty clear trail. To begin with, you can't be Melvin Stroud. I spoke to his doctors. Melvin Stroud could never survive the pace of the life that you're leading right now. Oh, that? Well, I feel better. Let's say I've had a miracle cure. It would have to be a fantastic miracle. You know what it says? Believe and be saved. Of course. But no matter how strongly, no matter how deeply and sincerely you may believe... You can never get certain things back inside your body once they've been removed, such as a kidney, a gallbladder, and a few other things. What would your body reveal under x-ray? Now, I really need a drink. You might have carried it off had you also tried to live Melvin's kind of life. I'd sooner be dead. How did it happen? Oh, I... I come there for the usual handout. He wasn't home. I was hungry. And, uh, you know, there isn't a thing to eat in that house. They have tea and toast and eggs, period. I figured I'd go out and have a steak. And I did. When did you leave the house? About 7.30. I went to a place down the road. I came back about an hour later. So, you see, I have an alibi. If I need one. But nobody's accusing you of murder. I returned, and there he was, dead on the floor. The place had uh, been pretty well gone over. As I say, he was dead. There was no way I could help him, but I could still help me. So I just changed clothes with him, quickly, and let the world think it was Marvin Stroud who had been murdered. You actually thought you could get away with it? I almost did, didn't I? If only I could control my appetite for the ladies and the liquor. Your Honor, you've got me. Can I be prosecuted for anything? It won't be anything serious. And by the time we get it all straightened out, you may even get off. I was crazy to think I could carry it off. It's funny, the whole business. Here was my brother Melvin, straight as a guy... And he was sick and weak all his life. And me? <laughs> How I lived it up. And I am as strong as a bull. How do you figure it, Your Honor? I don't know. Maybe it's part of a plan. What kind of plan? A way to create justice. Lieutenant Lewis, would you like to come with me? Where? To see Joe Emmons. Joe Emmons? What for? I've signed a warrant for his arrest. For what? Murder. What murder? The Stroud murder. But, Judge, we can't try him for that one again. I agree. I'd like to be with you when you arrest him. Judge, I sure hope you know what you're doing. Hello, Miss Winslow. What do you want? Is this the angelic Miss Winslow whose innocence and sincerity actually seduced me from my impartial duties as a judge? What do you want, Judge? Well, to come in for one thing. Is he home? He's in the other room. Do I detect signs of strain here? Is the romance wearing thin? Is the price of defying Daddy proving a bit steep? Well, I can't go running back now. Dear Daddy would never let me forget it. Well, maybe the lieutenant and I can come to your rescue. Tell Joe we'd like to see him. What for? Well, I think he should be the first to hear it. Joe, somebody here to see you. I sure hope you know what you're up to, Judge. Lieutenant, everything is in order. Well, look who's here, the law. Oh, a very big law at that. What can I do for you, Judge? Tell him, Lieutenant. Joseph Emmons, I have here a warrant for your arrest. For the murder... Lieutenant, you can't arrest me for that anymore. Arrest you and convict you. This time, the prosecutor will have the fingerprints that place you right there in the room. I got news for you, Judge. He could have a videotape showing me shooting Marvin Stroud, and you still can't try me for the murder. 
Well, you're not accused of murdering Marvin Stroud. He's not? Well, of course not. He didn't murder Marvin. Well, who did he murder? Read the warrant. For the murder of Melvin Stroud. Oh, but you can't. Double jeopardy says that it you... It says nothing at all to help you here. It's a new corpse, a new case. Lieutenant, read him his rights. Yes, his rights. And they included his obligations as well, which required him to stand trial before a jury of his peers who considered the evidence carefully and returned with the verdict of guilty, as you would expect. You may also expect me to return in just a few minutes. code of justice, and the words may be written in letters of fire or engraved in eternal stone. But whatever the words may say, they must receive an interpretation. And this can only come from a human being. Thus we have the dilemma. A man who has all the human frailties is called upon to decide the absolute. A judge, after all, is no better a man or a woman than the rest of us. How then can we expect him to play the part of God? Our cast included Arnold Moss, Christopher Tabori, E.V. Jester, and Bernard Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... theories advanced as to whether, how, if, and if so, why, Lizzie Borden took that axe and, as the verse goes, gave her mother 40 whacks, and then when she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Lizzie was acquitted, but the suspicion of her guilt remains. Until today, when we probe that classic mystery and take a second look at the murder of her parents. Happy... I tell you, you have got to stop that running after that Matthew fellow. You're a married woman. Think of our daughters, Lizzie and Emma, if you won't think of me. You... Stop that. Abby, stop it, I say. Stop laughing at me. I'll make you stop. You like it, don't you? Me being laughed at. Andrew Borden, his marriage is a joke. He can't keep his wife at home. I've, I've done it now. Our mystery drama, Second Look at Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Roberta Maxwell. I shall return shortly with Act One. are always asking, where do you find your mystery dramas? To which we invariably reply, everywhere. From the forgotten past to the distant future. Today's tale, however, comes from a different source. A young reporter from a newspaper we'll call the Boston Courier promised that if we gave him one hour on mystery theater, he could solve that historical crime enigma, the case of Lizzie Borden. And so we took him up on it. Friends, here is Mr. John Howard. Thank you. Um, I grew up in Fall River, Massachusetts, so the Lizzie Borden murder case was pretty familiar. Lizzie was tried and acquitted of the murder of her stepmother and father right in our new Bedford County Courthouse back in the 1890s. Now, last fall, my girlfriend Louisa and I were hiking up by the profile rock in the woods outside of Fall River. Uh, Louisa! 
Uh, Duck, uh, get down on the ground, flat. John, it's only someone hunting. Uh, I don't feel like becoming a target. You don't think we could get shot by some hunter? I sure do. We're neither of us wearing red, so if we move, that jerk with a rifle could mistake us for a deer. And we'll, we'll crawl back the way we came. On all fours? We're not standing up with that maniac around. Yes, on all fours with our tails between our legs. Louisa, are you hit? No, no. Something very hard and sharp cut through my trouser leg. Look at that mark on my knee. It's going to be some bruise. Uh, Louisa, down there by your foot, do you see what I see? That's what you scraped your knee on, this, this old hatchet. Wouldn't you know it? Hundreds of square miles of virgin forest, and I have to walk into the one sharp axe. What'd you say? Uh, no, I know what you said. You didn't say hatchet. You said axe. Look at that rust. That's been lying there a long time. Oh, it's been here a long, long time. Oh, why'd you say axe, honey? Well, probably because Fall River is so close, and Fall River makes me think of Lizzie Borden, who lived there. And Lizzie Borden makes me think of that rhyme. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. And then when she saw what she had done, she gave her father... 41. 41. Louisa, whoever killed Lizzie's mother and father didn't use an axe. They used a hatchet. They never found a murder weapon back in 1892. This could be it. <laughs> How can you prove it? Oh, take it to the police here. Fall River has a very good crime lab, and the man in charge is an old friend of mine, Sergeant McCauley. Of course, that hatchet was a slim start, but it was a beginning. Uh, did I mention that I write feature stories for The Courier and Louisa edits our women's page? That's how we met at work. Well, now, if by any chance this was the long-lost murder weapon used in Andrew and Abby Borden's death, and I could prove it, and prove who used it, you, uh, see the way my mind was working? Me, John Howard, getting a Pulitzer. Local reporter cracks murder mystery after 90 years. Discovers identity of murderer of Lizzie Borden's mother and father. Quote, What I'm most grateful about, said John Howard today, is that I have vindicated the reputation of my great-grandfather, Justice Earl Howard, who declared Miss Borden innocent. <laughs> I'd like you to meet Louisa Cahill. She's on the courier, too. Uh, this is uh, Sergeant McCauley, whom I told you about. He runs this lab. Welcome, Miss Cahill. Uh, John, I'm not sure we've come up with the results you were hoping for. Now, let me show you why. Follow me. <laughs> Anything at all would be helpful, Mac. We're uh, starting from scratch. You're starting from rust. Now, over here is where we examined that rusty old hatchet of yours... We put it through this spectrograph, and on the handle, we found minute traces of what may be type O, human blood, and another type not yet identified. Oh, Mac, I'm a fool. Even if you came up with both blood IDs, how could it be matched up with those of the victims? Why not? They're both long dead and buried. Who are they? Lizzie Borden's mother and father. afraid we struck out, Louisa. I don't know what I was thinking of. Macaulay was sweet and tried to be helpful, but he had no idea what you were trying to prove. And you know something, John? Neither do I. Well, yeah. even after Lizzie Borden was acquitted, still everyone thought she was guilty. Why was that? Was she or wasn't she? Well, she lived in a small house in this town, and presumably if her stepmother and father were bludgeoned to death, she would have heard something. But she said she heard nothing. There was only herself and an Irish maid in that house. The mother was killed first at 9 or 9.30, then the father an hour later. No clues, no murder weapon, no blood on any of Lizzie's clothes. Now do you see why I want to know more? No, I don't. How does it concern you and why? I have to prove that Lizzie Borden was innocent. But why? After all these years, why? I, I'd rather not say. Trust me, Louisa, I'll tell you soon. But... Now, you can help get me all the background so I can really have the facts. I suppose I could shoot into Boston and check our morgue. The university library has a great collection of old newspapers. I've used them for fashions of the past. That's my best bet for the news coverage of those days. 
John, how long can you take on this story? Yeah, I called the old man, told him I had a good feature idea, and I wouldn't be in the office till I nailed it down. Did he give you the green light? Mm, but no green paper. I can remain here in Fall River so long as I foot my own hotel and meal bills. How chintzy. Did you tell him what he could do with his proposal? Hey, I accepted it. So I'm booked into the Hamilton house. Well, okay, I'll go now and get you the info you want. If I wasn't crazy about you as a girl, I'd admire you as a reporter's leg man. <laughs> so long. John. Mm hmm? Was that a compliment? Hello? John? Louisa. Hey, you got back to me awful fast. Where are you? Boston. I found something you might want to investigate right away, so I thought I'd call. In the trial, three witnesses testified that Lizzie Borden bought some prussic acid on August 3rd, the day before the murders. Well, does it say where? Right in Fall River. Hmm. Uh, which drugstore? Parsons, corner of Maine and Maple. Hey, I know that place. I used to get sodas there when I was a kid. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's John Howard. Um, I used to live here in town. I'm a feature writer with a Boston Courier. <laughs> I guess uh, yours is the oldest drugstore in town. The oldest in Massachusetts. Hmm. Are you one of the Parsons family? Uh, Ed Parsons. Ed was also my father's name and my grandfather's. He had this drugstore right in the same spot, corner of Maine and Maple. Hmm. Well, I'm doing a story on the Lizzie Borden case, and... Oh, I thought people had forgotten all about that by now. Some of us can, some of us can't. So? In the Commonwealth's case against Lizzie, three witnesses swore that your great-grandfather sold her prussic acid the day before the murders. Mm, if he did, there uh, must have been good reason. Is there any way of finding out? Could be, could be. Uh, what time is it? Uh, I make it, uh, five o'clock. Uh, I tell you, I'll lock up and take it down to the cellar. I think we've got some old records going back pretty far. 1870, 80, 90, and who knows? They may tell us something. Well, what do you make of that, Mr. Howard? It's pretty conclusive. You can't get more conclusive than that, I'd say. Hmm, I don't think anybody's ever been through these old ledgers. Here it is in black and white. August 3rd, 1892, sold to Miss L. Borden, Digitalis. <laughs> no mention of prussic acid. Not anywhere in this 1892 ledger did your great-grandfather sell anybody prussic acid. He sold her Digitalis. Well, of course... That's poison, too. Well, I thought it was a drug to regulate the heart. It still is. No, I mean, taken in quantity, it could cause death. But as you say, probably it was a prescription from some person in a family who had a heart condition, I would imagine. Ed Parsons, we have hit on something. place really called the pen and ink? <laughs> yeah, it's Fall River's tribute to the newspaper guild. <laughs> well, the food is good, the beer is cold, it's my favorite hangout. Uh, now that we've ordered, uh, what have you got for me? This envelope is full of goodies for you, John. Copies of news stories during and after the trial. There were three judges, but the main one, you may not believe this, was Justice Earl Howard. Howard? Any relation? Uh, it's a common neighbor around here. Uh, what do these newspaper stories say? Oh, there was a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. Judges, lawyers, after Lizzie was acquitted, saying that the trial was a mockery, that the evidence offered by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts should have been enough to convict her, but that the misrulings by the court and an improper charge to the jury was the main reason Lizzie Borden got off. Mm, the heat's not off the main judge yet. Also... Another violent death in this town a month after Lizzie's parents were murdered. I've got it in that envelope. Well, how's that death connected with our case? A man called Matthew Turner, an itinerant painter who used to go from house to house doing portraits and miniatures. He was found with his face down in the pond. Some said he was drunk and fell in. Others said there was more to it. Meaning? He'd done a miniature of Lizzie's stepmother. 
And the scuttlebutt was, after the trial, it was Lizzie who somehow found him drunk, hit him, and pushed him into the pond. Huh. Any motive? Jealousy, I guess. Oh, that poor lady. She's accused of almost every murder in Massachusetts. Uh, how was his death connected with Lizzie? He had a woman's handkerchief tied round his neck with the initials A.B. Abby Borden, the murdered stepmother. I'll be darned. Louisa, I love you. That is great investigative reporting. John, just now you said the heat is not off that judge yet. What did you mean? I did promise to tell you, didn't I? Uh, the main judge, Earl Howard... Uh, he was my great-grandfather. After Lizzie was acquitted, he was hounded to an early grave by countless people who believed her guilty. He had to move from town. No matter where he went, he suffered disgrace and ostracism. That's why when you found that hatchet, I decided I had to prove he was right. That Lizzie Borden was innocent. <laughs> prejudiced, and even impartial souls have argued Lizzie Borden's guilt or innocence. Except for an Irish maid whose complicity was never questioned, Lizzie was alone in the house when the killings took place. Her only defense was denials. Someone else must have entered and murdered. Now we may have still another theory given us by a guest of the Mystery Theater, one John Howard, who will tell us more when we return with Act Two. Mystery Theater are not adding more fuel to the burning suspicion that the famed Lizzie Borden was truly guilty of chopping up her parents. Nor are we throwing cold water on past pros and cons. Rather, with the help of reporter John Howard, we are taking a second look at a murder so that a judge's reputation will not also die. John Howard continues his investigation. <laughs> I sat down in my hotel room the following day and began to write the story as I saw it and as I thought it made sense to me. I began with life in the Borden household one morning in the cellar where Lizzie's father, Andrew, was sharpening an axe. I was wondering where you were, Father. You shouldn't be down here in this damp cellar. Lizzie, I'll, I'll quit just as soon as I've got a good edge on this blade. And a hatchet lying over there. Father, will you look at you? You're perspiring all over and it's cold down here. That's not taking care of yourself as you promised, Dr. Sands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's done. Now, Lizzie, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Would you go upstairs and ask Abby to fix me a cup of tea? She's not at home. She's not at home. <laughs> Hand me that hatchet. Father, you have a bad heart. Now, you're supposed to stay quiet and not exert yourself. Daughter, my body gives me no trouble. It's... It's my mind that's in pain. Oh, Father. Ah, there's nothing you can do, little girl. Nothing. There's nothing I can do either. What a strange world it is. Here I sit in the cellar of my own house, weeping to my own daughter. <laughs> it's my own fault. I never should have remarried. Never married, Abby? Oh, never. I hardly knew her. But you and Emma, you were such little things. Your mother being dead, how could I take care of you? So when I met Abby, I thought, ah, oh, here's a lady who'll be a mother to my two girls. She was never really a mother. I'm not saying it's her fault. No, no, no. Motherhood never interested Abby. The things that do interest her, the way Abby carries on with any man who happens to be... I, I mean that, that painter who came to do a miniature of her, that Matthew Turner. Well, I don't believe that. Him? Why, he's disgusting. Oh, I shouldn't have said anything. I, I think I'd 
better get myself upstairs. I'm not feeling too well. I'll bring you your medicine. And you lie down. Oh, you're a good girl, Liz. You're going to make some lucky man a happy husband. I'll never marry, Father. I'll take care of you for the rest of my life. That's the way I began my version of what life must have been like in the Borden home. <laughs> Who is it? It's me, Louisa. Well, come in. May I sit? You bet. Sit, stay, help me. <laughs> is it moving, the story? Gathering speed with every page. You remember Matthew Turner, the miniaturist? Oh, yeah. I'm just using him as a key to this. I think he was. I've got more on him than his mysterious death. I'll read it to you. The Boston Record, September 10th, 1892. Quote, The deceased called himself Matthew Turner. It was an alias disguising the fact he was related to a prominent Massachusetts family living in Fall River. Is it the fault of parents the children come to no good end? Unquote. Hmm. That means somebody in this town knew who Turner really was and was kept quiet. Hey, that'll fit into what I'm writing. Darn good stuff, Louisa. Hey, uh, did it ever occur to you to marry a newspaper man? I wouldn't dream of it. It'd be work, work, work all the time. It was almost as though there were two families in the Fall River home living under the same roof. A father and his daughters, and a stepmother, who by today's standards wouldn't have raised an eyebrow. But in 1892... Abby? Abby, it's me, Andrew. She's locked herself in her room, Father. Sometimes I hear her crying. It's been two days... Uh, she'll get over it. She always does. Then there'll be someone else. All of this isn't doing your heart any good. I worry so about you. Don't worry does no good. You keep getting Dr. Sand's prescription filled and I'll keep taking it, as he says. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm all overcome with anger. How you're being treated by her. Ah, now, my little Elizabeth. You just remember what was engraved on the king's ring when he asked the wise men for a message to be looked at in good times and bad. And they came up with one short sentence. Mm -hmm. What was it? And this, too, shall pass. So, take comfort from that, Liz. Life will be better for us both soon. I'm sure of it. But life in the Borden household did not improve. One day, Lizzie took an excursion to Boston to see a play. She loved the theater. It was the 2nd of August. She arrived home at about 7 o'clock. The house was dark. Father? Abby? Bridget, is there anyone home? Oh, Oh, Father. Oh, oh, what is it? You've, you've got to get up from there. Liz. Can you stand up, Father? What were you doing lying on the floor? Come on now. Slowly. We'll, we'll get you over to the sofa. All right, Liz. Let me light the lamp. What time is it? Where's Abby? Where's the maid? Bridget, uh, it's a day off. How is the play in Boston? I'm not answering any questions until you tell me what this is all about. How long have you been lying there? I, I, I don't know exactly. You had an attack, didn't you? Yeah. Why didn't you take your digitalis? Oh, I've run out. Oh, it's my fault. I should have looked at the bottle to make sure there was enough. There's none left? A few drops, maybe. It could last me till tomorrow. I suppose Abby hasn't been anywhere near you all day. <laughs> yes, yes, she has. Oh, my, oh, my, yes. That Matthew Turner had the nerve to show up. I ran out and stopped him at the gate, and I told him if he ever showed his face around here anymore, I'd kill him. There'll be no more of this. You are going up to bed. I'll help you. 
Tomorrow, I'll go to talk to Dr. Sands. You aren't getting any better. Now, I wish you wouldn't fuss so. Father, you're the only person who means anything to me at all. Don't you worry. I'll have Mr. Parsons make up your new medicine in double quick time. Well, good morning, Miss Lisbeth. Mr. Parsons, I always like coming to your store. You're the only one who calls me by my rightful name instead of that hateful Lizzie, which I loathe so. Oops, I almost forgot my other customers. Excuse me, eh? I've got three of the town's worst tattlers back there. And they can't make up their minds what kind of complexion powder or cold cream to buy. (laughs) You go right ahead. I have a few minutes. Well, ladies, have you made up your minds? No? Well, look, I have a prescription to make up for Miss Borden, if you don't mind. You just take your time. There... Still debating the merits of various creams and powders, so we'll take care of you first. Oh, I see Dr. Sands' familiar illegible hand. He gave me this prescription because Father seems to be getting more dizzy spells and pains in the chest. I'm sure we can take care of it. May I watch? Oh, of course you can. Come back here with me. Now, this is the marble table where I fill the prescriptions. Now, to work. Uh, are those biddies watching us? <laughs> yes, they are. I'll give them an ear, fool. I wouldn't. They don't look like they have a sense of humor. Yes, ladies, by all means, you may watch. But I advise you to keep your distance. I am about to concoct a virulent poison. And I wouldn't want any of you to become contaminated. Yeah, I'll give them some to mull over. Mr. Parsons, <laughs> they'll take you seriously. Anything I cannot abide is a nosy, gossipy female. And three of them is just three too many. Now, let's see what Dr. Sands has ordered. Mm, yes. It's considerably stronger than the last one. You'll have to be careful with it. Is it dangerous? Uh, Digitalis can be a poison, yes. Now I place these leaves into the mortar and grind them up. Yes, an excess of Digitalis could cause certain changes in heart rhythm. And we wouldn't want that. But in the right amount, it's exactly the stimulant your father needs. Now, when this is a fine powder... I steep the digitalis in alcohol and make up a tincture. Uh, can you come back tomorrow morning? Oh, I was hoping to take it with me right now. Well, I could give you enough for three doses, say in powder form, that do you until tomorrow. Give him a third of a teaspoon each time in his tea or broth. Uh, is he worse? I, I think he is. Has he... Been under a strain lately? Very much so. A great deal of strain. Uh, Well, that ought to do it. Fine as talc. I'll give you enough for three light doses now, and you stop by in the morning. I'll have it all made up. Uh, Here you are, Miss Elizabeth. There's enough prussic acid in this little bottle to kill every rat within 50 miles. I'll place it on your account. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Good day. Now, ladies, is there anything else in the cosmetic line that perhaps I can show you? I'm not saying that is exactly the way it happened, but it certainly could have been. Those three witnesses who swore Lizzie Borden bought prussic acid the day before her father and stepmother were struck down, those three could have been victims of a druggist's prank. The following day, there was no more laughter. At nine o'clock, Lizzie Borden was in her own house when the first of two 
murders was committed. It was the state's contention that only Lizzie Borden could have killed her parents. Our reporter friend, John Howard, contends differently. You may remember he began this investigation to clear the reputation of his great-grandfather, the presiding judge at the trial. When I return with Act Three, we may learn whether John was glad or sorry he had reopened the case. Was the Lizzie Borden murder a classic case of justice or its miscarriage? New evidence intrigues John Howard. A hatchet with the initials A.B. carved into the age-encrusted handle, possibly belonging to Andrew Borden, and possibly the actual murder weapon. A drowned man who traveled New England, and a father with a heart ailment. All of which brings us to the murder morning. August the 4th, 1892. A hot August day that promised to be a scorcher. At about 9 o'clock, Andrew Borden was upstairs with his wife. We don't know to this day how much Lizzie overheard. Abby, I tell you, you've got to stop it. This running after that man, Matthew. Now, you're a married woman. Think of our daughters, Lizzie and Emma, if you won't think of me. (laughs) Stop that. Stop it, I say. Stop that laughter. Uh, I'll I'll make you stop. Uh, You'd like me to be laughed at. A public disgrace. Andrew Borden and his marriage is a joke. Can't keep his wife at home. Laugh now, Abby. And so it was that Andrew Borden, who with his own hatchet, gave his second wife, Abby, the 40 wax. Not his daughter, Lizzie. For her part, downstairs, Lizzie was not certain what she'd heard. And it wasn't until her father, white-faced, gasping for breath, slowly came into the living room that she began to suspect. Father, what is it? (laughs) Nothing. Nothing. I, I'm so dizzy. It feels like there's an elephant on my chest. Now, lie down. Let me undo your jacket. No, no, no. Don't touch anything. Why are you holding it together like that? Have Have you got something underneath it? Uh, no, no. It feels better with my arms close like this. At least... The, the prescription. We, we used the last of it last night, but Mr. Parsons said he'd have the rest of it ready today. I'll I'll go over to the drugstore right now. It'll be all ready. He said so. Now don't move, please, Father. Lie right there on the sofa. I won't be long. <laughs> Who is it? That's you, Liz. I've got to sit up. See who... Who got up? My hatchet. Fell out of my coat. I've got to... Hide it. Who is that? Who ran upstairs just now? Liz? Is that you? They've seen Abby. Someone up there. uh, You. What are you looking at me like that for? Say something. It's your fault, too. Give me that hatchet. Give it back to me. No! No! Don't! Elizabeth, I can't begin to tell you what anguish I feel that you should suffer this double tragedy. It was so kind of you, Mr. Parsons, to come over to the house tonight. I must talk to someone. 
My sister wrote and said she'd never come back to Fall River. Bridget, the maid, went back to Ireland. Everyone acts as though I was the one who killed my stepmother and father. I didn't kill him. How could they think of such a thing? Ah, people say anything. Mustn't pay any attention. It's the police. They found some burnt cloth in the furnace, and they're saying it's the dress I was wearing. There's going to be a trial soon, you know that. Yes, I'm prepared for it. Questions going to be asked, evidence presented, accusations made. And what will you say? What will I say to what? Those bits of cloth in the furnace, for instance. The police also found a hatchet with a broken handle in the basement. Covered with ashes, as though someone had tried to rub the blood away. How do they know that was what killed them both? All I can say, and I will say it, is... Is that I didn't do it. Elizabeth, it was no secret... The whole town knows about your stepmother and her carryings on and that neither you nor Emma liked her very much. I told you, Mr. Parsons, I loathed her. But I didn't kill her. Now, it's also rumored you were afraid you'd be disinherited in favor of your stepmother. And that could be a motive. Oh, if only they knew how pathetically untrue all that is. I was very close to my father. He told me things in confidence which I shall never reveal. As for disinheriting his daughters in favor of that woman, it's ridiculous. Could you prove that to a jury? I will do nothing to soil my father's memory. Even if your own life is in jeopardy? Mr. Parsons, I don't care what the judge or the jury will believe. You and I will never talk about this again. I'll pray for you, Elizabeth, because I know you're completely innocent. I would say you're the unfortunate victim of circumstances. I hope the Lord will know that and watch over you. Well, that's my story, Louisa. Now that you've read it, what do you think? You make a very good case for Lizzie. Mm, As it turns out, she was acquitted anyway, but I think for the wrong reasons. My great-grandfather, Judge Earl Howard, believed she couldn't have committed those brutal, ugly crimes because she was too much of a lady. My theory is, if he'd known that Andrew, in a fit of frustration and uncontrolled anger, had killed his wife, Abby, the suspicion that hangs over Lizzie Borden to this day would never have started. Probably not. Uh, I would have liked to have written something from inside Lizzie's mind. What she might have thought just before the verdict. When she didn't know what it would be, innocent or guilty. Can I try? Would you? What can I do? I have no choice. I burned the dress that was stained with father's blood because I couldn't bear to remember those minutes when I found him. And this was held up as proof of my guilt. I hated Abby, and this too was offered as proof of my guilt. Three witnesses swore upon the Bible I had bought prussic acid to kill my parents, in spite of Mr. Parsons' denial. Mr. Parsons admitted he was very fond of me, So his denial was deemed worthless. Father, I heard you accusing Abby of being faithless. I heard the muffled, strange sounds and your threats and your cries. But I never knew until I saw your white face and its look told me. I could see the hatchet You were hiding under your jacket. I ran to the drugstore for your medicine. Dearest father, I never even kissed you goodbye. Louisa, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to use it word for word at the end of my story. It's got no ending. That's as far as I go. Maybe one day I'll do a more in-depth story. But complete or incomplete, 
This is what I'm taking to the courier. Today? Right now. Hey, uh, why don't you plan to stay here at the Hamilton house over the weekend? I'll be back in the morning and uh, we can backpack. You know, that hike we started but never finished. That would be great. Hello? Uh, is this Miss Cahill? Louisa Cahill? Yes, it is. Who's this? Uh, Sergeant McCauley down at the crime lab. I've been trying to reach John Howard, but I get no answer from his room. The operator suggested I ring you. Oh, John drove to Boston to deliver a feature story he's been working on. The Lizzie Borden thing. Oh, I see. Uh, maybe, well, I was just thinking, you're a very good friend of his, aren't you? Yes, very good. I think it might be better if I spoke to you instead of to him. But uh, I'd rather not say anything on the phone. Do you think you could come down to the crime lab? I won't keep you but half an hour. Uh, Miss Cahill, why was John so interested in the case? His great-grandfather was the presiding judge. When he voted acquittal and Lizzie got off, his life became a misery. At best, people thought the judge a fool. At worst, a criminal. So he wanted to clear the judge's name by proving Lizzie Borden was really innocent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes what I'm going to tell you even tougher. We kept running that hatchet through the spectroscope, analyzing and reanalyzing every inch. And then on a hunch, I had the blade taken off the handle. And there, in the tiniest miniature handwriting you ever saw, was a signature. Matthew Turner. How did you know? Have you known all along? I suspected it. He must have been very peculiar. To sign a murder weapon as if it had been a work of art. But of course, that's it. What is? He regarded the death of Andrew Borden as his work of art. Miss Cahill, there's one thing I haven't told you. You know, when you start investigating, you don't know where to lead you. Matthew Turner was the son of Judge Earl Howard, which could mean he was John's great uncle. Now, how can I tell that to him? I've known him since he was a boy in this town. If that isn't ironic, as you say, when you start investigating... Here's John trying to bring credit to a maligned and abused great-grandfather and... The relative, even more recent, is a murderer. Of course, it all happened so long ago, I don't know how John's going to take it. Can we not tell him right away, Sergeant? If someone's got to tell him, I'd like it to be me. What about the hatchet? I sure don't want it. And I don't think John does either. Well, could you get him to donate it to our crime museum? Maybe there'll be somebody who... Wants to write a really long, detailed story about Lizzie Borden and her times. New England in the 1890s. And the hatchet would be an important part of it. Writers like to see those things for themselves. Who knows? Perhaps that writer will be John himself. He's made an awfully good start. Do bear in mind John Howard's version of what took place in Fall River, Massachusetts, the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of August, 1892, is his personal theory. He never claimed it to be fact, nor do we. But his views were interesting enough for us to call them to the attention of you specialists in felony and transgressions, you listeners to the Mystery Theater. I shall return shortly. search to clear his family name, our writer has rattled an unsuspected skeleton in his family's closet. We can't help observing. This often is the fate of man's actions. In uncovering one truth, one comes upon another truth that was best left hidden. For what the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Jada Rowland, Robert Dryden, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, 
inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Thursday night CBS Radio Mystery Theater airs at 8.06, right here on 1160 KSL. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. C4 Airs Romai... Romano Vivito More, or when in Rome, live like a Roman. This was the counsel of no less a personage than the estimable St. Ambrose himself some 1,600 years ago. Since then, there have been many attempts to interpret just exactly what that good man had in mind. But I should think it means what he intended it to mean. Quite simply, don't rock the boat. I tell you, there are spirits in this country. And I tell you, there's no such things as spirits. Uh. What's the name of this place, anyhow? I can't even pronounce it. What is that? Oh, spirits. Louie, didn't you just say there's no such thing as spirits? Oh, I'm from Missouri, and they just showed me. <laughs> Mystery drama, When in Rome, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As even the most casual student of history knows... We won our independence from Britain some 200 years ago. But that was only our political independence. For other things, we were still very much in the shadow of Europe. For a long time, we remained a young and self-conscious nation. We thought of ourselves as provincial, uncouth, and uncultured. Our newly rich men had newly rich wives who couldn't wait to go to Europe to buy sophistication. And uh, perhaps a titled foreigner for a son-in-law. Let us then go back about a hundred years and meet Mr. Henry T. Cahill. How'd you do? <laughs> well, never fails, does it? A fella manages to put aside a hard-earned dollar or two, and the wife has already got it spent for him. Now, Libby isn't really a bad sort, but she has these ideas. What kind of ideas? Listen. And why shouldn't you become an ambassador? But I ain't qualified to be an ambassador. Henry, isn't it a fact that you have $19 million? Mm, give or take. You're qualified. But I don't know anything about tariffs or balances or, or trade and, and, and Lord knows what all. Well, you don't have to know a blessed thing. Look at the lot that's ambassadors now. Why, any of them is as ignorant as you are. No, but I can't speak any foreign language. None of them do. An American ambassador isn't supposed to say anything anyhow. Yeah, well, what's he supposed to do then? Wear knee pants. You'll have to catch me first. Go to fancy balls and parties. Uh, that lets me out. Now, don't you upset me, Henry Thomas. Uh, what does your job pay? Well, hardly anything at all. Well, why would anyone want it? For the honor. Honor. I can do without that. Thank you kindly. Henry, uh, now that Mr. Hayes is president... Now, i got no time to fool with politics. You go to see Congressman Stifle. Remind him how it happens that Mr. Hayes and not Mr. Tilden is sitting in the White House. Please, Livy. I have no wish to go traipsing about all over the world. I'm not leaving home. You go to see Congressman Stifle. No, Libby. No? I'm putting my foot down, and that's got to be my final word on the subject. Yours, maybe, but not mine. 
Henry, I warn you here and I warn you now. Do not aggravate me. Do not irritate me because... All right, all right, all right, all right. I get the idea. Livy, you see, is a woman of many words. She uses them to let you know exactly how you stand. Right now, I understood that I was standing right on the brink. So I went to see Congressman Morton B. Stifle. Henry, I'm not sure it can be done. What are you saying to me, Morton? Uh, Please, ask for something within reason. Ask to get a special government regulation suspended. Ask to have a law passed or repealed. Ask even to get an amendment to the Constitution. But to be made an ambassador? That's what I need, Morton. What for, Henry? You get to take no end of abuse. (laughs) That's nothing new. There's no future in it. When the next president comes in, you're out. Morton, why you give me all these reasonable, sensible objections? Livy wants me to have the job. Uh, Livy. I'll see what I can do. I know you will. It's just all the plums have already been passed out. I don't have to have a plum. Just make... Sure, I don't have a lemon. London, Paris, Madrid, St. Petersburg, Berlin, Vienna. Too late for all the big ones. Morton, don't waste my time and your energy with all the little details. Just make sure it's somewhere in Europe. Laveria? Yes, Livy. Well, I never heard of it. It was the best they could do at this stage of the game. Well, where is it? Right here, on the map. Where? Between Austria and Romania. Where? You can hardly see it. Uh, Here, see? That little speck. Oh, Henry, what have you done to me? You're going to love it. From there, you can travel to Paris, Venice, Rome. Henry, is there really such a place? Oh, yes. It's got a king and a queen and a royal court. Why, it's the greatest little country in the world. What was I going to tell her? And maybe it's all for the best. Let her spend some time in one of those places without plumbing. Far from the good old USA. Yeah, she'd get this ambassador nonsense out of her head soon enough. But, as usual, I was wrong. Oh, I love it. You know what? Do you realize this is a castle? A medieval castle? Yeah, you'll realize it all right in the wintertime when the winds blow in through those open windows. It's so authentic. This table, these chairs, those tapestries on the wall. Hundreds of years old. Yeah, they look at... Oh, such a beautiful little country. Such a quaint little country. It's like some beautiful painting in a book of fairy tales. Now, what are those bowls doing on the floor near the window? Oh, 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 oh that's the food. Uh, well, one is milk, and the other is vinegar. What are, the, what are they doing there? The servants put them out. They're in every house in Laveria. You see, they have to feed the spirits. Milk for the good spirits, vinegar for the bad ones. Hmm. Going along with this. Why do they have to feed the bad ones? Well, they must. It's the law. What law? Well, they have such quaint superstitions. And the people, well, they believe that human beings can take the shape of spirits and fly all over the world. Now, Livy, that just doesn't make sense. Oh, but they believe it. That's why you have to feed both types of spirits. You never can tell which could be your mother or father or, well, even you. I thought all that kind of nonsense went out with the Middle Ages. But, Henry, in this country, it still is the Middle Ages. Libby was having the time of her life. Hobnobbing with all the swells and, oh, getting wide-eyed over all the quaint, mysterious customs of the peasants. For me, mm, the time hung heavy. There wasn't much to do. And I had a smart young assistant. 
Uh, you sign here, please, sir, next to the X. I see the X, Mr. Daly. Now, uh, this says page four. Uh, yes, sir. That means this is a four-page document. Uh, th- that's right, sir. Well, where are the other three pages? Well, it's only necessary to sign this last one. I would like to read the others. You'd like to read them? Well, let me have them. But, sir, Ambassador Snell never bothered to read these documents, and neither did Ambassador Hastings before him, and Ambassador Cummings, and, and all the other ambassadors since I've been here. Yeah, well, this here is Ambassador Henry Thomas Cahill, and we're starting a precedent. Uh, yes, sir. Now, what's this? The, the Embassy Flower Garden. Permission is hereby requested to install tulip beds along the... Well, sir, it's all very boring and and filled with red tape, and I had hoped to spare you this nonsense. Thank you, Mr. Daly. But I'll just have to put up with it. After all, it's my nonsense. Oh, and, and, and what am I supposed to say when we are presented to the king? Nothing. I got the drill from Brother Daly. This is a formal presentation at court. Still? And all you do is bow, smile. You say, thank you, Your Majesty. And what else? That's all. Then you back away and let the next couple be introduced. Henry, you've made me so happy. Oh, you're such a kind, wonderful, understanding person. Your Royal Majesties. I am honored to present the United States Ambassador, the Honorable Henry T. Cahill and Mrs. Cahill. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. The Queen and I are happy to make your acquaintance and hope that your stay in our country shall be pleasant and fruitful. Thank you, Your Majesty. I look forward to our meeting on many happy occasions in the future. That's all there was to it. (laughs) I tell you, Livy was in her glory. She was also in a brand new gown from Gay Paris that cost me a few hundred dollars. But what's money? You have to keep them happy. And there she was, presented at court. Maybe not the court of St. James in London, but a genuine, legitimate royal court all the same. How many people from Kansas City have ever been presented? Do you suppose we can get to bed? You mean you can even think of going to sleep? Why not? It's midnight. What did you think of him? Of who? The king. King Zulan. Who else? No, him. He seems like a nice little fella. Now, what sort of way is that to speak of... He looks like he'd be a clerk in one of my warehouses. A clerk? Well, maybe chief clerk. Oh, Henry, you are absolutely impossible. I'm almost afraid to ask what you thought of her. The queen? Please, if it's going to be rude, I don't want to hear it. All right, then I won't say it. Good. I hope we can depend on that. And now, can we get some sleep? Oh, good night. Good night. Henry? Yeah? What did you think of the queen? Is that why you woke me up? Oh, you weren't sleeping. Well, do you remember Molly Bonnet? No, I never heard of her. The, the one who was put on trial and later hanged for shooting her husband? Henry! It was in all the papers. Oh, I never read that part of the newspaper. This Molly Bonnet now. <laughs> she was the spit image of the queen. They could have been twins. Oh, that, that's impossible. Why is it impossible? There are people all over the world who look alike. Oh, but to liken the royal queen of Tower of Lavaria to a common murderess. They both had the same pointy chin, same beady eyes, the same small teeth. What are you talking about? Uh, looked out for women with small teeth. Oh, I think you're insane. If you had a set of those tiny, sharp teeth, I'd have never married you. Oh, excuse me, Henry. I'm going to sleep. Good night. Henry? Yeah? You're not 
making up a story, are you? I mean, this terrible Molly Bonnet. Did she really look like Queen Attila? They could have been identical twins. Well, that doesn't mean anything. So, let's go to sleep. But don't you go to sleep. We shall return here shortly with Act Two. And it's quite possible that we may develop this little theme a bit more in detail. You might ask, what if a person does look exactly like someone who had committed a murder? Is there a type? Stand by. In the 19th century, Central Europe was filled with tiny picture book kingdoms, all the color and pageantry that attended a royal court. It was all like a fairy tale. And as we know, in fairy tales, everyone lived happily ever after. But happy endings are not the rule in life, which is real and earnest. And who knows what was really concealed beneath all the tinsel and glitter. We will find out as our story unfolds. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Good morning, Daly. Did uh, Mrs. Cahill enjoy the reception? Mrs. Cahill is in seventh heaven. Uh, tell me about Queen Atala. Oh, yes, sir. What would you like to know? Mm. Now that you mention it, I'm not sure. For instance, did she have a twin sister? Uh, no, sir. You're sure about that? Oh, absolutely. She comes from one of the oldest noble families in Bavaria. She was the only daughter of the Grand Duke Arroy. Well, that theory is shot. Uh, what's on the docket this morning? Well, a dispatch to be sent to Washington by diplomatic courier. It requires your signature. Is this it? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, once again, <clears throat> I see by the number that you've given me the last page. Where's the rest of it? Oh, but, sir, this is a secret transmission. A secret? From me? I am the ambassador. Oh, well, yes, sir, but it's just that none of the other ambassadors... I know. I know. They never bothered. Hand them over, please. Okay, yes, sir. What's the subject of this thing? It's an analysis of the political situation in Liberia for the guidance of our Secretary of State. And it's prepared here by the embassy? Yes, sir. Who wrote it? Uh, you? Well, uh, not exactly, sir. You see, um... Uh, out with it, Mr. Daly. Well, it was uh, uh, basically prepared by Count Rospro. The Prime Minister of Lavelle. Who knows the political situation here better than he does? Isn't this supposed to be the embassy's evaluation? Well, sir, Count Rospro's a very honorable and patriotic man. Uh-huh. The long and short of the thing is, then, Daly, simply this... Some foreigner, who may or may not have an axe to grind, writes a paper for the guidance of the U.S. government, to which I sign my name, and everyone thinks it comes from me. When you put it that way, sir, I... But all the other ambassadors have always done it. It it saves so much time and effort. Our time and effort is what we're being paid for. Leave this here with me. I'll, I'll read it. But Count Rospro thinks this should be transmitted to Washington without delay. Mr. Daly, who are you working for, Count Rospro or the United States? Why, oh, Mr. Ambassador, how could you even ask? Just answer the question. Well, of course I'm working for the United States. Good. Just make sure I never have to remind you of that fact again. Where were you, Henry? In my office, working. You were supposed to take me to the garden party at the French Embassy. Now, this is the third time this week. I didn't come here to go to parties, Libby. I'm here to look after the best interests of the United States. But you have a staff to look after that sort of business. I didn't make $19 million by having my staff look after any sort of business. Libby, there's something going on in this country. What? I don't know. But I don't like it. But... If you don't know, how do you know you don't like it? I operate on hunches. But you don't have to operate at all, Henry. Why can't you just enjoy yourself? Who says I'm not enjoying myself? (laughs) 
Oh, Mr. Ambassador, so kind of you to come to see me. Mm. What's on your mind, Count Rospro? <laughs> you are truly the impulsive American. Plunge right into the current. Very well. I understand that your office has not transmitted its political analysis to Washington as yet. Uh, may I ask just how you understand that? Usually, I would have been told. Why? With all due respect, Count, how does this private matter between me and my government concern anyone else? Well, let us say the embassy is now operating on a new set of procedures... Count Rospro. Well, I assure you, Mr. Ambassador, that uh, we have only tried to be helpful. Sure. I notice uh, you don't think too much of the king. How can you say that? Uh, you say in your report that he is roundly disliked throughout the country and that he may even expect to be assassinated. Unfortunately... He is not popular. Arvin, my dearest, I... Uh, oh. Your Majesty, may I present Mr. Cale, the American ambassador? I had the honor to be presented to Your Majesty at court. Of course. And how is Mrs. Cahill? Uh, first rate, Your Majesty. Oh, you are dizzy, Count Rospro. So I shall not disturb you further. Uh, I, I was just about to leave. No, 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 I insist. Oh, Count... The king is expecting you to join us for tea. I will be honored. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Ambassador. And you and your wife should not be strangers at our court. Uh, thank you, Your, your Majesty. <clears throat> and uh, now, Mr. Cahill. Uh, Mr. Cahill? Uh, oh, 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 yes. Our loyalty must be to our king. Uh, but we know in our hearts uh, there is much opposition to him in the country. Should the worst happen, we should like to have the understanding and the uh, cooperation of the United States. Count, uh, do you expect the worst to happen? Well, these things, uh, they are in the hands of fate. <laughs> As I was about to leave the palace, a uniformed servant told me that the king himself wished to see me. I heard you were visiting the prime minister. Yes, your majesty. Oh, we are alone. and This is an unofficial meeting, so why don't you call me Zuli? Zuli? My name is Zulan, and uh, I will call you Henry. Or are all Americans named Henry called Hank? <laughs> Hank, I like that better. <laughs> Do you like my country, Lavaria? Oh, very much. We are fortunate it is still here. <laughs> Where could it go, Your Majesty? Oh, it could disappear. It could become part of Germany, Austria, Russia. All of them want to take us over. Uh, <clears throat> may I ask, what's stopping them? Me, for one thing. You. <laughs> I know, I know. You're probably saying to yourself, but he's such a little fellow. Why should these giants be scared of him? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. I am King Zulan the Thirtieth. I am a descendant of the oldest royal house in the world. The kings of all these other countries are afraid to destroy me. Why? The overthrow of one royal house is a threat to all of them. And so, while I am alive... Uh, your Majesty, tell me, did your wife ever have a twin sister? No, oh, of course not. It's remarkable. What is remarkable? Coincidence. Uh, Zula... Oh, I did not know you were busy, Zulan. Uh, your Majesty... Well, it seems we are fated to run into each other constantly, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> it's always a pleasure, Your Majesty. There was a minute or so of chit-chat, and then I was able to leave. <laughs> Interesting. When she'd broken into the meeting I had with Rospro, she was all breathless and excited. And beautiful. Just like a woman who was in love. <laughs> when she walked in here, her face was mean. 
pinched. She looked exactly like Molly Bonnet, who had murdered her husband. Well, was I making too much of it? Back in my office... You sent for me, Mr. Ambassador? Daly, suppose this country was snapped up by one of the giants. Who'd gain by it? Oh, I, I, I don't know. You don't. Three of the biggest empires in Europe want this place. What's stopping any one of them from grabbing it is fear of the other two. Now, if the king is assassinated, there's going to be a free-for-all, which could lead to war from one end of Europe to the other. All because of Laveria? They don't care about Laveria. It's just that they're always looking for an excuse for war. <laughs> and here they got one that's tailor-made. Now, Daly, you're going to find out if there's any real sentiment against the king in this country. Yes, sir. I'll have the answer for you tomorrow morning. No, Daly. You'll need more time than that, my boy. Oh, no, sir. I'll just ask Count Rossborough. No, you will not. But, sir, he has all the answers. Except the ones we're looking for. No. Daly, you go out among the people... And see what you can pick up. But I don't speak the variant. Here's a dictionary and a grammar. Sit up all night. But, but, but... Mr. Learn fast. Henry, there's something we must discuss. Now, Livy, when it's time to go to sleep... Well, it's the only time I ever get to see you. You're always so busy. I'm a servant of the American taxpayer. The Queen held a tea for the wives of the diplomatic corps. I was not invited. No? Uh, are you sure? I took it up with Mr. Daly, and he told me, in confidence, that I was being punished because of you. Really? What have I done? You have insulted Count Rossbro. Insulted? Well, oh, displeased. That's probably true. Oh, Henry, how could you? Because I don't serve here at Count Rossbro's pleasure. But why would you do anything to alienate a man like Count Rossbro? Well, he's the most powerful person in the kingdom. Is that a fact? I thought the king himself was the most powerful. Henry, I demand an explanation. I could give you one, but I'm not sure you'd like to hear it. I'm entitled to hear it. <laughs> Count Rospro is having an affair. Rospro? Why, he's a man of spotless reputation. I certainly don't want to be a party to any such most malicious slander. Okay, then let's just forget it. <sighs> Henry... Who's he having an affair with? The queen. <gasps> oh, I don't believe it. Yeah, well, that's not the worst of it, Livy. I think they're plotting to assassinate the king. Whether we're dealing with royalty or commoner, love follows laws of its very own. Just as nature abhors a vacuum, so does love... Oppose a triangle. It's the old familiar story of wife, husband, and best friend. And even if it takes place in a tenement, something or somebody has to give, which is what we shall ascertain in Act Three. Queens have always been perceived as lofty, distant people, far removed from the petty concerns of daily life that beset the rest of us. But when we think of kings and queens as husbands and wives, suddenly we see them in a different light. The concept of marriage suddenly makes them human. All too human. But the queen and Count Rospro? He's the very soul of, of honor. Oh, Henry, how can you imply those two are having an, an affair? I'm not implying. I'm stating a fact. And murder. Why, 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 why it's impossible. Louis, how did I make $19 million? Oh, don't start that. By being able to judge people's character, right? But to accuse. I haven't accused anybody yet. In public. 
Now what? Now, you make sure this conversation doesn't go beyond this room, Henry. I'm warning you. I don't care what she or anyone else thought. I knew I was right. I had a little talk with my assistant, Mr. Undersecretary Daly. You know, Mr. Bassett, these are very superstitious folks in this country. Uh, you're first making that discovery, are you? Uh, Daly, how long have you been here? Well, it's the first time I ever ventured forth into the countryside. Mm. How do the people feel about the king? Oh, they love the king. Uh, and the queen? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. What's the problem? <laughs> I just couldn't find out. Uh -huh. And Count Rospro. Well, when... When he was a student at the university for a while, he was, I suppose you could say, a, a, a subversive. What kind? Well, it seems he favored a union of Laveria with Austria. He did? They even suspected he'd been carrying on correspondence with Emperor Franz Joseph. And what happened? Oh, he, I guess his father, old Count Rospro, gave him a severe talking to. And I suppose after a while he outgrew it. Maybe he did and maybe he didn't. Was there anything else you wanted, sir? Yes. I wanted to go home. A storm was brewing here in this two-bit kingdom. And I could be caught right in the middle. This call for some fancy footwork. So I decided to poke around and see what I could scare up for myself. One afternoon, I took a walk out into the country... I stopped off at one of those country taverns. It was so picturesque. I, I could hardly stand it. Yes, and what will the rich American gentleman have? Uh, how do you know I'm a rich American gentleman? All Americans are rich gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know I'm American? Oh, oh, we are all what uh, you would say experts on America here. In America are no bad spirits. Is that a fact? Oh, yes. Bad spirits in America are punished. Here, we must feed them. You really believe this? Certainly. And we are told we must feed them. Oh, yes, I know. Yeah, oh, yeah. A bowl of vinegar and a bowl of milk. Every night. Yeah. Yes. Each is set out by the window, and every morning, each is empty. Spirits have eaten. That doesn't necessarily prove the spirits drank it. No. Well, who else? I looked at that man's face. He actually believed what he was telling me. Well, that night, as I was going to bed, I noticed the two little bowls near the window. What are they doing here, Livy? Henry, I told you. Milk and vinegar to feed the good and evil spirits. You believe that? When in Rome, Henry. Oh, sure. Wait, you'll see. Tomorrow morning, those bowls will be empty. What were the facts? In the evening, the little bowls were full. In the morning, they were empty. Therefore, somebody had to come in and empty them. But who? And why? Well, I decided to find out. And so, I tried to remain awake. And I tried. And it became later. And later and later. My eyelids... My eyelids became heavier and heavier. I, I struggled to keep them open. Did I actually see, see what, that, what? Was there a bright and beautiful presence in the room? And then, then there was an ugly, rough, and rasping noise. Could these be the spirits? The 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 good ones and the bad? I. I tried to peer into the darkness. I, I tried. And tried. Then, then the bright sunlight was streaming into the room. It was morning. I jumped out of bed. I looked at the bowls. They were empty. Oh, Henry. Is that you? Yes, Livy, it's me. Is something wrong? 
Livy, to tell you the honest truth, I, I, I really don't know. Sir, a cable has just arrived from the State Department. Uh, read it. Uh, yes, sir. I, I just finished decoding it, sir. It says, um, stability of Liberian government is vital to the interests of the United States. Suggest you do everything possible to maintain it, if indeed it is being threatened, signed, the secretary. That's what it says. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay. How and with what can we maintain the stability of the Liberian government? Well, why don't we ask Count Rospel, sir? He knows everything. You know something, Daly? You show positive signs of genius. Sometimes. So kind of you to come to see me, Mr. Ambassador. Getting down to business, Count, would you answer me a question? Certainly. Is it true that you were a member of a student group that tried to forge a union between Laveria and the Austrian Empire? And... Are you still trying to do it? Uh, those are two questions. Is the answer to both yes? And if it is? Uh, my government would be displeased if there is any bloodshed in this country. I assure you the matter can be accomplished without bloodshed. That isn't true. And you know it. The king would have to be killed. Oh, but that's only one person. You said bloodshed. Murder is murder. Well, it wouldn't have to be murder. He could have an accident. We have people who can arrange these things very cleverly. My government will not ever approve of murder. Your government will never know it will be murder. I shall so inform them. My, my dear Mr. Cahill, this is an informal, unofficial, off-the-record discussion. How can you hope to prove it? I have certain good friends in the administration. Of course you do. They'll believe me. Of course they will. Privately. Publicly, it will make less trouble to just uh, put a good face on things. You Americans have such a marvelous term for it. Uh, don't disturb the ship. You mean don't rock the boat? Precisely. Henry, Henry, wake up. Wake uh, up. Hello, uh, what? Henry, you're having a nightmare. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I was. Oh, dear. What was it about? I dreamed that the evil spirit came for supper tonight and, and that the good spirit didn't. Oh, why, of all the superstitious nonsense. Look, but by the window, the bowls, the one with the vinegar is empty. That means something bad's going to happen very soon. Oh, Henry, what's gotten into you? The Queen and Rospero are plotting to kill the King. She's in love with him. He's using her. How can I stop it? I'm absolutely powerless. Well, at least I can warn him. Your Majesty? We are alone, Hank Zuli. Uh, yeah, uh, Zuli. Uh, Zuli, your life is in danger. Yes, I know. You know? The life of a king is always in danger. Uh, I, I I, don't mean generally. I'm, I'm, I mean there's a plot. Uh, there is always a plot. Z Zuli, your wife and Count Rospero are plotting to kill you. Mr. Ambassador, how dare you? You come from a barbarian country where there is no respect for rank. This interview is terminated. You are dismissed from our presence. What was I going to do? The man was obviously a fool. But it was vital that he remain a king. How can I save him now? Then I got an idea. Mr. Daly. Uh, yes, sir. Send a cable to the office of the Kansas City Daily Messenger. Say, I want whatever pictures, photographs, drawings, illustrations, everything they have 
on a woman named Molly Bonet. Yes, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> kind of you to receive me, Your Majesty. Uh, tell me, how's your love affair with Count Rospro coming along? Sir, how dare you? Do you want to answer the question? You know I'm not making this call with a pair of deuces. Now, let's you and I just have an intelligent discussion between two grown-up people. You are in love with Count Rospro. Certainly. <laughs> Consider the alternative. My husband, the king. Yeah, he's a stiff, I admit that. But how do you know Rospro isn't using you? He gets you to murder the king. He can't do it himself. He, he can't even be remotely suspected. And then when it's done, he doesn't need you anymore. How did you know I wanted to kill my husband? Because you look just like her. Who? See all these pictures? What? Why, those are pictures of me. Mm -hmm. But where were they taken? Oh, I have never worn a dress like that. Uh, they are pictures of a Mrs. Molly Bonet of Kansas City, Missouri, who murdered her husband. You want to read the story? Why do you show me this? Well, if anything should happen to the king, I intend to go to places like Davray's Tavern. I'll let the people look at these pictures and tell them the story. And do you know what everyone will believe in this superstitious country? Please. They will believe this woman was you. Your evil spirit had crossed the Atlantic. They will know you as the murderess of your husband. Oh, that's nonsense. Hmm? That's for you to decide. May I... May I have all those pictures and newspapers? Certainly, Your Majesty. Uh, may I ask how the murder was to be accomplished? Oh, there would be an accident. He would have been cleaning his gun. Hmm. I'm sure it isn't going to happen. Not to the king, at any rate. <laughs> I'm afraid I have two pieces of bad news, sir. First, Count Rospero is dead. Is he? Yes. It was an accident. He was cleaning his gun. Rospero was killed while cleaning his gun. Oh, my. But the second, sir, you're, uh, you're being recalled. This cable arrived from Washington. King Zulan says you insulted him, his wife, and his best friend. And he insists that Washington send a... A new ambassador. Henry, I've just heard the news. We're being sent home. Is it true? Yes, dear. Why? The king doesn't like me. Well, what did you do? I guess I insulted him. Oh, yes, that is your style. You couldn't be helpful. You couldn't be friendly. But, Livy, I tried to be helpful. I, 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 I really and truly did. Yes, I can imagine. You must have spoken to him like he was one of your Thursday night whiskey drinking, poker playing cronies. Henry, why did you have to rock the boat? Sometimes, if you don't rock it, the boat sinks. But right or wrong, those who rock boats or stick out necks or keep insisting that the emperor is naked usually don't win popularity contests. I shall return shortly. He lies ahead, as Mr. Shakespeare said, that wears the crown. For to be a king, one must live up to the ideal. One must be noble, brave, wise. And how many humans can fill the bill? So, king after king is overthrown, executed, exiled, all because he was less than perfect. Indeed, he was no better than those who adored him. It's a risky thing, this king business. Who would want such a job anyhow? But fortunately, there's no shortage of applicants. Therefore, we shall have no shortage of stories. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Joan Shea, Ray Owens, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> 